hello and good morning. Uh, congratulations to everyone who woke up early for this uh, conference. My name is Jesse Aaron Benzel, and I'm a fourth year medical student at Rowan Virtua School of Osteopathic Medicine, currently applying for a match in psychiatry. It is my exquisite pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to the second annual Rowan Virtua Psychedelic Medicine Conference. We have a lot of exciting, interesting, challenging, engaging, and fun presentations <clears throat> scheduled for today and tomorrow. I hope that you leave this conference feeling empowered by knowledge and ready to engage in civil and progressive conversations on the subject of psychedelic medicine, its potential, and its regulation. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce the members of our planning committee who made this event possible and will be our masters of ceremony. Uh, we are all students at Rowan Virtua SOM. So first we have Magdalene Letterer, who is a third year medical student. She is passionate about women's health, integrative medicine, and how the spirit interacts with the mind and body to affect healing. She graduated with a degree in biomedical sciences and global studies from Liberty University in 2020. While at Rowan Virtua SOM, she has been an active member and leader of the Students for Integrative Medicine Club and the local Christian Medical and Dental Association. In her free time, Magdalene can be found volunteering at Spanish speaking clinics, teaching ESL, and serving the children at her church. Of course, you'll also find Magdalene running all over New Jersey while she's training for marathons. Next, we have Jason Leonardo. Uh, he is also a second year medical student. He grew up in Gloucester Township, New Jersey, just five minutes from Rowan SOM Stratford campus. Jason received his bachelor's of science in biology and pre-medical science with a minor in biochemistry at Cutstown University of Pennsylvania in 2020. In his free time, he enjoys hiking, camping, and fishing, he was an active member of the cross country track and field programs at Cutstown, and now he identifies as a quote, washed up hobby jogger. Uh, you'll have to ask him what that means. We also have Aisha Gernani, who is a second year medical student at Rowan Virtua SOM, uh, who is passionate about integrating indigenous and Western medicine practices to empower and align mind, body, spirit, the earth, and love. She has been a certified Reiki practitioner for several years and has loved doing yoga since she was a child. She strongly believes in the intuitive aspects of healing. She graduated from Rutgers in 2020 with degrees in genetics, art, and psychology. Uh, and before starting medical school, she practiced as a full-time artist for a year. Uh, you can follow her art on Instagram at by Aisha. That's, uh, we'll put that in the chat. As the current president of the Students for Integrative Medicine and a pupil of traditional ceremonial use of plant medicines, she has been pouring her adoration and inspiration into the actualization of this conference, probably hundreds of hours this year to make this come to fruition. In her free time, she loves to create, drink, tea, tend to her many plants, learn about herbalism and hike and forage. She hopes to find a specialty in the future that allows her to intimately collate the connection between non-material and hands-on practices in true wellness and appreciation for the human body as a system within systems uh, within a wonderfully intricate and interrelated world. Next, we have Christopher A. Conquest, a second year medical student here at Rowan Virtua SOM and vice president of the Sports Medicine Club, executive board member of the PM and R Club, Community Service and Student Events Committee and Fit Docs. He is a South Jersey native from Haddonfield, New Jersey, and alumnus of the St. Joseph's Preparatory School in North Philadelphia. He is a graduate of Loyola University, Maryland in 2021, where he completed a bachelor's degree in biochemistry, graduating summa cum laude. He is a member of the National Biology Honor Society, National Leadership Honor Society, and National Jesuit Honor Society. He also presented last year in our conference on the potential of uh, psilocybin in medicine. And finally, we have Sophia Kaplan, 
Uh, she is our most junior member of the committee. She is a first year medical student at Rowan Virtua SOM. She is passionate about integrative medicine, preventative care, traditional medicine, and sustainability. In 2021, Sophia graduated from Clark University in Massachusetts with a degree in biology and spent the following year working as a medical assistant and traveling abroad to study indigenous medicine. She grew up in Buffalo, New York, where she was able to work and gain excellent experience at her family's integrative clinic. Um, her father will be speaking later. And uh, in her free time, Sophia can be found reading up on traditional medicine and healing forms, doing yoga, uh, cooking, and painting. So those are the introductions. And, and now I'd kind of like to dive into some of my experience, some of my feelings. Um, and hopefully kind of frame this conference in the sense of uh, our surrounding values. So I've personally been interested in psychedelic therapy since my sophomore year of high school, uh, which is surprisingly now about 12 years ago. And in that time, despite the profuse and repeated warnings from my family, friends, and advisors, I have not stopped talking about psychedelics. Uh, 10 years ago, I'd often hear psychedelics were made illegal because they're dangerous and don't talk about them. People are gonna think you're a stoner. About four years ago, I was hearing, you'll never get into medical school if you talk about psychedelics. They'll think you're a disruptor. Even this year and last, I heard, don't talk about psychedelics, you'll never get into residency. And honestly, on this last point, I haven't matched yet, so there's a chance they're right, uh, but I, I, I'm feeling good about it, personally. Um, and also in recent years, I started to hear something different. I heard people saying, oh, you're in, interested in psychedelics too? Or I just saw another article in the news about psilocybin. Or have you read Michael Pollan? Or most concerningly, uh, my aunt started taking magic mushrooms every day, uh, which perhaps uh, uh, we'll have to discuss a little bit and figure out if that's wise. So yes, the, the tone, the zeitgeist of our culture has certainly started to shift. And even in my residency interviews, I've noticed more applicants speaking up and wanting to learn about how to use psychedelic substances in the clinic. I do fear, however, that the pendulum may swing too far from the over-dramatized fear of the recent past to cavalier assumptions of safety or panacea. This recent swell in interest and optimism for psychedelics is perhaps best referred to as the third wave of psychedelics. The first wave was indigenous. These were the often secret or oral traditions of ancient and pre-modern psychedelic use. These practices ranged from shamanic and religious to practical and social. The second wave refers to the emergence of psychedelics in the post-World War II Western culture, where the formal scientific method was perhaps for the first time applied to the pharmacology, biology, and psychology of psychedelics. The second wave ended when psychedelics were made illegal in almost every state and region of the world. Now, there are many things we can learn from the first and second waves that should be included in our proceedings. First of all, we must do our best to hear and respect indigenous voices, as this is perhaps the best way to stay in touch with the nature and the spirits of the organisms from which psychedelics may be derived. We must also be extremely careful and methodological in preparing, uh, excuse me, in discovering and preventing the short and long-term dangers and risks of psychedelics. These substances are powerful, and in the same way that they can bring psychological balance to one person, they may be dangerously destabilizing to another. Scientific examination is needed on the effects of psychedelics on every organ system. We must continue to discover contraindications and risk factors for adverse effects. Safety must come first, but ingenuity and optimism should come in close second. Devotion to careful methodology, safety, and sustainability will enable us to avoid the mistakes of the second wave of psychedelics. Moving forward in the present, the third wave of psychedelics is here and now. Its story is ours to write. We stand at the precipice in, at a precipice in the history of medicine, humanity, and the planet Earth. 
Due to the unfathomable and accelerating expansion of digital technology, the stakes of our actions have never been higher. In the same way that a reckless remark can propagate through the internet to destroy a reputation, a moment of brilliance can illuminate the minds of millions. While it has been decades since the dawn of the atomic age, the threat of international war, both explosive and insidious, remains preeminent in the minds of political scholars. Across the world, natural environments are being destroyed and often replaced with irresponsible and unsustainable agriculture, mining, manufacturing, and housing. I'd like to quote the World Wildlife Foundation's Living Planet Report from 2018 to create a little context for what the environmental global situation is. The latest index shows an overall decline of 60% in population sizes between 1970 and 2014. Declines are especially pronounced in the tropics with South and Central America suffering the most dramatic decline. An 89% loss compared to 1970. Freshwater species numbers have also declined dramatically with the freshwater index showing an 83% decline since 1970. Additional measurements all quote all paint the same picture, showing severe declines or changes, end quote. The report goes on to explain how human civilization is dependent on the persistence of biodiversity and how this trend is an existential threat to life as we know it. Now, I know that it is practically a trope to claim the end of days, to warn of apocalypse in order to get the attention of an audience but I would be lying to say I am unafraid for the fate of this world we call home. Solving the problems we face will require an evolution of society at large, a reprioritization of well-being, humility, and sustainability. This evolution is dependent on the hearts of individuals who are willing to engage and overcome their shadows and pain to work together and build a brighter future. People deserve all possible support for this universal struggle, which means they should have access to powerful tools of personal change, deep introspection, and revelation. Psychedelics are an important component of a strategy for rapid psychological development and growth. While I wish we had time for each member of humanity to spend decades in therapy to dredge up and cleanse their inherited trauma, the world is not going to stop spinning and we don't have time to wait. Quite frankly, the rapidity and reliability of psychedelics to induce transformative pro-social and pro-environmental experiences is unparalleled. The world we know is at risk of collapse, and perhaps only a miracle can save it. I believe that psychedelic assisted therapy is the key to unlocking and moving past the maladaptive patterns that we perpetuate as individuals, societies, and a species. I believe that psychedelics will do for psychiatry what antibiotics did for internal medicine. My ambition is to make safe and legal psychologically transformative therapy available to everyone who seeks it in order to generate the foundation of heart that is needed to change our world for the better. My fear is the corruption of psychedelic medicine by greedy corporate interests who may abuse psychedelic substances and practices to temporarily solidify their financial standings. My hope is that psychedelics are somehow immune to corruption due to their intrinsically empathetic nature. My dream is that psychedelics will continue to increase empathy, elevate consciousness, and perhaps lead to a golden age for humanity in a beautiful and respectful dance with the planet Earth and the cosmos. My prediction is that increasing access to psychedelic medicine will dramatically reduce the burden of suffering on a global scale and produce a plethora of innovative ideas that will stabilize our societies and environments. Our conference this year and in the years to come seeks specifically to avoid erroneous overstatements by focusing on specifically proven indications, clarifying theory from evidence, and emphasizing risks and their mitigation. We are also emphasizing the subjective and spiritual nature of psychedelic experiences by sharing real people's stories and experiences. 
Our schedule is full of too many amazing subjects and speakers to list here. So please, please, please double check the schedule to make sure that you catch the lectures of your interest. At this point, I think it is appropriate to share with you our formalized conference mission statement. The Psychedelic Medicine Conference serves an inclusive global community by providing free access to peer reviewed information regarding modern and traditional psychedelic healing practices. While minimizing the influence of bias and emphasizing the importance of ethical, equitable, and safe treatments for sustainable, physical, mental, and spiritual healing and development, the Psychedelic Medicine Conference strives to elevate human consciousness, reduce suffering, and improve social dynamics in balance with the protection of wildlife and natural ecosystems. Further, the PMC, Psychedelic Medicine Conference, will provide mentorship and opportunity for aspiring practitioners, researchers, and students from multiple disciplines to share their work and develop their scientific, analytic, and intuitive skills. I hope that this speech has adequately framed this moment in time and space, framed this conference and our purpose. I'd like to extend tremendous gratitude to all of our speakers and wish them all a smooth presentation. Now, let's begin. Thank you so much, Jesse, uh, for those beautiful words. Um, I'm excited to kick off our conference this year. So good morning, everyone. Uh, again, very excited to be working with my team again to be making this conference happen for uh, yet again on a second year. Uh, we've been working tirelessly over the last few months in order to make this a successful event once again by recruiting some of the uh, most prestigious experts in this field to speak for us. So I'm honored to be here with all of you for this and excited to get the ball rolling today and very honored to have some of these speakers for us. Um, our first professional today uh, who will be who is actually a personal favorite of mine, is going to be delivering our keynote presentation, and this year it's Dr. David E. Nichols, PhD. He's currently an adjunct professor in the Eshelman School of Pharmacy at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, North, North Carolina. Dr. Nichols is a distinguished professor emeritus at the Purdue University College of Pharmacy and was the Robert C. and Charlotte P. Anderson Distinguished Chair of Pharmacology, where he carried out teaching and research for 38 years prior to his retirement in 2012. In 24, he was named the Irvin H. Page Lecturer by the International Society for Serotonin Research, and he received the first Purdue Provost Outstanding Graduate Mentor Award in 2006. He was also named a distinguished alumnus by the University of Iowa College of Pharmacy in 2012. Dr. Nichols began studying psychedelics in 1969 while a graduate student and continued that research throughout his entire professional career, being one of only a few investigators able to research psychedelics after they were scheduled. In 1993, he founded the Hafter Research Institute, or HRI, which funded the first rigorous clinical studies of psychedelics in humans after a nearly 40-year moratorium and served as its president for more than 25 years. HRI funded the groundbreaking Phase 1 and Phase 2 studies of psilocybin for the treatment of depression, as well as substance use disorders. He is considered the world's leading expert on the chemistry of psychedelics. Dr. Nichols, although officially retired, remains active in the field through consulting and collaborations with several academic and pharmaceutical organizations and continues to publish scientific papers. In my own personal studies, I've read countless publications by Dr. Nichols, and he has been an idol of mine for many years now. It is truly an honor to have him here to present for us. So without further ado, we have Dr. David Nichols giving an overview of psychedelics from prehistory to the present. Welcome, Dr. Nichols. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you fine. Okay. Jesse, you're very optimistic. Uh, thank you. I, I hope springs eternal. <laughs> I hope I hope your optimism comes true. 
Um, Me too. Okay. So let's see. I can share the screen. Control Shift D. Let's see if this works. Control Shift D. And this looks like the one I want to talk about here. Is that showing up okay? Yeah, right. showing up fine. Okay, so this is a sort of a soup to nuts talk. I'm going to talk about some very old stuff where psychedelics came from and some of the more recent. Um, I can't drill too deep on a lot of this stuff because of time limitations. You can imagine there's so many things you could say for so long. So I'm going to compress it down. Um, I assume I have about an hour. We'll see um, how that turns out. If I talk too fast, slow me down. Okay, so, and this is an Alex Gray picture behind here. I don't know if you can see it. Alex Gray is a visionary artist who paints these very weird psychedelic scenes. So he's got a face back here and these are all presumably elements of a hallucination. So let me get into it. <clears throat> um, I don't know how many of you read Chemical and Engineering News. This is, a, this is a publication put out by the American Chemical Society. And in March the 7th, we had this psychedelics article, which is, to, is probably a first for this, or, for this organization and for its newsletter. So they're becoming very popular. There's a huge amount of attention directed toward these substances. With respect to publications, I only have out to 2020, but you can see the Controlled Substances Act was passed in 1970. That sort of the ended the research on psychedelics in most places. There was one study at Johns Hopkins at Baltimore that kept going on until 76, but basically publications just dropped. And then you see they start picking up again, and it's exponential. If we go into 2022, there are probably even more of them up here. So there's been a tremendous interest. The problem in this field has been because of the abuse problems, perceived abuse problems, the National Institutes of Health, the National Institute of Mental Health have not funded research. And if you're an academic, uh, like I was, if you can't get funding for your research, um, you're not going to get tenure, you're going to be gone in five years. So there hasn't been funding. Most of this has been funded by philanthropists. And that's one of the things that I did, I'll mention later on, getting philanthropists to do this. So what are psychedelics? Well, they're kind of unusual drugs. Um, they produce changes in thought and perception and mood, um, imagination that normally you wouldn't experience unless you were dreaming or maybe having a lucid dream or having a rel religious experience and religious exaltation. And you can recognize from your knowledge of pharmacology that this is a very unusual definition for a class of drugs. I mean, if you think about sedative hypnotics or psychostimulants or whatever, they're pretty easily defined, but something that gives you experiences that are like when you're dreaming or having a religious experience. So they're, they've always known to be, been known to be an unusual class of drugs. This is from uh, Goodman and Gilman's eighth edition. It was also in the seventh edition. This is the, sort of the pharmacologist Bible if you've got a copy of this for your classes. Um, I looked up yesterday to see how many of these there were from clinicaltrials.gov. There are 137 clinical trials of psilocybin currently registered. That doesn't include DMT, 5 infoxy DMT, or LSD. This is just psilocybin, which is the one most people have been interested in. So this is this is really huge. This is not something that happened in 1969 when, when I started my studies. So with respect to natural sources, we have three chemotypes. We have phenethylamines, tryptamines, and ergolines. So phenethylamines, this is the peyote cactus, Lofofor wayamzii, and it contains mescaline. Mescaline is a 3,4,5 trimethoxy phenylethylamine. And can I ask, have you, you've all had organic chemistry, I assume. I don't plan to emphasize organic chemistry, but if I talk about methoxy groups, it's not going to throw people for a loop. Okay, so phenethylamines, this, is, uh, this was isolated from the peyote cactus by Arthur Hefter back in 1896, 1897 where he took the peyote cactus, extracted all the alkaloids, and then ingested each one separately until he found that it was mescaline, this trimethoxyphenethylamine. It's not particularly potent, it's orally active. The dose would be between 200 and 300 milligrams. It also has a very long duration of action, maybe eight to 10 hours. So it's a prototype, but it has effects very much like LSD or any of the other psychedelics, or classic psychedelics. Then uh, we have Estecorum uh, Mexicana here. So we have uh, mushrooms. There are 200 species of psilocybin producing mushrooms that are known in the world. And they have essentially as an active ingredient, a tryptamine, which is this indole nucleus, this bicyclic uh, Turing nucleus here, 
Again, two carbons away from a nitrogen. That's what we see in most ligands for monoamine receptors, an aromatic system two carbons away from a nitrogen, an aromatic system two carbons away from a nitrogen. This is a tertiary amine. If we have nothing attached over here, the compound is known as dimethyltryptamine or DMT. It's only active by inhalation. Uh, it's not orally active and not particularly potent uh, in terms of the dose, but extremely potent in producing behavioral effects. Um, five methoxy DMT at the five position, we have a methoxy. This would be five methoxy DMT, which is isolated originally from the Sonoran Desert toad. Uh, this has uh, been called the God molecule sometimes because it's such a powerful psychedelic. Uh, really puts people out there. Um, it's also not active orally. It's only active if you in insufflate it or smoke it. Now, at the four position, these are the ones that are most popular and most uh, studied now. If we have a, an oxygen at the four position hooked to a phosphate group, that would be psilocybin. Psilocybin is what's actually called a prodrug because once you ingest the psilocybin, the phosphate group is cleaved off by phosphatases really revealing the 4-hydroxy here. 4-hydroxy uh, tryptamine, dimethyltryptamine is known as psilocin, and it's the actual active species. Um, it can be given psilocybin is more stable in a bottle, but chemically uh, psilocin is actually the active ingredient. And then we have lysergamides. This is an infected uh, stalk of uh, rye. It's been infected with uh, an er the ergot fungus, Claviceps uh, purpurea. And these little black things are called the are grains of ergot. They're actually the sclerotia or the hibernating form of the ergot fungus. So you, you see them like this and the, in earlier years, they would be harvested along with the grain and make people very sick if they ate this ergot infested grain. Ergot alkaloids look basically like this. Um, some of them are a little, a little different, but they all have this four ring uh, ergoline ring system. Once again, you notice we have this aromatic system, two carbons away from a nitrogen, not quite as obvious as in the tryptamine or phenethylamine, but it's the same uh, pattern we see in bio many biologically active compounds. Lysergic acid would have a carboxylic acid here, COH. When we have an amide, we, if these R groups are ethyls, this would be LSD, lysergic acid diethyl amide. So this is just a general scheme. Most of the ergodapoloids have the ergoline system the double bond may be in this position or this position. They may have different things attached up here. Ergotamine, for example, is a great big piece of something uh, shrubbery up here. But these are ergolines. And LSD, of course, is the most notorious. The dose that you can detect in most people is around 20 or 30 micrograms. Doses that we use clinically are around 100 micrograms. It's orally active, and it also lasts about eight to 10 hours. <clears throat> In addition to those, in the, for the Aztecs, when they couldn't get their magic mushrooms, they would take the seeds of Turbina corambosa and grind them up, also called Ololuki. They contain lysergamide in the seeds. This is lysergamide. You can see it's a lysergic acid amide. The only difference with LSD is we don't have the diethyl groups on here. This is much less potent than LSD. It doesn't have exactly the same effects, more of a psychostimulant effect at two or three milligrams as opposed to Know, half a milligram with LSD. Um, and also, in, we have the Hawaiian baby wood rose, which also contains uh, ergine or lysergamide in the seeds. Now, interestingly, the morning glories don't actually produce these alkaloids. What's occurring is a symbiotic relationship between the ergot fungus and the seed of the plant. So the ergot uh, alkaloids like ergine are found in the seeds of a uh, term of Ololuki or in the seeds of uh, Hawaiian baby wood rose and they can be extracted out. And if you go on the internet, you'll find people that have extraction procedures for extracting the ergot alkaloids out. But anyway, that's another source. And you probably heard of ayahuasca. <clears throat> uh, this is a mixture of plants that containing DMT as well as beta carbolines. I mentioned DMT as a tryptamine on that earlier slide, and it's not active orally. Um, it's produced in the, plant, in the leaves of this plant, Psychotria viridis, sometimes called Chacruna. Um, and this Banisteriopsis capi is a vine that grows in the Amazon, and it contains beta carbolines. So the problem with DMT, if you take it orally, it's broken down by monoamine oxidase in the liver. Beta carbolines from Banisteriopsis, however, reversibly block monoamine oxidase A. And so if you use a mixture of these two, suddenly the DMT is not broken down in the gut. So what the shaman in South America will do is 
pick the leaves of Cyclotria, take the Banisteriopsis vine, uh, beat it up in the little pieces like that, put the two together in a pot of water and boil the dickens out of it. Filter out the plant material and you get this brown goo that's called ayahuasca. Its potency can vary depending on who made it, what the concentration of DMT is, et cetera. But um, ayahuasca is used by a couple of churches, the Unio de Vegetal and also the Santo Daime. Um, they got the Unio de Vegetal got protection under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act by the Supreme Court. So if you're a member of Unio de Vegetal, you're allowed to ingest ayahuasca. For most of us that aren't, um, it, it would be potentially a problem if the police came in and raided your apartment and found a big bottle of uh, ayahuasca in your refrigerator. <clears throat> so where do these psychedelics work? <clears throat> Well, they bind, the G -pro bind and activate the G-protein coupled receptors, and I'll say a little bit more about those. The phenethylamines like mescaline bind to the 2A and 2C receptors. Tryptamines bind to the 2A, 2C receptors, and also the 1A receptor. And LSD is very promiscuous and binds to a bunch of different monoamine receptors. But the thing that these all have in common is activation of this serotonin 2A receptor. Um, and... There have been studies done clinically in both in animals in vitro, where if you give a receptor blocker, a drug, for example, that's known as ketanserin, that blocks 5-HT2A receptors, you can block the effects of these drugs in humans and behavioral effects in animals. So we're pretty convinced, and also in knockout animals, mice that have had the 5-HT2A receptor knocked out, they don't have any response, any behavioral response if you give them a psychedelic. So we're pretty convinced that the 2A receptor is the key receptor. Um, it's necessary, it may not be essential. It's possible some of these other ancillary interactions, you know, especially the 5 ht one a receptor may be involved. With LSD, we think some of the dopamine D2 and D3 receptors may also be involved in their action. But this is the necessary activation of the 2A receptor, which you have to have for the psychedelic effect. <clears throat> now, where's that receptor? It changes your perception and the way you see the world. So it must be someplace important. So this is a slice taken through a human brain. And what they did is incubate the slice with radioactive uh, tritiated ketanserin, which is a ligand that binds to the receptor. It's an antagonist ligand. And uh, you let this tissue sit for a while, and then <clears throat> you wash it off and put photographic film on it, develop it, and then look at the density. And what you see here is high density by this, these red colors, high density in the outer layer of the cortex all the way back to the parietal and into the visual cortex. So those 2A receptors are widely expressed in the cortex. There are a number of other uh, areas in the brain that have 2A receptors, but uh, this is where we think most of the business into the molecule is happening. And if you blow this up and look at these uh, receptors, you have in the cortex in layer five, these pyramidal cells. They're shaped like little triangles or pyramids. And coming in from the outside into those is something called the apical dendrite. Serotonin 2A receptors are expressed largely on apical dendrites in these pyramidal cells. <clears throat> now, what are pyramidal cells? We could say they're the major computational units in the cortex. Um, if you imagine the way the cortex processes information, it's like a massively parallel processor, um, a biocomputer. So these are all these parallel units in the cortex. They're receiving both inhibitory and excitatory inputs from lower brain centers, where they come into these cortical pyramidal cells, and essentially uh, these cells make a decision based on temporal summation, make a decision as to whether to fire or not, and then they have axons that proceed to lower structures. But if you imagine that these receptors are loca located on these uh, critical apical dendrites, and what happens when the serotonin 2A receptor on them is activated, it depolarizes the membrane potential. That means it makes it easier to fire. So what happens is the gain increases. So these pyramidal cells can now start picking up signals that normally they wouldn't pick up. They'll pick up things from uh, subconscious areas, visual, uh, emotion, memory, etc. And now you can imagine if you change the membrane potential of a crucial circuit circuit component in the brain, it's going to really screw up how it processes. Imagine if you have a, a computer with a CPU and somehow you change the electrical resistance or the conductivity of those connections within that CPU, it's not going to work right. And that's basically what happens 
in the human brain, these pyramidal cells are so critical to normal processing that when we change the electrical potential on these membranes, it changes the processing of signals in the cortex and somehow, which nobody can explain completely yet, changes the way we perceive things, changes our perception of reality. <clears throat> this is a mouse somatosensory cortex just to show where these pyramidal cells are. They're in layer five. Here are the pyramidal cells down at the bottom of layer five, layer 5a, and you can see the apical dendrites are right in this area. The blue lines are inhibitory connections, the red lines are excitatory. So you can see the degree of temporal summation that must be happen happening with these crucial pyramidal cells in the cortex. They're really affected by everything that happens all throughout the brain. And their, their uh, signaling is driven by those 5-HT2A receptors. So what happens if you activate those receptors? What happens inside of a brain cell? So as a schematic, these serotonin 2A receptors are members of the larger G protein coupled receptor superfamily. And we now know that they can signal through a variety of mechanisms within the neuronal membrane. So if this is the external side, and this is the internal side. When a psychedelic binds into this receptor bundle, it changes the conformation of the bundle. And importantly, there are loops that connect the bottom of these uh, alpha helices. So if you imagine, um, sometimes these receptor diagrams are called serpentine because they, they, they go in and out and in and out and circulate in and out of the membrane. So these are all, this is one long protein all connected together, together with alpha helical segments that are buried within the membrane. So when you put a ligand in here in the top and it binds, it changes the way these helices bundle together. And then that leads to changes in the intracellular loops, which are much larger and more extensive than I've shown here. And those intracellular loops then can interact with G proteins. <clears throat> So we have um, G proteins that have a G alpha, G beta, G gamma, and there are 14 different types of G alphas and a number of types of beta and gamma. And these all dissociate, um, they release GDP, bind GTP, and then they go and interact with signaling molecules. So the how G alpha may interact with a, a phospholipase C, for example, to hydrolyze uh, phospholipids. Uh, the beta and gamma may go to potassium channels, things like that. So you get different signals, in addition to which after the G protein dissociates, G protein receptor kinases come in and can phosphorylate uh, ser uh, serine and threonine residues on these loops. And when they're phosphorylated, they recruit a signaling molecule known as arrestin. The arrestin-1 and arrestin-2, showing these phosphate groups here. When they recruit arrestin, this leads to receptor internalization. So they're pulled inside the cells away from the cell membrane. And also there's a whole bunch of signals that can occur through a MAP kinase a pathway. This is actually the serotonin 2A receptor from a crystal structure paper that we published in 2020. This is actually the receptor here. And I've shown the alpha helices inside and also the surfaces as transparent spheres. So you get a sense of the actual size of this. This would be essentially buried within the neuronal membrane uh, the bottom of this would be near the in internal leaflet of the um, neuronal membrane. The ligands would bind up here. Here's the G alpha subunit, and it normally would bind GDP when it was inactive. When you activate it with an agonist, it leads to activation here. This dissociates. The GDP is extruded, and it binds GTP. And there's an intrinsic GTPase within the G alpha subunit that slowly hydrolyzes it. So after this dissociates, releases a GDP, binds GTP, it dissociates from the beta gamma units, goes to a signaling molecule like phospholipase, and it activates that until its intrinsic GTPase slowly hydrolyzes the GTP down. Then it loses its affinity for the signaling molecule, comes back and will reassociate with the receptor. So that's really a quick view of how that all happens with the relative sizes. And you can see with respect to this receptor, sometimes you'll see a diagram with a great big receptor and little signaling molecules. Receptor is really kind of the thing that turns this whole assemblage on and off. The, the, the business end is much larger and more extensive inside the neuron itself. Um, it turns out that there are 14 types of G-alpha proteins and the psychedelics primarily activate what are called members of the GQ family. And these are the ones that lead to calcium release and phospholipase uh, hydrolysis, et cetera. So looking at these curves, the black curves are neurotensin all of the G alpha subunits are activated by neurotensin receptors. So it's just showing that the black curves are just showing that we've got a cell system that's viable. 
But now when we, and all these have got LSD, an NBO uh, serotonin, and also an N-benzyl compound, which is a very potent serotonin to agonist. And none of those do anything in any of these other cell lines. But when we go to cells that have been transfected with G-alpha-Q or 11 or 15, you see we now get a dose response curve. This is serotonin, LSD, and the N-benzyl compound. So this is the family that's primarily activated by psychedelics when they hit the 5-HT2A receptor. So let me uh, talk about a, a study we did about 20 or so years ago. <clears throat> when you look at LSD, it's a unique compound. It's extremely potent. So I've said the doses as low as 20 to 25 micrograms can be detected. The typical dose would be 100 micrograms clinically, but doses in the recreational market were typically 50 to 60 micrograms. Very potent compound, and its potency is highly dependent on this diethyl group. And I, we had done a lot of study, and when I was at Purdue, we made about 20 or 30 different amides of lysergic acid. And, and as Albert Hoffman at Sandoz had also shown, who when he first synthesized lysergamides, this diethyl is unique. It's got a profile of activity that sets it apart from all the other lysergamides. So this is a diethyl with four carbons. If we go to methylpropyl, which also has four carbons, the activity drops off about an order of magnitude. Where dimethyl is much less active, dipropyl less active, uh, ethylpropyl less active. Virtually anything you do to these alkyl groups makes a less active molecule. So we question why that was. Usually if you look at drugs, you'd make a change in the structure. It may decrease its activity a little bit, but unless you're in a critical region of the molecule, it doesn't really destroy its activity. That's what was happening. So we thought in early experiments, let's make the amide of a couple of chiral substituents. So we selected 2-aminobutane, and 2-aminobutane, of course, has the same number of four carbon atoms that the diethyl group has. But in addition, we have a stereocenter. We can make the R or the S, and you remember from organic chemistry, you can designate enantiomers as having this R uh, rectus or this S configuration. And when we tested those in rats that had been trained to discriminate LSD, Here's the ED50 for LSD train rats, 28 nanomoles per kilogram as an average. Well, if we look at these, the R is about 33. This is not significantly different. So the R enantiomer was about comparable to LSD in these rats. But then when we look at the S, it drops off by about fourfold. That was clearly indicating to us that there was some kind of a steric region here where this diethyl amide was binding. And if we tie them together into a five-membered ring, you see it's even less potent. So that got us thinking about what is this diethyl group doing? <clears throat> so we thought we'd find out a little bit more about this by making some rigid analogs. So LSD has got these two ethyl groups, and I've shown here that they can rotate around. So they can occupy either trans this way or trans this way or cis, which is not chiral. And here's the front view of the two different extremes. With LSD, the front ethyl down, the back ethyl up or the front ethyl up and the back ethyl down. And with the SS, s adenine, so we have the s stereochemistry at these two positions, you can see this looks very much like the LSD conformer here, and the RR looks very much like this other LSD conformer. If you look at them from the top, you see the same thing. This is LSD with the two ethyl groups projecting off the diethylamine this way, or reversed over this way, and the SS is this way and this way, and this way and this way. And you can see the obvious parallels between LSD conformations, the two extreme conformations, and the SS and R zetidine. So then we tested these in rats and in receptor preparations. And what we found was that this one was the only one that had LSD like activity. So that was telling us that the diethyl flexible diethyl groups of LSD were binding in this orientation when they bound to the receptor, the orientation represented by the SS dimethyl azetidine. In drug discrimination and in phosphonositide turnover, again, we see the same thing. This is a different set of experiments, so the number's a little different, but you see, again, the LSD and the SS transazetidine are almost identical. Same thing for the EC50 potency and phosphonositide turnover, and the efficacy, the Emax, 23 versus 43, not a lot of difference here. If we look at the cis, much, much less potent in drug discrimination. RR trans, even less potent, and you see also efficacy drops off. Um, or potency, rather, efficacy is similar. None of these are very uh, good agonists or partial agonists. And we published this in 2002. Um, now, in 2017, 
Um, in the lab where I'm working, we were able to uh, obtain the crystal structure of LSD in the serotonin 2B receptor. The serotonin 2B receptor and 2A receptor are very similar. They differ in one key residue in helix 5. The 2B receptor has an alanine and the 2A receptor has a serine. That's a major difference. So we expect they would be the same. The 2B receptor was much easier to get a crystal structure of. The 2A receptor turns out to be difficult to crystallize. So when we look at the crystal structure, this is the structure of LSD bound inside the receptor. These are the actual um, the bonds and atoms. I represent them as just lines here. These are stick representations. So if we now take the SSZ adene, it's completely superimposable on the LSD configuration bound to the receptor. And if we had the RRZ adene, what that would mean is this methyl would be projected up here, and this methyl would be projected down here. It would be just opposite to what we see with the uh, methyl groups in LSD, in the, the terminal methyl groups. So we had predicted approximately 20 years earlier what the conformation of LSD would be when it was in the receptor. Now, if we look at this from the top, this is the 2B receptor. This piece here that I've colored yellow is the connecting loop, extracellular loop 2, that connects the top of helix 5 to helix 4. As I told you earlier, these helices thread in and out of the membrane, and they're connected at the tops and bottoms by these connecting loops, extracellular loop 2, 3, intracellular loop 1, 2, 3, etc. This is extracellular loop 2, and we had done some uh, model studies where we had docked LSD, and it looked to us like LSD might be interacting somehow with this extracellular loop. This was way before we had good crystal structures. And so we did mutagenesis on the residues in this loop and found that leucine-229, uh, when we mutated that to an alanine, it had the biggest effect on LSD binding. And what you notice here, these other residues are projecting outward away from the receptor, whereas this leucine-229 is actually folded under the extracellular loop, and this is LSD. So essentially, it wedges LSD into the receptor. And that was very interesting because <clears throat> That, that, uh, that told us something about the kinetics of this. So what we did is we made a mutation of that uh, leucine-229. We mutated it to an alanine. Just to refresh your biochemical knowledge, this is a leucine and this is an alanine. You can see they're quite different in size. So if we mutate that key leucine to an alanine, it makes it smaller. And since this is wedging LSD into the receptor, if we make this into an alanine, what will happen? So this is what's actually going to happen. So the wild type is with leucine 29 here. So we have a preparation here. These were uh, called um, HEK cells, human embryonic kidney cells. We transfected them with a serotonin 2A receptor. Now we have them permanently transfected. We have a cell line that now, that now expresses serotonin 2A receptors. And we incubate them with radioactive LSD, tritium labeled LSD. We incubate them for about four hours, and then we wash off the supernatant. Then we add fresh buffer with no radioactive LSD, and we take samples at various times to see what's the rate of the off rate. So with the wild type of 229, you see it's about six to 10 hours before all the LSD comes out of the receptor. But when we mutate that leucine to an alanine, we make that residue smaller, expecting that it's gonna have some effect. Sure enough, this is, this, this is the same experiment. And now it comes off in about probably four hours instead of six to six to ten hours. That's for um, the wild type versus leucine 229. Now, <clears throat> if we look at calcium flux, this is mediated by the G protein. There's no difference between the wild type and leucine 229. But if we look at beta restin recruitment. If we look at beta restin recruitment, we see the wild type still has a very potent and efficacious recruitment on arrestin, but now when we make that residue smaller to an alanine, now it's much less active. So that was very interesting. The affinity was related to how long it stayed on was related to whether we had the alanine or leucine, but there was no difference when we did G protein, and there was a big difference when we looked at arrestin recruitment for those two. So we looked at <clears throat> a resin recruitment as a function of time. So now we go back and we do the resin experiment and we incubate it for five minutes and then we quench the reaction and, and measure take out samples uh, in 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 120 and 300 minutes. What you see is the potency has increased 
and efficacy is also increased. And what that, that's telling us is that the longer the LSD stays in the receptor, the more potently it recruits arrestin and the more efficacious it becomes. Now, arrestin recruitment is one of the things that causes tolerance of LSD. The psychedelics produce a very rapid tolerance called tachyphylaxis. If you take LSD on a Monday, take the same dose on a Tuesday, it'll have much less of an effect. The same dose on Wednesday, much less of an effect, and by Thursday, it has almost no effect. That's related to the internalization of the receptor. So once this LSD gets in there and sticks in the receptor, it starts internalizing. It recruits arrestin and internalizes and goes into the neuron. When we just look at the leucine-229, there's no time dependence. So it's clearly the leucine that's causing this problem and making this presumably make an LSD have such a long duration of action and be so potent. So let me talk about um, a recent study that's not been published. One of the things Brian Ross lab has done, he's got some people very good at uh, getting crystal structures and more recently cryo electron micro micro micrograph structures. And so um, I asked him, I gave him some mescaline and said, can you do a structure of mescaline? Because this was a, a bit different than the other compounds. It's got those three, four, five trimethoxies, where most of the others only had like a two, five dimethoxy. And uh, we had made compounds earlier and Sasha Shogun had analyzed them. So this is mescaline, the three, four, five trimethoxy. And here's this methoxy in the four position. Here's es a compound we called escaline. It also has an ethyl in the four position. And alloloscaline, this is an allyl group. And these are all bigger, more hydrophobic groups. Now, because of the space, I didn't show these as space filling molecules, but because of the size of these three, five methoxies, buttressing that middle methoxy, it forces the methoxy out of plane. You can see this methyl is, is twisted out of plane. This uh, ethoxy is twisted out of plane. This is twisted out of plane. And these are all energy minimized structures that I uh, minimized with Spartan. So, and you see mescaline is the least potent, 200, 400 milligrams, escaline 40 to 60 milligrams, alloscaline 20 to 25, 35 milligrams. Now, part of that's probably related to hydrophobicity because we know that penetration into the central nervous system, fattier molecules get in there better. So, escaline is fattier, it's probably going to get in better than mescaline. Alloscaline is probably going to get in better than escaline. But there's another thing, if we actually look at the receptor, this is actually from a dock structure of mescaline in the 2A receptor obtained by cryo-electron microscopy. This structure has not been published yet, but I, I wanted to get a copy of it so I could talk about it. So here's mescaline. It's got the three, four, five trimethoxies. One of these methoxies is twisted out of plane, but this middle methoxy is also twisted out of plane. And this middle methoxy is the one I was talking about modifying, putting an ethyl here or an allyl here. What does that do? And one of the things that I noticed was we had a phenylalanine in helix 5 and a valine in helix 5 that are very close to this uh, four position. Um, mescaline, probably there's an asparagine at the top of helix 6 that hydrogen bonds to this middle methoxy. There's also a serine 242 that interacts with the indole nitrogen of ergolines and tryptamines that also can bind to this methoxy. But if we look at space filling, what this actually looks like when I populate this as spheres, what happens is that 4-methoxy nestles right up inside the phenylalanine 234 and the valine 235. It forms a hydrophobic area for that piece to push into. So these crystal structures can tell us a lot about what's actually happening in the receptor interactions. So I thought this is kind of interesting because it no one has been able no one has been able to explain mescaline because this methoxies are in a different position. If you look at almost all of the other phenethylamine psychedelics, they have a 2,5-dimethoxy. We know how they bind now, but the 345 has been a mystery for a long time. So this crystal structure really solved it. It showed this asparagine interacting, the serine interacting, but also why this receptor can tolerate hydrophobic substituents in the four position. Now I'll talk briefly about some translational research. Um, I started the Hefter Research Institute in 1993. I was the one who called up my friends and said, listen, nobody's doing clinical research. Let's start clinical research. Because the idea you could do clinical research has been poo-pooed by many people, big names in the field. Anne Shogun told me, she's Sasha's wife, said, the government will never let you do clinical research. They're too terrified of these compounds. 
And I disagreed with that. I said, the problem is things were crazy back then. Um, they've changed clinical paradigms now. You have to do randomized controlled studies. Very few of those were published. There's a whole schema. And I think if we go to a re legitimate organization, um, we can get this done. Someone who has credentials. So I went to Rick Strassman about the same time. He wanted to give a psychedelic to humans. He decided he wanted to give DMT because he has some ideas about DMT. So we met with Daniel Friedman, who was a member of NARSAD and who also had a lot of influence on funding boards and this, with the uh, Scottish Rite Foundation, which studies schizophrenia. And Rick got money to do a study giving intravenous DMT to humans. That was actually the first study done. It was done in the early 90s in this whole two generation lapse before anything got done. I made the DMT for Rick Strassman. I also made the MDMA for MAPS. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> the first study that we funded from Hefter was by Charles Grove, who's at UCLA Harbor. And this was in advanced stage cancer. It was a small number, only N of 12. He used a low dose of psilocybin. He published this in 2011. He found six months after treatment that their anxiety significantly reduced. He didn't see immediate effects, probably because of the structure of the uh, treatment as well as the low dose. This was the first study that went in where anything was proposed for treatment. So when Rick Strassman and I, I were talking with Danny Friedman about using DMT, Danny Friedman said, don't propose any kind of therapy. That's too controversial. Just do things like measure growth hormone and prolactin and changes that you can get in by blood chemistry. And that's basically what Strassman did. His early papers really talk about changes in blood pressure, heart rate, um, and blood factors they, that they could measure. But what happened was he, people had these weird experience of speaking with aliens. And so Rick wrote a book called the LSD um, or DMT, the spirit molecule, and also had a movie made about this, interviewing these people that had these weird experiences. But anyway, Charles Grove was the first one that Hefter funded. Um, and this showed, and he took him a long time to get a protocol written. You can imagine um, he's nobody has done any clinical work with psychedelics in a treatment uh, mode for you know since the 19 mid 1970s and early, and before that. So now he's going to give this psychedelic, which back then they called a hallucinogen. I don't like calling them hallucinogens because they don't produce hallucinations. So the IRB, the Institutional Review Board, is going to review this and decide whether he can do this because they're concerned about safety, right? So he has a lot of trouble with the IRB because they just said you're going to give hallucinogens to dying people? This sounds completely crazy. Except back in the 60s, that was one of the interesting indications. LSD was used in cancer patients, was found to be very effective. It was first reported in the early 1964-65. So it made sense to do this. We thought this is going to be a lot of bang for the buck. And if you're doing the first clinical study that's been done in two generations, what kind of uh, indication are you going to try to focus on? And in dying patients, you've got a big benefit to risk ratio. Um, there's exis existential distress in people who are dying. They really, many people die horrible, painful deaths in hospitals without a touch with relatives and family, etc. So if we could improve dying, then we thought that would be good. And so that was the first one. The big studies were out of uh, Johns Hopkins and New York University. Hefter funded those. We recruited uh, Roland Griffiths. He was on the Hefter board. Steve Ross was also on the Hefter board at that time. These are larger studies of people with life-threatening life -threatening cancer diagnosis, and they got larger doses, and these were very effective, and I'll show you something about it. These are other studies that we funded that are ongoing, but just these are the ones that really got everybody talking about. Could psychedelics, could psilocybin really be beneficial? So these are the, the bar graphs for the outcome. So the low dose was used. This was a dose that was not psychoactive. You may be aware that um, in the clinical studies, you try to use a placebo control. So you have everything the same, clinical conditions the same, the, the clinicians the same. The only difference is one group gets a placebo, a sugar pill, and the other group get the medicine. And then you determine whether there's a difference. And that's pretty straightforward if you're looking at changes in blood pressure with a beta blocker, for example, or changes in heart rate, something with a beta blocker or a stimulant. But when you're talking about uh, consciousness uh, and drugs that change fundamentally alter consciousness, how, what kind of placebo do you give? Because in all of these studies, pretty much the patients who got the real drug pretty much knew it right off the bat. And they had two sitters, 
male and female therapists with them, and they could all tell that who got the drug and who didn't get the drug. Um, I just saw a humorous cartoon the other day that showed a, a group of people sitting in a chair and a bunch of naked people running around in a circle singing, holding hands. And the people in the chair said, well, I guess we know who got the placebo group. But anyway, <clears throat> so this is um, depression, a clinically significant response. This is a reduction in symptoms measured on the Hamilton a depression scale. Low dose does essentially nothing. This is just the treatment conditions, having two therapists there in a room, you know, comfortably talking before and after. Okay, it doesn't really have a big effect. And then you give the dose of psilocybin and you see you see 90% clinically re significant response. Six months later, you see it hasn't attenuated much. This is a single dose lasting for six months in people who are depressed, existential depressed. The um, remission, which ne almost never happens with an SSRI, means they no longer qualify for being depressed. And this is a percentage of patients in remission. 60% has six months, actually 70%. You, rare, you, you don't see 70% 70 70 remission with SSRIs or SNRIs. So this is really remarkable. And this is what really called attention to these. Anxiety, you see the same thing, a clinically significant response of, uh, with placebo, essentially nothing, 80% um, to 85% with the clinically significant response initially, and then six month follow up. And then uh, remission to the normal range, remission, you see 60, less, somewhat less than 60, about 60 some percent remission for, for, for anxiety. These are in patients with a cancer diagnosis, and they're really in a lot of existential distress. So this is pretty dramatic. Um, these results really got everybody thinking they were published in 2016 in the same issue of Journal of Psychopharmacology. That's what got people really looking at this. This is a re more recent study uh, that was a follow-up of Davis et al. who gave uh, one dose, a 20 milligram per 70 kilograms dose of psilocybin, followed 1.6 weeks later by 30 milligrams per 70 kilograms. You probably don't need the 30 milligrams, the 20 milligrams did the job. And this is the plots of all of the Hamilton depression scores on all patients, all 24 patients. These dotted lines are patients who are non-responders. So you see three people out of 24 were non-responders and you saw a lot of variability. And then this was uh, followed up in 2022 by Glucosin. And you can see what you see is the dramatic reduction in the Hamilton depression scores. Um, these are uh, Cohen Ds, so they are significant. There's a lot of variability because people are variable, but still when you average it together, you see you get a significant effect. Uh, and that includes those three outliers who didn't uh, respond. So take those out and you'll get tighter uh, controls. So um, I finished in 50 minutes, it looks like. Um, so this is a slide I like to show because I wrote something about um, psychedelics and therapy as a new paradigm. And um, as, our inter as the introductory speaker mentioned, um, there's a lot of excitement about um, psilocybin especially and trying to figure out how many ways it can be used. We have studies now for um, alcohol use disorder. There's a big study that was published out of New York University um, by Michael Bogenschutz who showed a significant sobriety uh, in, uh, in 98, I think 96 or 98 patient cohort. Um, Michael, Matt Johnson did a study of psilocybin assisted therapy in long-term smokers significant reduction in smoking. We have a study going at Yale. This is also funded through Hefter, looking at obsessive compulsive neurosis, OCD, uh, with psilocybin assisted therapy. There's also an eating disorder study that's going on at Johns Hopkins. So this, I won't say this stuff is a philosopher's stone, but um, there's a lot of things that seems to yield to, which really shows promise in rejuvenating maybe psychiatry. When I taught at Purdue, for about 10 years, I taught in medical students. I taught a class in psychopharmacology for one semester, talked about um, anti-schizophrenic drugs, anti-anxiety drugs, and so forth. And I would typically, these were small classes. The way the Indiana system works is there are small regional campuses where you have 15 or 16 students that take their anatomy, their basic courses, core course, et cetera. And in the third and fourth years, they, go to, they all go to Indianapolis to do the, med, the rotations in the clinics. So we had one of those small groups that was typically 15, 16 students. And every year I'd say, okay, what do you, well, what are you plan to major in? And they'd say, 
well, you know, OBGYN, cardiology, dermatology, whatever, almost no one ever said psychiatry. And so one year I said, how come nobody ever mentions, nobody's going into psychiatry? They said, well, you can't help people. You know, what do you do? And there was generally a very negative, negative attitude towards psychiatry. And of course, I've been doing research on psychedelic, psychedelic drugs and CNS drugs for Parkinson's disease. And I'd done the early work on ecstasy. So for me, the exciting stuff was CNS stuff. And it was really disappointing that psychiatrists weren't really more interested. But now there's been a big change. I've got a lot of emails from people wanting to know, you know, are there opportunities? I'm in a medical school. If I do a residency in psychiatry, how's it going to work out? Am I going to be able to work in this field? And in addition, we have classes being offered a number of places now for therapists. California Institute of uh, Integral Studies is offering a course. I teach in it every year. I get basic pharmacology. Um, MAPS gives a course for MDMA training these therapists because if these are approved, and I think MDMA is going to be approved for um, PTSD probably next year sometime, we literally need many thousands of therapists to sit with these people. And the other issue is um, that people are focusing on is scalability. For the study at New York University, I asked Steve Ross, I said, what did this study cost per participant? And he estimated dividing the total cost for, that they got in the grant with the number of patients, he said about $25,000 per person. So, you know, insurance is probably not going to pay that, even if you can, you know, even if it cuts their long term need for other kinds of therapy and drugs. I don't think insurance companies are going to want to reimburse, you know, $25,000. So the big issue now is it looks like this therapy works. It's a new paradigm. Drug industries are not going to make any money for the most part because they're making their money off multiple daily doses of some drug that you take for the rest of your life. So it's really an interesting situation where all the research has been funded by philanthropists so far. And now figuring out how we're going to scale this, how we're going to make it so it actually is practical. Because you can't have people come in that get screened and cost $25,000. We have to scale it so that ordinary people can come in and get this treatment at a reasonable cost that will be reimbursable. So, of course, I didn't do all that work. I had 45 graduate students, 31 postdocs and visiting scholars. I was funded by the National Institute of Drug Abuse for 28 years. Um, my last couple of years, I was named the Robert C. and Charlotte B. Anderson um, uh, Professor of Pharmacology. And uh, that endowment paid a lot of supplies and some student salaries. And then Ryan Gumper and Jonathan Fay, who were working in the Brian Roth lab to develop the cryo-EM structure of mescaline, as well as a whole lot of structures. Brian tells me he's got 50 crystal structures of drugs that he hasn't even published yet. So that's really also revolutionizing our understanding of drug receptor interactions. So with that, um, if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Dr. Nichols. Um, we, I really enjoyed your presentation, all of your work and dedication to the development and continuation of this field is very inspiring. And I'm sure the entire community of individuals who are interested in the research and clinical applications mm -hmm. that these compounds hold uh, that we all have here today, that I'm sure they're all very happy to have you leading us off today. Uh, so I thank you again. Um, we do have a couple questions from the chat. Um, one more general one is how does someone in medical school uh, shoot to really get involved in this kind of research? Well, after you get your medical degree, there are some places, psychiatry departments that are doing this work now. UC San Francisco, uh, Cornell Medical uh, College, um, Johns Hopkins, um, Emory, there's one in Texas now. So the psychiatry departments are starting to realize this is like a brush fire that started off in the distance and now it's coming up closer to them and they're going, oh, we better get on board. I just um, was involved in writing a protocol for the North Carolina state legislature, one of the state legislatures requesting an appropriation to carry out um, an MDMA study and PTSD and a psilocybin study um, in depression and money for an oversight committee. So a lot of these places are catching on to it. Of course, if you're in academics, you're looking for money, right? So, at least I was when I was, you know, so all these psychiatry departments going, hey, let's get into this and see if we can get our staff supported. But I think in the long term, they realize this is a new paradigm. You know, this is not the kind of um, 
pharmacophore drug related stuff. I mean, somebody's anxious, you give them a benzodiazepine. Um, somebody's uh, uh, depressed, you give them a psychostimulant. Oh, this doesn't work like that. This works in a different way. And I didn't have time to talk about um, some of the stuff that's been going on that's really interesting with respect to imaging. But what we know now is normally, and I, if I had known I had 10 minutes, I could have put that slide in. I don't, yeah, I don't think I have it. But um, <clears throat> I always talk faster than I expect I will because I don't want to lose people and then I end up having time left over. But what they know is um, studies have been done with um, magnetoencephalography, for example. If you look at the human brain um, in real time, this thing is, um, you have currents con continually flooding all around the brain. They're not discrete things. It's like there are these waves of depolarization. They're spreading all around through the, way, through the brain. And you have local hubs, like the hippocampus, the amygdala, the visual cortex. You have local hubs where these networks of uh, connectivity are concentrated. And normally, it would be like if you imagine a country with a bunch of little villages, and everybody in the village talks to each other, but they don't send mail across to these other villages, or they don't have a means of communication. That's kind of the way your brain works. It's, you have these areas that are focused on doing a task in a local hub, of a network hub, and when you give a psychedelic, it breaks down the structure in those local hubs, and they all reach out and they start connecting. So there's this one picture that was published years ago where it shows what happens. So you have a normal placebo brain, and all these little hubs are sort of localized, and then you give a psychedelic, and they're crossing, connecting, connecting every which way. So you have a global increase in connect network connectivity. And we, we think that is relate, that's responsible for this expanded consciousness, if you will, of all these things that happen. Things are connected and talking to each other that normally don't talk. Uh, one example, people who take psychedelics say that music becomes much more pleasurable. And if they close their eyes, they see these fractals and colored pictures and things like that. Well, one study has shown that when you take LSD, normally you have visual processing back in the visual cortex. When you take LSD, the networks move out to the side of the brain and expand. So you, you're bringing more brain power to process visual information. So presumably in the cortex where we do our high, you know, our high level um, mentation, that same thing is happening. They're recruiting more neurons. You have more of a computational um, resource. So they think that's what happens, but why it produces the uh, relief of depression the best, the best ideas right now are related to dendritogenesis or spinogenesis. We know that in depressed people, if you look at their hippocampi, um, they have their the dendrites have kind of dried up and withered away. And after you give them an SSRI, they grow back dendrites and spines. And so in animal models, at least in mouse models, if you give a mouse um, psilocybin or LSD, what you see when you look in the brain are the increased spinogenesis and dendritogenesis off of these neurons. Um, so the, they believe that the therapeutic effects may be related to that, but no, no one really knows whether a mouse is translational when it comes to depression. You know, the tests they have like uh, the tail suspension or the head twitch, I mean, we don't know what that really means. But anyway, the studies that have been done, are done have been done in mice so far because mice are cheaper to use. But anyway, other questions? That's definitely, that's definitely really interesting. I think um, one of the biggest things is just figuring out how um, that relates to the effects in humans. And obviously, like you said, it's easier to study mice and much cheaper than to do the same kind of tests on humans. Um, one of the other questions we have, which I think you touched on a little bit, um, what do you feel is still the most important thing, which is still unknown, which we need to research and really understand regarding these compounds in order to ensure this safety and efficacy in clinical and research use going forward? Um, especially since, you know, like you said, like a lot of pharmaceutical companies, they're all jumping onto uh, this bandwagon essentially and are very, for lack of better terms, gung ho about it. Um, how do we? ensure that we're still using them uh, with safety and high efficacy despite this. So I mentioned drug companies are not really jumping on. What you're seeing are small biotech startups, a, not, a large number of those. 
Um, I forget the number, but it's it's huge. They're and they're wasting a lot of money. Um, we'll see attrition. There are some bigger ones that will emerge from that uh, cacophony that are doing things properly. Um, there is a lot of hype around. Every, I mean, you've seen the things they work for. Uh, they worked well for alcohol use disorder, addiction, depression, anxiety. Um, we don't know about eating disorders yet. OCD. So. Um, it's it's a different mechanism. Um, the main danger is actually the classic psychedelics, LSD, DMT, mescaline, psilocybin, are extremely safe in terms of psychoactive drugs. More people die of penicillin uh, allergies than have died of you know psychedelic bad reactions. So the safety is not so much an issue. Uh, well, physiological safety, um, psychological safety is an issue, and one of the things is the the participants in these trials have been screened for, for uh, bipolar schizophrenia, first first degree relatives with schizophrenia, to try to get out anything that could lead to psychological sequelae. Um, these stories back from the '60s about people taking LSD and going crazy and things like that was mostly media hype, but not there's a there's a kernel of truth there, because people that are labile to schizophrenia, you may know. Um, I taught about schizophrenia. It's one of these disease disorders that hits um, late teens, early adolescence. So, you know, Jane goes off to college and she's under a lot of stress. She's got all these classes. She's away from home. And I could well, I use Jane. I could have used Jim, I guess, to make a difference. But then all of a sudden they, they start having a psychotic breakdown. And, you know, the school calls the parents and said, you know, you better come and get your child. We've got him in the student health service, but, you know, things are not going right. So, a lot of times you see the onset of psychiatric illness in that late adolescence, early 20s period of time. So, these are people that are believed to be predisposed to that so that the stress or disorientation or potential panic of a reaction to a psychedelic pushes them over the edge and then they go to a lifelong psychiatric disorder. So, we have to figure out how to make sure that doesn't happen. Or if, if if somebody's having a reaction that looks like it's turning into psychosis, to abort that pretty quickly. Um, so safety-wise, I mean that's a big concern. I've, I've seen an, an essay recently about oh, there's so much hype about this. It's overblown. We've got to we got to tone it down. We got to tone it down, or we're going to end up back where the '60s were. The problem with the '60s is that um, Sandoz was sending LSD to almost anybody who wanted it. You know, back then in 19 in 1960, if you were a medical student at Rowan, you could probably write to Sandoz and say, I want to do a project with my students. Can you send me, you know, 100 doses of LSD? You probably get them. Um, because they were, they were sending it out largely as a model psychosis. In fact, these drugs were called psychotomimetics when I started in research, which meant psychosis mimicking. So um, Sandoz was sending them out. Thinking like nobody's going to want to feel like they're crazy, insane. No one's want to think they're mentally ill, and they did not anticipate the recreational um, issues with it. So um, there were a lot of studies that were done where the drug was just given out willy nilly, or people went to parties and put it in punch bowl and stuff like that, and that really gave everything a bad name. Now the other thing you should know is that the drug war was not started because of drugs, and then maybe you've heard this. John Ehrlichman, who was one of Nixon's aides, did an interview a couple of years ago where he said, we knew these drugs weren't dangerous, but all these people that were using them were protesting the Vietnam War and it really made us mad. So we thought if we made the drugs illegal, we could indirectly arrest them, they'd lose their right to vote. And that would shut this down. That was a basis for the drug war. It wasn't any danger. LSD is probably one of the most safe drugs known as 30 million people have taken it recreationally with you know, no deaths actually. And of course, some psychological problems, but. So, you know, if we go to wider marketing, if these things actually are approved, um, I think there will have to be some kind of controls. They're not going to be something you can just order from a pharmacy. I think they'll be dispensed from a central pharmacy. Um, MDMA probably will be. You'll probably have to have some kind of accreditation or credentials. Um, we have now board certifications and things. I've worked about a year or so ago with people that are trying to work out something to get board certification for psychedelic therapy. So if that's recognized as a as a board certification, that might be another qualification. You would write to the central pharmacy and 
list through number of patients, et cetera. I don't think they're ever going to be over the counter, despite what we saw with cannabis, which a lot of people think, you know, cannabis is a, there's a parallel there. They're not really a parallel. I mean, people do get into trouble with cannabis emotionally, but basically it's, you know, it's not as dangerous as alcohol for the most part. So, but psilocybin and mescaline, you know, I, I, th I think they're not completely safe. Um, they need some kind of oversight. Whether or not you need two therapists, nobody knows. There are now studies trying to look at whether you can do group therapy. Um, my problem with that is if you have a group of people and you have two therapists and say four people and you're just, they're all just kind of with their headphones and their earphones and eye shades on and somebody starts having a bad reaction, they're going to have to deal with that person with the other three. So it's going to be problematic. So I don't know if they're going to be able to do group therapy. At low doses, I know there's one group therapy with um, AIDS survivors who are kind of been stressed out and just they don't really go and have the full experience, but it changes them so they can talk about their experience. It opens them up more. But that's the real issue in moving forward is um, scalability, safety, and we just don't know how to do it. And it's like a new technology. You know, it's when any new technology is discovered, there's a lot of mistakes made in the beginning before you figure out how to use it properly. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of that unfortunately has to be trial and error um, until we can really lock down how to do it correctly and kind of like you said, safely. Um, like you said, a lot of it is, you know, there's this stigma about the lack of safety when, uh, again, like you touched on this, how there, for the majority of these compounds, there isn't necessarily that lack of safety unless there's that predisposal factor. So really pre-screening is going to be a, a large component of that as well. Um, one of our other questions from an EL in the chat was, are patients on 5-HT2A antagonists for depression, such as uh, TCAs, trazodone, uh, tetracyclic antidepressants, uh, such as mirtazapine, as well as SSRIs, which downregulate these kinds of receptors? Are they not candidates for classical psychedelic therapy for depression, or can it still be done with dose adjustments of the psychedelic? I'm only aware of one. The, the the wisdom in the beginning was take them off all their drugs. If they're on an SSRI, wean them off. But of course, if they're depressed and they need it, then you're looking you're looking for a relapse. So that was problematic. But that's what they did. But there's been one study published where people were on um, an SSRI. I don't remember if it was escitalopram or not. But they were on an SSRI and were given um, psilocybin, and it was tolerated well. So. You may not have to withdraw them. Now, I don't know other things like um, bupropion or mirtazapine. You know, those have not been done. Um, anything that would decrease the receptor population, like mirtazapine probably would. Um, things that would decrease the receptor population more than anything would blunt the effect of the, of the psychedelic more than anything else, I think. I don't think you'd have... Um, a drug interaction that would suddenly become toxic or, or fatal. So, with that blunting of the um, effect of the drug, would you say that it would be safe and uh, with higher efficacy to adjust that dose in order to achieve an adequate response? Like, say, um, the receptors are downregulated with those drugs. If you increase the dose of, let's say, psilocybin or LSD, would that sufficiently uh, bridge that gap that you'd see? Um, you've got safety parameters you have to work within. Um, with respect to the alcohol use disorder study at New York University, I think they went up to 40 milligrams on some, F they had some patients or some participants, we won't call them patients, some participants who didn't respond. And there was questions about whether their alcohol, the heavy alcohol addiction was responsible for that. In some cases, he's gone up to 40 milligrams um, and with good success. In general, um, in your phase one clinical trials, you establish safety by giving increasing doses until you get to a dose that's not tolerated. My guess is probably 40 milligrams is going to be the maximum that's going to be allowed in any clinical studies. Everybody won't respond to this. You know, this, this, the graphs I showed you, you still had 20 to 30 percent that didn't respond. You could try, you know, another session later on, but it, it may be there are people that just don't respond. We don't know. Maybe they have a different, their depression relates from some different 
uh, underlying problem. Um, so I don't think you're ever going to, you know, make that happen. Now, somebody, if they come in and they're on an SSRI, um, they may, they may know that it's okay to give them, this, you know, the standard dose of psilocybin or LSD, but not a lot of that's been done. And the big problem is no funding. The NI, National Institute of Mental Health is not funding anything. Uh, NIDA is just funding a study of smoking. Um, and that study was by Matt Johnson. It's you know, Johns Hopkins, and he's enlisting Peter Hendricks, uh, at University of Alabama, Birmingham, and another someone else who's at North in uh, New York University. And um, he got a he got a fundable score. I don't know if you know the way grants work, but you send a grant in, and it goes to what's called a study section. This is a group of about 15 scientists who are presumably your peers who know what you're doing, why you're doing, et cetera. And then three people will review that grant and give it a priority and give it a priority score. And the best score you could get probably is a five or 10 and they go off 20, 30. If your priority score is, you know, 20, 25, you're probably in an area that maybe that's not going to be funded. But if you're under 10, around 10, you almost always would expect to get that funded. So, um, the head of NIDA um, said, we're not going to fund it. He said, I got, he got a score of like 6 percentile. Should have been funded. And he said, why? He said, we just don't want to fund any, any treatment using psychedelics. So, he got the, uh, his state legislature to call NIDA and say, listen, you know, he's got the score. He should be funded. This is important work. So, that got funded. But there's still this holdover. Of people that, if you say hallucinogen, you know, they, it freaks them out. But they really don't know that these are relatively safe because they've been so brainwashed with the media hype. You know, Art Linklater's daughter do, jumped out of a window. Well, she was depressed anyway, but she took LSD and so well, that that was the problem. Then there's the stories of people who looked at the sun under LSD and burned their eyes out. That actually did happen. I've got the report of it. One guy did it. He was taking LSD and laid out in the summer grass and looked at the sun with his eyes open and had visions of, of volcanoes and fire breathing, breathing dragons. Went home, went to bed and woke up at like four in the morning with his eyes feeling like there was sand in his sockets. Went into the emergency room, saw an ophthalmologist and I saw the retinograms published. I mean, his, uh, his retinas were just burned to hell. So it did happen, but those stories are just so far and few in between. And, but if you talk to people, I, I, I was on a plane with a psychiatrist years ago, and I was talking about doing research on psychedelics. And I talked about some of the early clinical studies and he looked at me and said, you mean they actually gave LSD to humans? So they're not teaching anything about that for the most part. Now, some, some of the medical schools are starting. I know you, New York University has got a, a section on psychedelics. I've given talks. I've given two talks to the palliative care group here at UNC. Uh, so, the the message is changing with are you guys gen z you qualify for gen z i don't know they tell me that gen z is going to change things i don't know but i think it is younger younger people um have not been brainwashed by a lot of the propaganda that was in the press and so you know the older people remember you know like my father's generation remember the hippies protesting and burning american flags and all that that just drove my father nuts burning the american flag and all this stuff and they're smoking smoking dope and taking this drugs and stuff so that's still a lot of people are locked into that way of thinking so it's really younger people who are inviting me to give a seminar and stuff like that that are <clears throat> saying okay yeah these things sound like they're really interesting and i think for the future of psychiatry if psychiatry has a future. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, obviously, in the older generation, there is that big stigma just because it was uh, essentially brainwashed into them throughout those years. Um, so uh, we're just about out of time for questions. There is a couple more that were asked. If it's OK, I can send them to you. Um, would you be able to just respond to them and we'll be able to send them out to the attendees? OK. All right, great. Um, thank you again, Dr. Nichols. Your work has been and it's still so vital to the movement we have seen in psychedelics in medicine and even on the preclinical aspect in research. And we honestly can't thank you enough for all that you've done and all that you still do for this. Um, well, I, can, I consider it my obligation 
education. I was an educator for 38 years and I have not stopped that. And this is an area where we really need education to get people thinking about it objectively and in a rational way. So I appreciate, I appreciate the invitation to talk about these substances. They're, they're really amazing. I'll just add in with one anecdote. A woman asked me probably 10 years ago, she said, what do you see as the future of psychedelics? I said, well, probably someday long after I'm dead, um, you'll be having a midlife crisis and your primary care physician will refer you down the street to a psychiatrist slash shaman. He'll give you a psychedelic session and you'll gain a new perspective on your life. And she said, my God, do you think you'll be dead by then? I said, yeah, I don't see this happening anytime soon, but you know, as long as the vector is pointing in the right direction, that'll be okay. Well, the vector is really much bigger and stronger than I ever imagined it could be in, in my lifetime. So. Oh, well, hopefully we'll see that before the end of your lifetime. Um, sooner rather than later, but guys hopefully, see, understand hopefully, you guys, hopefully you guys will see it when you're doing residencies. Yeah, hopefully. Dr. Nichols, I wholeheartedly plan to be that, uh, that, uh, psychiatrist slash shaman who gets referred to down the street. So, um, uh, I hope so too. <laughs> okay. Well, be well and good luck in all your studies. All right. Thank you again, Dr. Nichols. It was truly an honor to have you. My pleasure. Uh, so, next up, we have another leading expert in the field who is Dr. Alan Davis. Um, Dr. Alan Davis is an assistant professor of the social work of social work at the Ohio State University and is an adjunct assistant professor in the psychedelic research unit at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Davis's clinical experience includes working with people diagnosed with trauma based psychological problems, such as addiction. PTSD, depression, as well as anxiety. His clinical expertise includes providing evidence-based treatments such as motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, as well as psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy. Consistent with his clinical interests, his research interests and expertise focus on contributing to the knowledge of and ability to help those suffering with substance use and mental health problems, understanding how to improve clinical outcomes through examining new treatments and developing ways to conceptualize substance use and mental health problems through a strengths based approach. Psychedelic research focuses on clinical trials with psilocybin for people with depression and exploring psychological mechanisms by which psilocybin improves mental health as well as functioning. Upcoming studies include exploring those exploring uh, those with the use of short acting psychedelics in laboratory and naturalistic settings, as well as assessing the application of psychedelics in vulnerable populations, such as people of color who have experienced racial trauma and uh, native Spanish speaking individuals. Dr. Davis is a very important contributor to the current research being conducted on psychedelics in the United States. He is yet another leading professional in this field, and we're very honored to have him here for us as well. Um, but honestly, that's enough for me. So here's Dr. Alan Davis, who will be presenting on the adverse and therapeutic effects associated with 5-MeO DMT experiences. Welcome, Dr. Davis. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here. And it was also nice to catch a little bit of the end of Dr. Nichols talk. Um, that's awesome that he was able to join as well. Um, am I, I'm assuming someone's gonna put my slides up. Okay. Uh, yeah, we can get that set up for you. Okay. Just one second. I'm, okay. I'm happy to do it myself, but I just wasn't sure how you wanted to do it. Uh, whatever you would like to do, honestly, if you want to share them yourself. You're, okay. By all means. Sure. All right, that should be visible to everyone. Can you give me a thumbs up just to make sure? Awesome. Yeah, perfect. And you see it in the presentation mode, not my weird presenter mode. Okay, great. Um, wait, oh no, that's probably not true. Here we go, yeah. that should be it. Yeah, okay. That looks right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I'm gonna keep saying the mantra to myself, I will master technology today. I will master technology today. Um, I, this is, 
it has nothing to do with my presentation, but I have been getting more and more convinced that the number of minutes I spend trying to convince a computer that I am not also a computer is like getting larger and a little bit distressing to me. <laughs> um, I feel like that's probably gonna just keep getting worse. Uh, but anyway, thank you uh, so much for the kind introduction and thank you for having me. Um, I am really excited to represent a couple of uh, teams and, and certainly wouldn't be where I am without a, a large group of people that I am uh, collect or uh, connected with and and uh, collaborating on research with both at the Ohio State University, where we have our Center for Psychedelic Drug Research and Education, which we launched last year. Um, Johns Hopkins, as you mentioned, and the work that we're doing there at the CPCR, and then also uh, Source Research Foundation. So my views today represent work that's happened um, across these different uh, sites, but also uh, don't necessarily represent the views of all of the people that um, are a part of those teams. Um, in particular today, because of my focus on the work that we've been doing for uh, exploring 5-MeO-DMT, I wanted to highlight a few of those people who have been along that journey with me. Uh, Raphael Lancelotta, who is a PhD student in social work here at OSU, uh, Annie Ortiz, who is a PhD student in human ecology, uh, at the University of Wisconsin Madison, Itong Jin, uh, also a PhD student here at OSU, and Nate Cepeda, who is both the director of data analytics at Johns Hopkins, as well as a uh, research uh, program coordinator here at OSU. And in general, the funding that has supported the 5-MEO DMT work in particular has come from a variety of places, including center funding, a couple of nonprofit foundations, as well as uh, private philanthropy. So I want to cover quite a few things today, and uh, so I hope that uh, people will bear with me if if I'm moving a little bit fast. Uh, I want to make sure I leave time at the end for questions. And uh, but my hope today is to accomplish what's on the slide and and to give a little bit of the background of of the work that we've accomplished to date on this topic, as well as some of the future directions that we're uh, looking at exploring in the near future. So just a very brief, uh, and I do mean brief, history of 5-MeO-DMT. Uh, I use that word brief uh, strategically because there's actually quite a few myths and myth makers, myth makers, uh, I'm not going to try to say that three times fast. Um, there's quite a few uh, folks out there who have tried to uh, tried to convince people that there is a long and storied history <laughs> with this molecule. And at the end of the day, there really is no support for that. Um, the evidence really suggests that uh, specifically toad-produced 5-MeO-DMT is a relatively new phenomena, uh, likely within the last 30 years. And uh, non-toad-produced uh, uh, 5-MeO-DMT, which could come in the form of uh, powders and snuffs from plant-based material, likely does have a longer history history, but was used, um, it's unclear exactly how it was used and to what degree that specific molecule in those snuffs was responsible for any psychoactive effects. So, so we really are talking about a new phenomena, uh, both the, the toad derived and, and people using the toad secretions as well as now synthetic 5-MeO-DMT, which of course is very easy to produce and, and, and some people because of uh, concerns about the ecology around uh, the toad populations have uh, switched to using that. So, um, yeah, brief history. Uh, we do know that uh, all of these different varieties of 5-MeO-DMT are used today. We've done a number of studies uh, asking people about the different uh, forms of 5-MeO-DMT they use, the different routes of administration, et cetera. So we know that uh, even though it's more recent, that it is growing quite fast uh, in popularity and in part because of, unfortunately, because of research like um, ours that has uh, talked more about it. Um, but also it has gotten this uh, label as being known, you know, as the God molecule or uh, as, you know, the pinnacle of psychedelic experiences. And I think that's debatable, but uh, for those who believe that, um, that, ha that kind of spills out into the, the, the doctrine around what this substance is and what it can do. I think in, in particular, the reason why people refer to it as this kind of 
pinnacle of psychedelic experiences or the, this God experience is because of how potent and fast acting it is. So uh, although it shares a very similar structure to other psychedelic tryptamines, um, there is some differences. Uh, we know from some early self experiments, uh, things uh, that were uh, conducted by Sasha Shulgin and, and others, that it does create uh, auditory uh, and some visual uh, and, of course, other features of psychedelics like time distortion and emotional memory experiences, physical experiences, you know, similar things that, that other psychedelics occasion, but with some notable differences in particular related to the visual phenomena. So there is, uh, for most people, quite a bit less visual phenomena, um, and uh, and the visuals that are there are um, somewhat different in description than, than for other classic psychedelics. Um, the onset of effects, uh, depending on the route of administration, uh, will happen within seconds or minutes. So when it's smoked or vaporized, it's very quickly, typically within 30 seconds. If it's injected, which uh, is something that has been a more recent interest of ours, in part because of the delay of onset that it allows. Uh, so when it's injected intramuscularly, it can uh, ramp up over the course of three to four minutes instead of seconds, which uh, not to get too far ahead of myself, but uh, will be the, the route of administration that we test in clinical trials, in part because of this uh, wanting to you know, help people to go into an experience without blowing them out of the water. Um, so uh, that's a little bit more uh, of interest or uh, to my team going forward. Uh, the total duration of effects, if it's smoked, you're talking about 20 minutes. If it's injected, it can last up to uh, 40 minutes or so. So we've done a number of studies. We were the first team to conduct an epidemiological survey of 5-MeO-DMT use. And the reason we set out to do this was in part because of the growing popularity. So this was uh, around 2016 or 17 that we started this project. And although it was still relatively unknown, there was uh, there were certainly increasing conversations. There were, there were uh, toad churches popping up. There were these myth makers talking about, you know, trying to create a false uh, lineage of, of indigenous use uh, that uh, was kind of creating this magic around uh, people's understanding of what this was and, and frankly was a pretty effective marketing strategy from these myth makers because more and more books were published, more and more uh, reports online were, were provided and people started seeking it out uh, pretty rapidly. So we decided to conduct a survey trying to best understand all of the the features of these experiences, the, the types of 5-MeO-DMT people were using, the, the methods they were using it with. Uh, we, we wanted to dig in to better understand the acute effects of this uh, molecule and also the enduring effects, things that people were reporting as potentially beneficial or challenging. And so from the qualitative side of things, uh, it was both a quantitative and qualitative study, but on the qualitative side of things, people were reporting some pretty uh, profound uh, things. They were saying that it was like years of therapy in one session, uh, life changing, healing, uh, finding and connecting to the source of unconditional love. You blow through ego loss right into the white light of creation. It provides a deep connection to source and to the truth of our existence and waking up to what is more freedom, perspective, greater connection to all, less judgment, heart opening, body opening, mind opening, greater depth and love, uh, quite a bit of reporting that that isn't necessarily too dissimilar from other classic psychedelics. Um, I think the big difference here is, uh, again, how quickly and rapidly it brings on these effects compared to something like psilocybin, which has, you know, four to six hour time frame and, and a pretty lengthy ramp up to maybe at the at the peak of those effects might be described something like this, whereas, you know, within 20 minutes, people are describing this with 5-MeO-DMT. Um, we dug into wanting to know the motivations behind why people were seeking these experiences out, and probably not surprisingly, uh, the vast majority of folks were reporting that spiritual exploration was the predominant reason why they were seeking this out. Uh, and for some folks, there was the, a recreational or therapeutic reason as well. Um, we also asked them about the intensity and people reported that it was vast, well, the vast majority of people reported it was more intense than other psychedelics. And we had, we had asked them to choose psychedelics that they were familiar with. So some people were rating this compared to LSD, compared to psilocybin. Um, most of them were, were typically comparing it to one of those classic psychedelics and saying that this was on average more intense. 
Uh, however, uh, we also were curious about what types of consequences people might have experienced. And as you can see here, very few people in this study reported any legal, medical, or psychiatric complications. Uh, it's important to point out that this number is not zero. So there are people experiencing these types of consequences. My guess is it's not too dissimilar from these types of consequences related to other classic psychedelics, with the potential exception of the psychiatric complications, which I'll get into more later. And again, classic psychedelics, we know, produce uh, typically a mystical type experience at some intensity level. And it was no different for folks using 5-MeO-DMT, reporting all of the four classic components of a mystical type experience and, and rating them uh, as uh, some of the most powerful experiences um, of their life. Uh, importantly, though, uh, the ineffability um, on the top there was the greatest intensity reported which, as uh, people might know, is is this difficulty of putting things into words. And so the um, that seems to be a little bit different compared to longer acting psychedelics, where there is a sense of that um, ineffability, but often we see those those intensity scores reversed a bit, where ineffability is there, but it might not be the predominant feature of the mystical experience. Here, that seemed to be a little bit more uh, dominant. We also uh, heard from people that they experienced great insight or new awarenesses into their, their lives, and about 60% uh, across all indices uh, could be considered as having a complete mystical experience, which is pretty similar to a high-dose psilocybin session in terms of the rates of people uh, meeting criteria for that CME. So what does this all lead us to? Well, this was one of the first studies that we've started to coin this term uh, quantum change. And uh, and I should be specific that we didn't coin it originally, but we coined it specific to psychedelic experiences. This, this term actually comes from a body of literature by Bill Miller and others down in New Mexico who for a long time were um, working on developing uh, at the time a new treatment for people with substance use disorders called motivational interviewing, which uh, some of you have probably had some training in and motivational interviewing and the kind of idea behind it is that people to people typically, if supported in the right ways and 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 given the right kind of support, will uh, be able to make changes that are consistent with their values. And and if treatment systems work to promote that type of change, then that might be uh, more effective than. Um, uh, penalizing people or, or giving them consequences for not changing. Um, but within that body of literature, they started trying to uncover what happens when people are, are intrinsically or internally motivated to change something about their lives. And you can kind of think about this as the, you know, the classic, although misguided story about uh, people with substance use disorders hitting rock bottom, right? That there was, there was some type of event where there was both um, uh, some type of recognition that, that something had to change in their lives. And, and so Bill wrote extensively about you know, the fact that a lot of them, as he interviewed people, had components that were both mystical, that were spiritual, um, and and also insightful. And and that, that if those both were present in the same moment for someone, that it could lead to, you know, rapid and enduring change efforts in their lives. And we actually know that to be true, because most people who recover from substance use disorders actually don't seek treatment for that. Um, they're kind of doing that on their own. Um, so we started digging in a little bit here, looking at this quantum change model across a variety of different populations. Uh, and first, obviously, because of the history, uh, looking at substance use problems. So in that same survey, we had asked people about different types of problems that they might have. And uh, so within the group of folks who reported that before their 5-MeO-DMT experience, they had experienced other substance misuse or substance use problems, there was 194 of them, so quite a large uh, number. Um, out of the 515 who were who participated, um, on average, um, uh, they were predominantly white and heterosexual. Uh, one of the major limitations of most psychedelic surveys, um, certainly evident here as well. Only about half lived in the U.S., so it was quite a diverse sample in terms of um, uh, other global regions. Uh, but of those 194 people who did report a substance problem before 5-MeO-DMT experience, about 63% of them reported that those substance use problems improved after. 
Um, and what you see here are uh, comparisons of MEQ ratings between uh, the people who said that they did not experience an improvement in substance use and those who said they did experience an improvement and those who did uh, on the top line there. And we see that across all dimensions of that mystical experience, they were reporting statistically and significantly higher ratings of that mystical experience. Uh, another point of evidence, oh, I should point out before moving on that uh, uh, we did not have uh, for this um, sample a, uh, a the insight measure. We actually, because of this study, uh, ended up creating an insight measure that uh, we then have validated and published and, and are using across most of our clinical trials at this point. Um, but at this point, uh, the MEQ was, uh, in addition to this, the challenging experiences questionnaire, was the only validated measure we had to, to look at. Um, in another study, though, uh, another different survey, uh, being a, a curious about people with depression and anxiety, this is actually a survey of, of uh, people that were collected to do that that uh, insight survey development. So we, we got a very large sample of uh, almost a thousand people uh, to uh, talk about any psychedelic experience they had. But we were curious once we were able to develop that insight measure, we were curious to dig into just the people in that larger survey who reported 5-MeO-DMT experiences. So there were only 14, uh, which importantly, I think, gives us a, a sense of, you know, how prevalent actually at the time, this was about 2019, 2018, how prevalent was 5-MeO-DMT use at the time. And, and out of a thousand psychedelic users, only about 14 of them had um, that experience. And so uh, in this analysis, we were able to look at this quantum change model. And what you see here is that uh, acute insight effects and acute mystical effects both were related to a reported decrease in depression and anxiety from before to after that 5-MeO-DMT experience. Um, but interestingly, uh, if you notice the number on this top line up here, uh, the relationship between acute insight and that decrease was far uh, greater than the relationship between mystical experiences. But both were interrelated and in model producing a significant effect. So um, that was really interesting to us because at the time, uh, almost every psychedelic paper that had been published had promoted this idea that the mystical experience was the uh, experience that was contributing to the antidepressant effect or the tobacco reduction effect or whatever the clinical outcome was. Uh, what we're seeing here is that that actually is not the case. Um, and, and we have a lot of data now to support that fact, which I think is probably not too surprising to to people who use psychedelics because uh, we know that the experiences that people have vary dramatically from the mystical and insightful to the challenging to the uh, experiences with entities and and the sensed presence of you know beings and you know traveling through wormholes into other dimensions right there's a, there's a lot of other things going on uh, besides mystical or spiritual experiences so it's it's perhaps not too surprising um, at the end of the day. So uh, we next started to think about some of the limitations of psychedelic research. And obviously I'm not alone in this critique. There's a lot of folks out there who are, who are trying to address the uh, exclusion of uh, people who are uh, non-Hispanic white individuals, uh, people who are gender and sexually expansive, people who are uh, black and brown, people who don't speak English. And so we've conducted a series of studies now uh, exploring the use of psychedelics in the natural ecology among these different groups of people. And so similar to the, to the prior survey I just described, um, I'm also going to present some information from these larger surveys just about those folks who had reported a 5-MeO-DMT experience. So in a larger study of about 300 people, there were 13 that reported that they had used 5-MeO-DMT. Uh, these folks were on average young. Uh, 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 there were six of them who were black. Uh, there were five who reported being Asian and two another race. Uh, most were female and most were actually in Canada. And the uh, the model that we see here is very similar, as you can tell from uh, the previous one, looking at depression and anxiety. But here we were specifically interested in trauma uh, symptoms and specifically racialized trauma and how those symptoms might change after a 5-MeO-DMT experience. So we see the same model emerge in uh, producing a decrease in symptoms, but the weight of those differences is more uh, uh, equal in terms of the mystical and insight. So this, again, provides more uh, information about this quantum change model and how both seem to be related uh, in some ways to uh, decreases in uh, another uh, area of uh, mental health challenges. 
at the same time, there are, you know, a number of folks who have reported uh, potentially adverse effects, uh, both uh, in some of our published studies as well as uh, not in those published studies. I just want to start off uh, this with, with some qualitative reports as well. This was in the large epidemiological survey that we completed. People reported that it was hard to communicate, um, almost instant, instant detachment from the body which uh, for people who are familiar with psychedelic effects, you know, under the effects of LSD or psilocybin, you have quite a bit of time to kind of flirt with that line of, uh, of, of body and, and mind and, and spirit. Uh, you don't have that kind of flexibility with 5-MODMT because of how rapidly uh, the onset is. Uh, people saying that the trip is very intense, too intense for some. It can create anxiety and panic. It was scary, especially if you can't let go extremely jarring, too much information, revelation to know what to do with. So here's someone is reporting that those insights, that information, you know, is is so rapid and so intense that it's hard to, to make sense of it. Um, uh, this is uh, reports of the intensity of challenging experiences across a variety of emotional and physical experiences. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, one of the highest rated uh, challenging effects is this sense of feeling like you're dead or dying, which um, from a, from a, broader psychedelic perspective is is, is not unusual. Um, however, uh, it was one of the more intense uh, challenging experiences that people describe with this molecule in particular. Uh, another feature of uh, potentially adverse effect are what's being uh, called reactivations. Uh, this is a term that seems to make more sense for this population. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more, uh, but it is similar to the, the term that's been used more readily with psychedelics called flashback. Um, the, uh, or essentially a re-experiencing of, of certain elements of that drug experience uh, at some point after those effects have worn off. And what we have seen uh, both in, in surveys and, and anecdotally is that people are reporting, uh, quite a few of people are reporting that they've had a reactivation in this same the average was uh, uh, just over a third, uh, and typically those reactivation experiences are happening with one, within one to two weeks. Um, but curiously, uh, they're predominantly viewed as positive. So uh, the individuals, at least in this survey, almost 80% of them said that, that the experience of having that reactivation was kind of yet another opportunity to revisit some of the positive effects that they had. Um, but importantly, you know, a lot also said it was neutral, and some uh, did report that it was negative. And, you know, despite how, you know, overwhelmingly positive people are reporting that these can be, uh, I know now, having heard from many people who are in this red negative bin, uh, that it, it's potentially life-changing negative uh, experiences. So, um, so I don't want to underestimate or undervalue um, those negative experiences. Um, we decided to dig into this a little bit. Um, I've also realized that I've used the term dig in like five times today, and I don't think I've ever used that term before. So that's a little bit distressing to me. Um, anyway, uh, so we've, we've decided to explore this a little bit more. And um, actually, this was part of Annie Ortiz's uh, master's thesis up at Wisconsin. Uh, she decided to explore this specific phenomena within that larger survey data. So we, we put together some analyses to try to see what predicted having a reactivation event. And the uh, what you see here are there are quite a few variables that seem to be um, predictors of that uh, reactivation. In particular, females and uh, older folks um, were more likely to, pre, uh, to um, report having a reactivation event. Um, but there were also a number of preparation factors, things like setting an intention, meditating, um, obtaining the drug from a trusted source, um, abstaining from other drugs that all uh, also predicted having a reactivation event. And there were also some variables related to their use patterns. So it seemed like people who had used less frequently um, and kind of closer to like one time um, were more likely to report a reactivation event than people who had used more than once, which is kind of curious. Um, and what this, I think, uh, suggests to us is that, um, especially because of how much preparation factors seem to be playing a role in the report of these experiences, uh, one thing that that led us to be curious about is whether or not the expectation or the belief that this is going to happen because most reported 
uh, most people report having it, that it might be something that people, the more you know, the more you are aware of the things you need to do to prepare for this specific psychedelic experience, the more likely it is that like having a reactivation is on your mind. And that that kind of expectancy, which we know, of course, influences not just psychedelic experiences, but also drug use experiences of any kind um, will uh, is potentially at play here, um, we think. So, uh, Better understanding what types of factors might be related to these adverse effects has become an area of interest for some of the folks on our team. Um, obviously, from the clinical trial standpoint, we know that if we, you know, create a safe environment for someone, we have trained professionals who are there to uh, to prepare the individual and to help them with integration and, and certainly with any difficulties that come up. We know that those types of settings can produce positive effects that people largely report. Uh, you know, if they have anxiety or other adverse events. So that, that it's something that is manageable um, with all of those supports in place. So we were curious if this might be true for 5-MeO-DMT experiences, specifically out in the real world. And so we uh, we we went into that that larger epidemiological sample again, and we had two types of folks who were in that study. We had some folks who were reporting that they used 5-MeO-DMT as part of a structured setting. And that structured setting was a, um, a 5-MeO-DMT church that uh, all provided a similar process of preparation. They used the same type, source, and dose of 5-MeO-DMT. And the administration procedures and integration procedures were all kind of standardized for everyone. Um, they uh, kind of, as close as possible, mimicked a lot of the things that we are doing in, in clinical trials in order to provide that safe space. Um, there were about 362 uh, people um, total who uh, both kind of met, uh, were either in that structure group setting or were kind of everyone else. So, you know, a, por a part of this group uh, used in that church. And then we had people who were using, you know, in all different kinds of settings, but settings that were not structured, things where there was very little or no preparation, um, very little, you know, guidance or, or integration support. Uh, and what you see here is the comparison of the mystical experience uh, intensity ratings compared between the group on the top line who re had this experience in that structured group setting and the people on the bottom line who were using without that kind of structure. And so you see here that those experiences were statistically uh, uh, more significant um, and intense uh, compared to those who were not using in that safe setting. Uh, and also interestingly here, although less uh, of a difference, we do see statistical differences across most of the challenging experiences as well. So those on the top line are folks who were using in the unstructured setting who are reporting statistically significantly larger intensity of challenging experiences um, compared to those who re, uh, used 5-MeO-DMT in that structured setting. With the uh, notable exception, which I think is interesting, of the feeling like you're dead or dying, it didn't really seem to matter whether you're using in a structured setting or not. Um, that seemed to be kind of a predominant um, feature um, in it, in, of the challenging experience if people had one, and grief as well was no different uh, in those settings. So naturally, uh, or potentially at least naturally for us, we started to be curious about what aspects of harm reduction or what we're also coining uh, as benefit enhancement, what, what behaviors, what types of things are people doing that might be related to whether or not they are, you know, having less challenging experiences or more mystical experiences. And so we asked people about all of the different ways in which they might uh, prepare for a 5-MeO-DMT experience. And what you see here are a variety of things that, that you know, from, from both um, naturalistic settings as well as clinical trial spaces with psychedelics, a variety of things that we know might potentially be helpful for people to kind of create that safety and, and security. And so things from uh, uh, using with a guide or having some type of ceremonial or shamanic technique, uh, meditating, having a friend to talk to for integration, uh, having music for the session, et cetera. Uh, for most people, the things that they reported doing were uh, preparing a comfortable place for the experience um, that was both safe and had very little distraction, uh, ensuring that they had used uh, or obtained uh, that, that molecule from a trusted source and and also focusing on intention. So some of the core aspects of probably any classic psychedelic uh, ex or preparation experience from for people who are probably going into it with a sense of um, spiritual or therapeutic potential. 
And so what you see here on the top figure is uh, across those different uh, behaviors, we see statistically larger uh, scores on the mystical experience questionnaire for people who reported uh, a, a, quite a few of these different behaviors. So having an intention, uh, having ceremonial aspects, safe space, music, et cetera, having a guide, um, all of the things that, that we might uh, expect uh, here statistically were related to having more intense mystical experiences and uh, 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 a little bit dissimilar, though, we only saw a few differences in the rates of challenging experiences, but one of the strongest uh, features that seemed to be related to less challenging experiences was preparing music for the session, uh, highlighting that uh, between having that music and also having a guide, uh, it seems to be those things were uh, uh, more responsible for having less intense challenging experiences. Outside of that quantitative and qualitative data, we have unfortunately also now had quite a bit of reporting in uh, the community and also in the popular media. Um, some of you might be familiar with uh, the New Yorker magazine, who uh, was kind of, yeah, kind of amazingly, in my opinion, just because it seems like quite a niche topic, but amazingly uh, did an entire full length uh, reporting article on some of these dangers. So if you have a chance, um, I'll try to share the link. It's, it's actually quite a good story. Um, I thought it was really balanced, but uh, uh, these dangers are uh, largely responsible for um, quite a few uh, people being harmed. Uh, and, and the people responsible for these dangers are often those myth makers that I talked about at the beginning who have a, a vested financial and I'll say characterological interest in promoting this type of work. Um, as one example, um, I received an email from someone who uh, was very distressed about their friend. The friend had done a session with uh, one of these, uh, what I'll call irresponsible practitioners, um, basically uh, someone who came into their community and was selling 5 mo DMT experiences. Uh, basically, kind of, kind of in my mind, I imagine it a little bit like you know the old snake oil salesman uh, kind of coming through town, and without giving any preparation or integration, uh, basically just dosed people and left. And this person's friend was in a state of mania and paranoia and panic ever since the session, which at the time was about two weeks um, uh, had passed. Unfortunately, they had attempted suicide in those two weeks and were now hospitalized. Um, the medical doctors uh, who were working with them, which is why this person was reaching out to me, now wanted to pres pr prescribe antipsychotics indefinitely. Uh, basically, they were um, neglecting the importance of the psychedelic onset of the experiences that this person were having, uh, which is unfortunately not uncommon in our current medical system. Um, if you report symptoms that, that are psychotic or on a psychotic spectrum, uh, as some of you might know, there's a pretty rapid and quick referral process into systems that manage those uh, serious mental illnesses. And, and unfortunately, uh, that is potentially, in my opinion, not actually the best approach for someone who has had a psychedelic experience, because we know that with the right integration, um, those unusual experiences might, um, if they're able to be integrated, might uh, lead to uh, fewer, if any, actual psychotic symptoms, and, and certainly potentially for some at least, uh, will kind of reside below the threshold that meets criteria for diagnosis. So, so the rapid diagnostic procedures that happen in the inpatient setting um, are not taking this into consideration, in my opinion, at least not, not at most places that I know of. Um, there was another person who uh, actually called me. Um, and again, these emails and calls come because we've published in this topic, so people can readily find my email and phone number. So people will, this person called, um, they were concerned about their own health, uh, kind of similar story, a facilitator had come through, um, dosed everyone in their, in their community. This person had had similarly reported no preparation, no integration. And interestingly, this person had also reported this was their uh, first psychedelic experience, which I, think is just grossly irresponsible for these uh, salesmen who are coming through towns to, again, to not take that into consideration before they actually even consider providing this to somebody. Um, they had anxiety almost immediately after it was persisting for weeks. They felt traumatized by the experience. Um, they went to the emergency department, of course, because that's what our system tells you to do. Um, they were immediately prescribed benzos. Well, they, they were immediately given a benzo in the ED, and then they were prescribed those, and now they've been using them daily for months and feeling like they're um, becoming more and more dependent on having to have those benzos in order to um, function. And so, again, another example of, you know, 
a medical system who is viewing these experiences through the lens of drug policy and from my experience a lack of education into what psychedelics are how they're used the types of effects that might come from them and most importantly how do we actually help people integrate these experiences to reduce things like anxiety and and the other challenges that people might be having so um and and of course you know there are actually several reports now of uh scaled <laughs> concerns at, at much larger uh, intensity of dangers, including sexual misconduct, physical abuse. There's been several reports of neglecting participants, uh, which has led in some cases to death. So, um, you know, these these myth makers are, are not only um, producing false narratives about this molecule, where it comes from, how it's used, but also are, are in some cases, some of those people are creating a wave of, of trauma uh, through psychedelic communities. So um, this, is, this is certainly um, a big concern of mine and, and others doing this research uh, in order to, to try to communicate with folks what's, what's going on. Um, so where does this all take us? Well, um, you know, I hate to end on a sad note, so I'll try to make it a little bit more positive here at the very end. Um, I do think that that there are there's strong evidence now, in my opinion, for or I should say strong preliminary evidence now for the the potential for healing with 5 MO DMT. Uh, however, there's also a, a strong potential for harm. And I think that it's important as we move forward with the clinical laboratory studies, which we are in the process of uh, planning and, and hopefully going to be starting soon, that the uh, that we that we recognize the importance of things like the set and setting and the therapeutic relationship and the, the ways in which we're helping people go into these experiences, given how short they are and how uh, potentially traumatic they can be. Um, I think that, you know, for, for the vast majority of people they appear to have you know profound uh, impact as as other classic psychedelics do on things like depression and anxiety and substance misuse and and PTSD and, and racialized trauma you know all all potentially really important areas and with an unmet need of, of the current treatments uh, more importantly actually in my opinion is the fact that you know as excited as I am for you know the the potential uh, FDA approval of psilocybin therapy for depression and MDMA therapy for PTSD um, likely coming in the next 18 months, uh, that treatment is going to be decades in the process of dissemination. There will be, most people will not have any access at all. Uh, for those that do have access, they will likely be people who have uh, quite a bit of privilege and means in our society. And so uh, we have very little information right now about whether or not insurance will cover that, uh, and if they do, to what extent, uh, whether they'll require people to go through all of the other treatments that, that might not potentially be working for them before they can even get this as an option. Um, and questions around, obviously, another big concern is how are we going to train people to do psychedelic therapy? Um, obviously, there are some uh, folks uh, like me and, and others and different organizations trying to do some of that training and create some of some models for that training. Um, there will almost certainly be um, uh, a advanced credentialing process that will be in place by the time these are approved that will regulate people's access to be able to provide this. So whether you're a psychiatrist or psychologist or social worker or counselor, all of those people will have to have this advanced credential. And so what, what goes into that training and who qualifies for it and who has access to it and how expensive that training will be are all factors that I think will will make it quite a bit of time before uh, psychedelic therapy is is widespread. Um, but in advance of that and kind of thinking about what comes next, how can we be thinking far enough ahead to uh, what can diminish some of those barriers, at least on the financial side um, and the accessibility side is shorter acting psychedelics. And so 5-MeO-DMT provides a potential second wave medicine to uh, drastically reduce the uh, the infrastructure needs for a psychedelic therapy session, you know, reducing potentially uh, from a six to eight hour session with psilocybin to a, you know, one to two hour session. Uh, you can all of a sudden start seeing how that could scale a little bit more readily into our current mental health system uh, by allowing providers to be able to see multiple patients in a day um, as opposed to just one. So I think that um, that's largely driving uh, my interest in in this molecule. Um, and uh, so currently we have, uh, we're waiting on hearing back about a grant that we submitted uh, to test, uh, compare 5-MeO-DMT to psilocybin directly in a clinical trial among uh, uh, cancer patients here at OSU. So we're going to 
specifically people with lung cancer, uh, going to look at um, whether or not, uh, because we know psilocybin from the other cancer studies has been effective at helping reduce existential distress and depression and anxiety, we're going to compare that to 5-MeO-DMT to see, you know, does it similarly create this antidepressant effect? And if it does, that would be, you know, one, you know, important population where not only is the um, the current system around cancer care uh, lacks uh, the ability to integrate treatments because they're already undergoing so many other treatments at the time. So it's difficult to create, you know, evidence-based mental health programming within those settings, um, let alone psychedelics, which are going to create a whole different infrastructure need. But, but it might be a little bit easier to do with uh, short-acting. Uh, substance. So um, that's the primary area that we're uh, first going to explore with 5 dmt um, but we're also very interested in uh, comparing this uh, psilocybin and 5 dmt also in special populations like uh, people with uh, racial trauma, people of the global majority, uh, and, and importantly, non-English speaking people. Um, we've actually uh, should hopefully have published soon a report where we've now translated all of the acute effects measures from English into Spanish, in part because, you know, one of the barriers, other than having a bilingual staff, which of course we need, but the big other barrier in a clinical trial setting is if you don't have measurement tools that measure these effects and measure outcomes in these other languages, then it doesn't matter whether you have bilingual staff or not. And so we've now done all of that work and are in the process of publishing it. So at least to reduce one barrier for one population of non-English speakers. Um, I know there are others who are currently working on some translation efforts into German and French and, and other things. So um, hopefully more of that will be coming as well. Uh, I just wanted to highlight again that uh, this is just a part of the team. These are folks, uh, um, I really wanted to point out Roland Griffiths, who uh, is a mentor of mine and, and who I worked for at Johns Hopkins when I was there full time as a postdoc fellow. Uh, Monica Williams, who is an associate professor up at the University of Ottawa. Uh, her and I have been collaborating on the racial trauma studies and, and she's been a major influence there. Um, Raphael uh, and Yitong, who are in the middle there, are both my graduate students here at OSU. Uh, very interested in the the BIPOC uh, work and the Spanish speaking work, um, and uh, Annie Ortiz, uh, who is in the blue uh, cardigan, uh, who's been leading a lot of the reactivation work. So lots of folks involved in this uh, who are not pictured as well, and not to mention all of the folks who participated in our surveys and and hopefully uh, in the future will participate in our clinical trials. So um, with that, I will turn it over for some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Davis. Um, I know personally, despite my own research, both 5-MeO-DMT as well as NMDMT have been for a long time now compounds that I have really had a hard time grasping the full capacity of. But I do personally believe that uh, these may have valuable potentials for use in medicine. So I think I speak for everybody when I say that we really appreciate the insight you've been able to give us on the costs, benefits, and what you've personally seen within uh, research of this therapeutic use. Uh, I think you. what you had to say was very valuable. Thank you. Um, so we do have a few questions. Um, first, do you think that potential clinical applications of substances which are less widely known to the general public, such as 5-MeO-DMT, will be able to have an advantage over compounds such as LSD and psilocybin, which have accumulated that stigma and bad reputation over the years? Yes, I do. I think that, you know, it's not surprising. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard this story, so I apologize if it's repetitive. Um, Roland usually tells this story at, at events if you've heard him speak, but um, I asked him one time because I was curious, you know, why did you choose psilocybin? Like, why was, you know, 20 years ago when you were going to get this started again and, and bring this back into, you know, approved spaces, what, you know, what, what made you choose psilocybin? And, and the reason for the reason he gave me was kind of surprising, but then made total sense was that, you know, he said, well, we knew that nobody would know what it was. <laughs> uh, people were familiar with psychedelic mushrooms. People were more familiar with the term mushroom or the term uh, uh, psychedelics or LSD or other, even, you know, things like MDMA, uh, but they were not familiar with the chemical name psilocybin. And so to get that, to get those first studies approved um, without raising the alarm bells of folks in the media, without uh, raising, you know, too many alarm bells at places like the FDA and, and having to deal with some of that stigma and blowback, especially compared to LSD, 
um, that that's why they chose synthetic psilocybin to to launch those studies, and and not because they thought that it was necessarily better than the other psychedelics, but in part because of this strategic reason of managing the political environment, um, uh, especially that was in the early 2000s. I mean, it was obviously even you know, more politically challenging uh, in terms of drug stigma and how much uh, stigma could play into people's minds who are going to be responsible for approving them to move forward with it. Um, it's also one of the reasons why, as you probably know, Rick Doblin talks very openly about the choice to focus on PTSD and in part first responders and veterans and people who've survived sexual violence. Like the, you know, people have a hard time saying no when you're when you're focused on populations that are in, in really important need. And so, um, so not perhaps surprisingly, you know, 5-MeO-DMT, I think, will be an advantage in that way because it is less familiar, especially to people who are outside of psychedelic spaces. And so, um, although that is changing some, especially with, you know, Michael Pollan's book, he talked about a 5-MeO-DMT experience, um, actually talked about it kind of negatively from my memory serves, um, and, and also some of this reporting that's gone on about these myth makers and other folks who... Um, uh, who are potentially challenging uh, actors in the space, um, some of that reporting has reached national media. So I think that, you know, there is going to be some concern. Uh, but so far, FDA has been willing and, and other folks have been willing to uh, to let some of this work proceed. So I do think that will be an advantage. But the bigger advantage, I think, really is the, the short duration of action and, and kind of thinking about how how that that advantage is uh, difficult to argue, uh, especially for folks, you know, who who are working at high levels of this, including on the federal task force that's been created uh, by the Biden administration to oversee the dissemination of psychedelic therapy. You know, folks on that team recognize all of the hurdles that I that I discussed about, you know, what it's actually going to take to make sure people have access to this treatment. And so, you know, people are, I think, very easily convinced that this short acting, if it's safe, if we can do it safely, and if we can, if it produces these um, effects, which my hypothesis is that it will, um, then uh, that's a clear advantage. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I mean, like you said, with the short duration of action, it's much easier to study. I mean, with psilocybin, you're talking six plus hours at least. And, mm -hmm. you know, to really uh, focus on the patient or participant at that point, it's it becomes a challenging task. So, I mean, with the much shorter duration of action, that makes perfect sense. Um, unfortunately, I wonder if um, with kind of that way around, you know, the stigma surrounding things, I wonder if that limits the availability of um, studies that we can really do on other populations, which, you know, um, the um, uh, like politically, they're not so much more inclined to be like, all right, yeah, it's much easier to say no. Yeah. About. Yeah, I mean, it's probably not the time to try to convince funders or political people that like we should focus on you know, old white men. I, I think if we <laughs> we're, pr we're proposing that study, it's probably like less enticing <laughs> for uh, for a number of reasons. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, there is an importance of exploring this outside of medical communities and people who have a medical need. And I do think that with a lot of the efforts underway across the country, and even at the federal level, I think some people would be surprised to know that that the DEA and, and many members of Congress uh, who on both sides of the aisle are in active discussion about policy changes around psychedelics. And I think that, you know, that that has re far reaching implications for people that we would call healthy volunteers, right? That who otherwise are in absence of psychological problems, but at the same time could benefit from having a spiritual experience or further developing their own relationship capacity, you know, with their partner or a variety of other things that could be really positive. So I do hope as we, you know, from a clinical lens seem to be narrowing in on specific populations and especially those with high need that we don't forget that there's this um, also a really important lens of inquiry into healthy populations. Um, and that I think, you know, really is going to take an interdisciplinary lens of, of research that that is currently underway in a variety of places, looking at psychedelics from an anthropological lens, from a historical lens, from, um, from uh, we have, uh, as part of my nonprofit source research, we provide grants to students who are studying psychedelics, and we have applications from departments of music and departments of theater and, you know, all the different things that we, I think we take for granted in education, um, but that situate and facilitate an understanding of 
practices and culture and community around topics like you know the importance of music and and the integration of music in general right so so to have all of that also for psychedelics um, and integrating psychedelics into those narratives and into those those disciplines i think will be a critical feature that's going to be needed for helping to disseminate because if you have people that 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 are experiencing psychedelics whether again healthy folks or folks in a in a treatment setting the extent to which the the enduring effects can manifest are directly related in my opinion although we don't have evidence for this yet but are in my opinion directly related to the environment that they're coming from and that shouldn't be too surprising because we know that the experience of mental illness is also related to genetics and environment right so if we're changing potentially someone's internal experience potentially at the molecular level in the brain or other parts of the body but we're putting them back in environments where there isn't a, a network, there isn't um, an understanding, there isn't a vocabulary or a shared cosmology around what these experiences are, then I think I think that's one of the reasons why we're not seeing that it's you know universally effective for everyone. You know, our depression trial was amazing. We found that 54% of people were in complete remission and and uh, actually 58% up to a year later were in remission with only two doses of psilocybin and about 13 hours of therapy, which is incredible. But what I think gets missed in that reporting is almost half of them were not in remission. And and why is that? Why were those people not having the benefit that these other people were? And I think the environment and the cultural community factors are going to be critical aspects of whether or not the treatment's effective for someone. Oh, like, for example, sense. like one thing that Monica Williams likes to say is like, yeah, we can help someone with their racial trauma in a clinical setting, but we're putting them back into a system of oppression that is going to recreate these traumas repeatedly after they have this experience. So if we're not trying to dismantle and ch systemically change these systems of oppression that are creating these mental health problems, then we're only going to get so far with psychedelics. No, that makes perfect sense. There's more than just that treatment that goes into you know, really addressing these patients' issues. Yeah. Um, so another one of the questions we got in the chat was from uh, Praveen Rajaguru. It was, outside of just giving people antipsychotics, is there any knowledge on how therapy and helping a user enhance their ability to modulate their thoughts and feelings or beliefs can help to navigate post-usage effects? Yeah. I'm assuming that's particularly in folks who might be having psychotic spectrum experiences or kind of reporting that kind of uh, stuff after a psychedelic. The research is very minimal on this topic. As people probably know, folks who um, have any kind of psychotic symptom are almost universally excluded from psychedelic research. There is work now to focus studies within the population. Um, in particular, there are people who are interested in uh, seeing whether kind of similar to a cancer therapy, you know, design, you know, which again, psychedelics aren't meant to treat the cancer. They're treating kind of the things that come around as a result of that diagnosis. Some people are thinking about applying it in the same way to people with psychotic spectrum disorders um, in order to treat some of the feelings of disconnection, depression, anxiety that are kind of surrounding that diagnosis to see if it can be done safely. I know that wasn't really the question, but just helps my mind to think about that context of like folks have been excluded so we have very little data on on what happens with psychotic symptoms um, when, when people experience psychedelics. Um, but I can tell you anecdotally from uh, work that I do with uh, training clinicians who um, are working with folks with for integration and to help them integrate psychedelic experiences, um, including one that I am very familiar with because uh, I was brought in as a consultant here at OSU for um, by a parent whose uh, child had developed psychotic symptoms after an LSD experience and was basically kind of thrust into the ED, thrust into inpatient care, was kind of being prescribed antipsychotics. And the parent was like, does this actually make sense? Like they were completely fine, you know, before this experience. And and yes, they're struggling, but like, is this the only option? And so they found me because I was at OSU. And um, and so after some conversation and and uh, discussion, the the parent decided to pull their child out of treatment at OSU, and work with a um, therapist here in in Columbus who specializes in psychedelic integration. And um, what I can tell you is that the the it hasn't resolved completely for this person. This was about six months ago, but with about two to three therapy sessions a week with this integration specialist and working over that six months on this topic, their symptoms are in the manageable level. So 
they they still i think one to two times a week will experience some paranoia they have kind of slight delusional thinking that emerges but because of the strategies and tactics that they're learning in that outpatient setting they're able to manage it without medication and i think you know i i fully believe that there are some people where psychedelics will create um will be the onset for a full-blown psychotic disorder and they will need antipsychotics and 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 long-term managed treatment but what we know from just prevalence data of psychotic symptoms is that that's already the smallest proportion of people who have these challenges right like the vast majority of people who have any psychotic symptom are managing it on their own they're managing it with you know cognitive behavioral therapy with the right family support with the right environmental support they might it might even be so mild that they don't even know that it's necessarily problematic and i think the same will be true for those who have have the onset of these kinds of symptoms after a psychedelic, but we need to know more about how to identify who is in this like really risky group who needs the managed care and who doesn't, knowing that the far majority of them probably won't need antipsychotics in that, in that medical managed treatment. Unfortunately, my experience with providers in those settings is it's the, you know, the, the heuristic is so clear. You, you just send them immediately to folks who are specialized in that, in that setting, and they don't have any education or knowledge about psychedelics. I mean, they, it's, it's, it's completely discounted in their mind as something that matters. And I think, uh, and they're not trained in it, even if they, even if they did think it matters, they're not trained in how to deal with it. So I don't know, I apologize for a little bit of soapboxing, but it's, it's just, it's important for me to remember, to remember that, you know, there's a lot of people out there being harmed unintentionally by our medical system because people just don't know. They're still living in that, oh, these are illegal. They're stigmatized. I've heard about flashbacks, right? They're still living in this model of how they were trained. And unfortunately, they just weren't trained with empirical evidence on that topic. No, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, kind of going back to what you said earlier, like it's complex and really limited on what we can really assess. I mean, whether that's, you know, based on budget or just based on practicality of assessing these certain things. Mm -hmm. So that, that does make perfect sense. Um, we do have time for one more question. Um, so somebody asked, how can we responsibly approach psychedelic trials for individuals with, say, unstable mental illnesses that have features of mania or psychosis? Or is this even theoretically ethical or safe to study? Uh, I do think it's ethical. In fact, I, I actually think we have an ethical imperative to um, to explore treatments for vulnerable populations, whatever vulnerability that is, including people who are in the midst of difficult psychological experiences. Um, and I think it's actually an ethical violation to exclude people, uh, especially if we don't know empirically yet whether or not it actually is problematic. So we have to, I think, do those studies, and I think that it is ethically necessary to do that. There are some folks who are doing this. So I know that at UCSF, uh, the team there, uh, led by Josh Woolley, they have, uh, I don't know if it's been launched yet, but they're going to conduct a study of psilocybin therapy among people with bipolar 2 disorder. So again, less difficulty in terms of the mania and the manic episode, um, but this is kind of like an entree to potentially going that direction, depending on if it's determined safe and, and effective in that population of uh, the bipolar two folks. Um, and again, there are people who are very interested in things like uh, borderline personality disorder, which of course can include some, I don't like to call it mania, but mania-like symptoms of like impulsivity and, and paranoia, digital thinking. So, um, so they're specifically interested in that as well. And my guess is, is that, you know, there's going to be people coming into those studies who are on a variety of places with with their symptoms and and I hope that you know because of that um, heterogeneity of folks coming in that hopefully that will um, give us some information about this topic so, and, and hopefully people continue to find this a, a valuable area of inquiry and we get more funding for it no that's actually great to hear that we are starting to get that little sneak peek with you know step taking small steps with assessing bipolar disorder type 2 which only has like that subset the hypomania and hopefully, you know, it'll be safe in that population and we can progress further beyond that. Yeah. So that's definitely great to hear and reassuring. And um, it's it's also the case that like people with these conditions are already doing this. So like part of the question is like whether it's medically managed or not, people are using these substances and we're not seeing the vast majority of them, you know, being reported as like having major complications, which is another reason why I think that it's important for us to study it and know like how to do it safely. No, definitely. I mean, taking it from, you know, recreational use to clinical use, I think that's definitely a very important thing to really understand. Mm -hmm. um, so, unfortunately, we are just about out of time for questions. Um, 
same thing we did with Nichols. Would it be okay if we sent you the few remaining questions we have and we sure. can send that out to our attendees? All right, thank you yep. so much. Thanks um, again for wanted, having me. Yeah. Of course, I really wanted to thank you again, Dr. Davis. I want to reiterate that your your work has been truly incredible and will be uh, continued to have great value within medicine for many years to come. Thank you so much. Best of luck to everyone. And uh, for all of you who are currently a student uh, or going into residency, uh, Source Research Foundation, we provide students, we provide grants to residents, to postdoc fellows, anybody who wants to study psychedelics. So you can check out um, those grant applications if you're interested. All right. Awesome. Very, very great to hear. Thank you so yeah. much. Yep. All right. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Thank too, you, Dr. Dr. Davis. Cheers. Bye. All right, so to all those tuning in from both near and far, thank you for attending our first two professional speakers. Uh, please fill out the attendance form if you have not already. Uh, we'll be taking a short break before our first student presentation, which will start at 1230 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so be sure to go take your bathroom break, grab some snacks and a drink, and tune back in for our students who have some great topics to discuss this year. Back everyone. I hope you enjoyed our mode of presentations by Dr. Nichols and Dr. Davis. This next block is for our student presentations. Just like this morning, please feel free to type any questions in the chat for our students to answer. First up, we have our very own Aisha Garani. If you did not catch her biography at the start of the conference, Aisha is a medical student at Rowan Virtua SOM who is passionate about integrating indigenous and Western medicine practices for holistic healing. She has a background in genetics art and psychology and is a certified reiki practitioner practitioner and yoga enthusiast aisha is the current president um, for students for integrative medicine and is involved in traditional ceremonial use of plant medicines in her free time she enjoys creating art learning about herbalism and hiking she hopes to find a specialty that allows her to combine her non-material hands-on practices for true wellness she will be presenting on psychedelics soul beliefs and near-death experiences. Um, we'll be posting a poem that um, our uh, board wrote for her in the chat if you guys wanna look at that as well. All yours, Aisha. Yes, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, let me pull up my slides. Aisha, you are a little on the quiet side. Okay, I'll hold this super close to my face. Perfect. Can you guys see that? All good? Looks perfect. Okay, so let's jump right in. So I'm gonna start us off today with a brief history on the origins and evolution of religion and soul beliefs, because as osteopaths, our medical philosophy is that an individual's health encompasses the facets of mind, body, and spirit. Soul beliefs is a topic I'd love to spend hours diving into. Um, and that's influenced a lot of policy making in healthcare, such as abortion laws, for instance, but unfortunately our time today is limited. So relevant to medicine, it's worthwhile to discuss the adaptive advantages to believing that souls exist. During my undergraduate studies at Rutgers University, I took a course on soul beliefs, which explored the concepts of death anxiety, how we sought explanations for the purpose of being alive to alleviate this death anxiety, and how religion served as a tool for bridging this gap in our understanding and shaped the way that civilization functions today. Medicine came to be as a feature of the society already dominated by the idea of keeping a living soul alive. Soul beliefs gave humans a purpose, a motivation to contribute, a motivation to grow and exist and act upon the drive to meet basic needs. Our hunter and gatherer ancestors existed within tribal societies. Religion within tribal societies was an explanation for the natural world and was heavily dependent on the ideology of egalitarianism or the notion that all individuals are equal and must contribute equally to sustaining the community. There were no leaders and ritual was at the center of community bonding and religious practice, likely indicating that motivation for contributing mean meaningfully to society was driven by a need to satisfy spirits and gods. And this was the primary, the primary mechanism for preserving social order. Direct contact with spirits and gods during these rituals was also often facilitated by hallucinogenic plants. And these worship spirits included ancestors, implying that there was a persistence of souls of the deceased. Um, civilization then progressed to an agricultural structure with communities being composed of farmers, herders, and governing bodies. In this new social order, the ability to communicate with the gods was reserved for the elite and only accessible to members of the priesthood. So ordinary citizens therefore relied on the church for religious guidance instead of connecting with gods themselves. 
and were instructed to make monetary donations or atone for their sins in order to achieve ultimate salvation for the soul. And then as we transitioned into industrial and post-industrial societies that placed a larger emphasis on individualism, religions across numerous diverse cultures transitioned from polytheism to monotheism. So this idea of an all-knowing, all-powerful being further fortified the concept of a final judgment or a plan for the soul because it placed the ultimate decision-making power into one pair of hands. And as a generalization, the pervading idea through all of these eras is that of an afterlife or immortality of the soul. Um, soul beliefs, however, have not remained static, but rather they've evolved to the adaptive needs of humanity and have enabled people to navigate an at times inexplicable ex existence. And they continue to evolve to this day. And as Jesse talked about, we have multiple waves of psychedelics, so it makes sense that soul beliefs also continue to evolve alongside that. And I know that the concept of an afterlife isn't necessarily true to all religions, and this linear trend is a massive oversimplification, but for the purpose of our discussion today, we're narrowing the scope. So now moving on to near-death experiences. Um, what is the role of near-death experiences and how did they serve us? That's a topic that's frequently discussed in palliative care, and at last year's conference, Dr. Nathan Riley, who spoke for us, posed the question to us, what's so scary about dying? And the lens he explored with this was, what happens to my consciousness, or where does my spirit go after death? And that is a factor in death anxiety. But let's backtrack for a second, because I've mentioned death anxiety a few times, but we haven't really talked about what it is. So in the study of soul beliefs, death anxiety is a driving force for the development of religion and spirituality. Death anxiety also comprises the meaning of life. If I'm going to die, then what is the point to all of this? What is my purpose for being alive? And why does it matter that I'm here? We can become resolute that we're simply awaiting an end, or we can ascribe a purpose to our experience that enables us to perceive it as meaningful. Religion alleviates that anxiety and that it instills a belief that we're being judged by a higher power and that our immortal soul has somewhere to go once it leaves the physical body. Essentially, a religion affords eternal survival of the soul even when the physical body is no longer alive and provides us with motivation to carry out a fulfilling life. So near-death experiences can occur under circumstances that are life-threatening, such as drowning, cardiac arrest, or traumatic events where you are quite literally near death, but they've also been reported during events such as meditation, which is interesting. They're described as containing elements that fall into four primary categories, and these are cognitive features, affective features, paranormal features, and transcendental transcendental features. These could consist of time distortion, seeing a bright light, out-of-body experiences, encounters with deceased loved ones or supernatural beings, or feelings of love and unity, for instance. And scientists have theorized that this could be a result of random firing of neurons when vital signs are subsiding or a memory produced by the brain filling in the gaps. And what's made near-death experiences so perplexing is that so many individuals report having similar experiences despite their different circumstances. And while in part they are framed by universal themes within cultures, there's also consistency across cultures, religions, and worldviews. Given the current models that we have of the brain and cognition, near-death experiences are considered an anomaly. And what makes them even more peculiar is that they've occurred not only in the face of true impending death, but also in perceived impending death or situations like meditation, where they can't be um, explained by reduced blood flow to the brain or the influence of a psychoactive substance. So we haven't yet been able to pinpoint a purely psychological or physiological cause. And in the study of soul beliefs, near-death ex near experiences have been considered as anecdotal evidence of religion and an afterlife through proof of consciousness beyond the physical body. The sense of a spiritual awakening has provoked life-altering change for survivors with many reporting long-term appreciation for life, greater religious orientation, reduced fear of death, increased feelings of love and peacefulness, and even psychic abilities. So is this disruption in consciousness something that we should pathologize or optimize? And listed on the slide are just two examples of near-death experiences in which subjects had those mystical experiences, out-of-body experiences, or encounters with spirits or deceased loved ones. So in our psychology classes and teachings on palliative care, we've discussed the stages of grief and dying and the manner in which one reflects upon the life that they've lived or copes with what is to come. So it makes sense why near-death experiences are a relevant subject matter in palliative care. Addressing death anxiety can, of course, help patients who are at the end of their lives, but what about people who survive near-death experiences and continue living their lives for an indefinite amount of time? How does that change them? With ample research on the long and short-term effects of near-death experiences, we see that there's evidence of improved quality of life, even for patients who are not in palliative care. So this then begs the question, can modern medicine benefit from subjecting, patient, from subjecting patients to controlled near-death experiences? 
And of course, it isn't actually ideal to put someone's life at risk to reap these benefits, but that's where psychedelic assisted therapy could potentially come into play. So now bringing psychedelics into the picture. One study surveyed 3,000 adults to compare psychedelic experiences with non-drug related near-death experiences and found that both subsequently reduced the fear of death and dying. The psychedelic experiences included in the survey were LSD, psilocybin, ayahuasca, and DMT. This merged the results of clinical trials with psilocybin and terminal cancer patients who report reduced rates of depression and anxiety as well as greater acceptance of their diagnoses. This is clinically, clinically relevant in um, palliative care and end of life care, of course, as decreasing fear of death can decrease patient suffering related to this. However, it's additionally worth considering that reduction of death anxiety is also a primary driving force for the development of religion, as we discussed before, which is not only observed in patients who are nearing death. People are religious in any age group and any circumstance. Um, and psychedelic therapy, therefore, may also serve to benefit quality of life in other patient populations. Another placebo-controlled study standardized the subjective effects of DMT and near-death experiences, and I think Dr. Davis might have actually talked about this study just before. Um, so particip participants were separated into two groups and administered either DMT or a saline placebo, and then they were asked to fill out the near-death experience scale. Additionally, this inventory was independently completed by survivors of near-death experiences, and the results were compared to those of participants. They found that, one, there was a significant, significant difference in reported experiences between the experimental and control groups, with DMT subjects reporting more NDE phenomena than placebo subjects, and two, that there was specifically overlap in terms of mystical and ego dissolution experiences between DMT subjects and NDE survivors, as compared to other phenomena. The study additionally cited vast consistency in the literature of a positive relationship between mystical experiences in particular and the predicted value of long-term therapeutic benefit. And encompassed within these mystical experiences is the sense of unity that psychedelics often bring on and that scientists argue is inevitably coupled with ego dissolution. And these two features serve as a bridge between both of these altered states of consciousness and can further su suggest the therapeutic benefits. So talking about ego death specifically, to further emphasize this perceptual overlap, we can take a look at the ego dissolution inventory. Subjects of near-death experiences and psychedelic experiences undergoing ego deaths have both reported feelings such as feeling at one with the universe, feeling a sense of union with others, and a loss of personal identity. So we can see that there are clearly similarities and parallels connecting ego death and a mystical unit of experience, which is the element that carries the greatest therapeutic power. Some studies have attempted to use psychedelics to anatomically locate the ego within the brain or the sense of self, aptly titled Finding the Self by Losing the Self. And since a reduction in inner hemispheric communication is detected in psilocybin use, it's theorized that dissolution of the network within the brain could produce ego dissolution, and that stabilization of the ego is dependent on normal functioning of neural correlates. This could also open the door to interesting research opportunities in conditions such as psychosis, but that's a story for another day. And coming back to our discussion of religiosity, the ego is a mechanism for the soul to relate to the physical world. So can ego death or death of an identity simulate death and alleviate death anxiety? It's possible that we can suggest that death of the ego is a return to the soul. And it's easy to consider the physiological implications of psychedelics in the context of Western medicine and the ceremonial use of psychedelics in the realm of indigenous medicine in isolation from each other but perhaps integration of these schools of thought is necessary to fully appreciate the relationship between the brain and the metaphysical mind. So I know that was a very short overview of a very dense topic and one that I'm still very curious to explore myself. So instead of conclusions, I'm gonna leave you guys with a series of questions to ponder today that I've plucked from my own mind. The first being the age old question, does the metaphysical truly not exist? Is it a figment of the mind? Or are we simply unable to prove or disprove it at this time with the limited scope of our physical sciences? The next is, is there a medical benefit to introducing near-death experiences to patients who are not near death? Near death could refer to the elderly and those in palliative care or those who suffer traumatic and life-threatening experiences. But outside of these groups, are there potential medical applications for inducing near-death experiences or similar phenomena to improve health outcomes in other demographics? Whether that be promoting mental health and outlook on life, encouraging better lifestyle practices that could improve overall health and physical wellness, or the like? And do psychedelics offer us the avenue to safely do so? And finally, though we do incorporate it as a feature of supporting, understanding, and relating to patients, do we underestimate the significance of spirituality in modern medicine? 
We look at the physical effects and we look at the psychological effects, and we're attempting to capture both the brain and the mind with this, but in excluding religiosity or separating our physical and behavioral sciences from what we perceive as mystical, maybe we're limiting our collective understanding of complex consciousness. Reports of improved outcomes in psychedelic experiences and near-death experiences both have placed significant emphasis on spirituality. And as I said before, it's easy to consider the physiological implications of psychedelics in the context of Western medicine and the ceremonial use of psychedelics in the realm of indigenous medicine as separate entities in isolation from each other. But perhaps integration of these school of thoughts is necessary to fully appreciate the relationship between the brain and the metaphysical mind, as I said before. And in osteopathy, as I said, we have our three main principles of mind, body, and spirit. So the spirit itself is listed as distinct from the body and the mind. That's why it's so valuable that our theme for this conference this year is honoring traditional indigenous practice, because in Western medicine, we may be approaching mastery in the context of physical and psychological studies, but true indigenous practice may be the resource where we can find the tools for mastery of spiritual understanding. So those are my propositions for the future of medicine. I'm very grateful to all of you for tuning in today and for my fellow committee members who made this possible. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank, Thank you. you, Aisha. I'll have to digest that food for thought later with you. Um, our next student presentation that we have um, is Praveen uh, Raja Juru. He is a rising M4 at Brown. He is originally from Greenbelt, Maryland. He had attended the University of Pennsylvania where he studied health and sciences and received a BA and PH degrees. While he is still deciding in his medical specialty, he is broadly interested in training and education, equity and health disparities and barriers to care. He enjoys running, singing, music, being outdoors, basketball, soccer, and meditating among other things. He is grateful to be the first of his family to go to medical school and hopes to use his position to blur the lines between academia and the community. He will be presenting on the barriers to inclusion of black, indigenous, and peoples of color in psych psychedelic clinical trials and implications for eventual clinical practice. Thank you for being with us today, Green. Thanks, y'all. It's been pretty cool so far. Um, I'm trying to share my screen and it didn't let me do it. Yep, no um, problem. Yeah. I can just bring it up for you. Cool. And I'll just put it on presenter mode. Awesome. <clears throat> and then you should be able to control it, but if not, just let me know and I can advance it for you. For sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, so my name is Praveen, um, and I'm presenting on barriers to inclusion of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, BIPOC, in psychedelic clinical trials and implications for ventral clinical practice. Uh, and shout out to my mentor, Reepal Shah, um, for um, psychiatrist at Stanford for helping me with this. Um, so I don't know if I'm able to, okay, awesome, <laughs> yeah. Um, so disclosures, um, we have no known financial relationships or conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, and so just wanna start with a little bit of background. So I think we've, we've kind of talked about this a lot, so I don't wanna belabor it, but um, you know, the US pharmaceutical psychedelics market is expected to grow to nearly $7 billion by 2027. Um, and there's such a huge growing body of evidence like showing how applicable these could be for like a variety of uses. Um, you know, it's it's kind of ironic um, when you think about the history of these of these compounds and like where they've come from and how they've historically been used um, to now how they've uh, they're you know they're they're starting to be absorbed into these other um, systems um, that really weren't built around um, around you know the folks who who did um, you know develop the usage of these compounds. But um, even now, as they're being taken into the you know more formal like Western medicine, um, you know, psychedelics market, um, there's a lot of opportunities for uh, inequity to arise. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so when we look at the cl clinical research around uh, psychedelic compounds, um, you know, there's recent review that showed that clinical trials estimate that like over 80% of participants in them are non-Hispanic white, um, which is uh, kind of shocking considering like where, you know, the, the compounds came from um, and, even if you were just to simplify it to like the biological, um, you know, factors involved with why this is important is that, you know, there's hypothesized differences in site metabolism of psychedelics across identity groups. Um, so there's really real implications for clinical practice of these. Um, and we know from previous like therapies that have been out there that low clinical trial participation um, from BIPOC individuals, like usually doesn't really uh, get a whole lot better once, uh, the, once the treatment is available widely um, clinically. 
Uh, next slide. So what we did here was we reviewed like about 45 papers to uh, summarize some of the major barriers to BIPOC participation in clinical trials for psychedelic treatments. And, um, you know, we talk about these barriers, uh, how they might translate to therapeutic utilization of psychedelics by BIPOC individuals. And uh, we talk about some of the paths for addressing these barriers. Um, cool. So barrier one is the current levels of psychiatric care for uh, BIPOC individuals or mental health care more broadly. So. Um, by almost any metric that you look at it, BIPOC individuals receive mental health care at lower rates than white counterparts. Um, and that's that includes like levels of lower diagnosis for conditions like anxiety, depression, um, PTSD, which we've talked about here. Um, also, even once folks receive care, uh, there are different standards of care that are uh, provided. So I'm not sure if um, with, uh, with, with schizophrenia, for example, um, Black individuals diagnosed with schizophrenia are less likely to be receiving atypical antipsychotics, which opens them up to a whole another level of, uh, of you know, side effects, which could potentially be avoided. Um, in clinical trials and practice, um, how this translates into the therapeutic usage of psychedelics is that um, you know, individuals generally require an initial formal diagnosis and prior treatment. Um, so if folks are not being diagnosed uh, with their condition, even if they're experiencing certain symptoms, um, then there's less likelihood that they'll have that in their record, that they'll be eligible for clinical trials, or that once the treatment's available, they'll even be able to use it. So an example here is like MDMA usage in PTSD, which Dr. Nichols, uh, you know, suggested might be legalized within like the next year or two. Um, but with BIPOC communities, we know that they're underdiagnosed with PTSD, even with the existing high rates of PTSD in those communities already. Um, and if individuals don't have the diagnosis of PTSD, even if they're experiencing the symptoms of it, then you know there's very low likelihood that they're going to be able to be eligible for usage of these treatments, um, either in a clinical set, clinical trial setting or once they're um, you know actually available more widely um, in a clinical practice setting. Um, so next slide, please. So basically, if BIPOC individuals aren't accurately diagnosed and prescribed first line treatments, um, therapeutic usage of these of these treatments are going to remain out of reach, even if you know even in communities that can really greatly benefit from them. Um, so that's just a that's just a down, like a like a upstream, you know, factor that is going to really affect how these uh, treatments are used uh, down the road. The next slide, please. Um, so barrier number two is BIPOC perceptions of psychedelics and users. So, um, you know, just studies have shown that the most common profile of a recreational psychedelic user it's, it's a white male of uh, higher income education. So just three to four percent of uh, recreational psychedelic users identify as African American, for example, um, and um, just a you know lower percentage is kind of like that identify as different identity groups um, um, beyond white um, in, ter in terms of race. And so um, this has implications in that um, the next bullet's a little a little wordy, but BIPOC individuals that place higher centrality on racial identity are less likely to pursue forms of treatment that are discordant. So what I mean by that is that essentially if folks feel like a form of treatment or, or a practice isn't really consistent with their form of identity, um, then it's less likely that that's going to be pursued. Um, and what that really translates to is that folks who know other people, folks who have community where these things are normalized um, are more likely to feel like this is this is uh, in congruence with their identity. So a parallel here is like with psychotherapy um, and you know studies showing that with um, with administration of psychotherapy that BIPOC individuals are significantly less likely to pursue these these forms of treatment um, compared to their white counterparts. Um, however, if we do move, um, one study demonstrate that if you do move the setting of the therapy into a community that is predominantly based in that identity group, that utilization of that service rises. Um, so that's to say that there's a reluctance um, if for something that feels like an outside um, outside treatment or an outside practice. Um, but when we're able to internalize that into a community, um, that can really change the perception of that treatment um, and the likelihood that that treatment is going to be used. Um, similarly, with like folks not really knowing as many people um, around them who are using these sorts of uh, you know treatments, like either recreationally or like in, in the clinical trial settings, um, that leads to different concerns around safety and uh, and different use cases that might not line up with the ones that are. Um, that are part of the, you know, safe, safely accepted like clinical norms and things like that. Um, so next slide here, please. So essentially, you know, when folks aren't participating in clinical trials, when they're not being welcomed into clinical trials, there there creates a whole vacuum for perceptions of these treatments in BIPOC communities, um, and that makes it less likely for the treatments to be viewed as a potential norm, which makes it less likely for them to be uh, taken up in the future. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then barrier number three, um, this one is also a pretty upstream cause, but um, lack of BIPOC focus and leadership. So just 2% of psychiatrists, 4% of psychologists identify as black. And um, the board of one you know, prominent new psychedelics journal um, has been described as 78% you know, male and overwhelmingly white. Um, so there's not a whole lot of diversity in the positions that are you know, administering these treatment second clinical research or the ones that are publishing um, this sort of uh, you know, these findings. Um, 
So, you know, there's also few published accounts of BIPOC individuals using psychedelics. Um, you know, most of the firsthand accounts are from folks who are not BIPOC. Um, and, uh, you know, the accounts that do exist there of, uh, of individuals, um, of BIPOC individuals using psychedelics have demonstrated that, you know, some of the protocols or some of the ways in which psychedelic assisted therapy is, uh, is administered um, actually introduces micro microaggressions, reminders of racial trauma. Um, that really has a lot of, um, you know, connotations for your, you know, effects based on the, you know, set and setting a mindset of, you know, when you're taking a psychedelic treatment, um, you know, what, what that, how that affects the effectiveness of it in the setting in which you're taking it and microaggressions being introduced can really change the effectiveness of these treatments. So, um, next slide, um, you know, exclusion from positions and roles of leadership, it makes the administration of psychedelic assisted treatments to BIPOC individuals less, you know, inclusive of those perspectives, um, and then less likely <clears throat> to be therapeutically beneficial for those individuals. Next slide, please. And therefore, um, you know, historically inequitable drug policies. Um, Dr. Nichols talked about this, but, you know, Controlled Substances Act of 1970 banned psychedelics and other substances, but it wasn't necessarily because of the, the substances themselves. It was more because of the folks who were associated with those substances. Um, and down the downstream since then, you know, Black individuals are 3.5 times more likely to be arrested, seven times more likely to be incarcerated for drug-related offenses. Um, and, you know, the decreased trust and uh, increased hesitation in BIPOC communities um, might be observed in utilizing a treatment that's been illegal for decades. Um, you know, if, if you're constantly, you know, legalization isn't going to be enough to, um, you can go to the next slide, but um, legalization isn't just going to be enough to destigmatize usage of, um, you know, previously illegal compounds for BIPOC individuals, especially if they've been disproportionately more likely to be punished for using these compounds. Um, next slide, please. And then um, barrier five, hinders historical inequity in medical research for BIPOC individuals. So, um, you know, there's the broader history uh, in BIPOC communities of experiencing medical experimentation and, you know, with Tuskegee, with gynecological studies, um, if you look at like the, you know, the history of a lot of the procedures and where they've come from. Um, but, you know, psychedelic research isn't immune from this either. So um, the first wave of psychedelic research, you know, in the, in the 50s, 60s um, involved a lot of unethical experimentation on BIPOC communities and incarcerated communities in the 1950s. So here, um, there were like extremely large doses of mescaline and LSD given to individuals um, who were not able to properly consent. Um, and that actually resulted in lifelong sequelae for a lot of individuals, um, you know, symptoms of psychosis, um, just inability to really um, reintegrate into, uh, into daily life. And, um, and what this looks like in practice is that we've seen it with the COVID vaccine um, and, and numerous other treatments where, um, you know, low rates of participation in research where mistrust is, is positive is one of the factors um, in, in explaining this um, results in low rates of uptake once the treatment's actually available. Um, so next slide, please. And uh, the history of experimentation on BIPOC individuals, even the psychedelic space, um, creates a mistrust that might reduce therapeutic utilization. Um, and next slide. So in terms of the potential interventions, I mean, we'll talk, we can talk about these a little bit more, maybe um, q and I know I'm getting a little close to time, but um, BIPOC representation and, you know, positions of leadership in psychedelic uh, clinical and research spaces, that's just so important um, as, as with any sort of thing in the clinical space where having more perspectives in the room that are able to um, advocate for and, um, and able to understand the perspectives of other people is just so important in making sure these treatments are able to be actively used for people who can benefit from them. Um, and it's, and, you know, it's a fine line between not wanting to put all this work on certain individuals who are already disproportionately affected by these things, but, um, but just having those perspectives in the room and, and amplifying those perspectives are really important. Um, culturally informed training and emphasis on cultural humility, um, especially for those cases of individuals, you know, being, at the end of the day, psychedelics are going to be administered by somebody, and um, and having those individuals understand um, the context in which someone is using them, and and the factors that are, you know, involved behind the experiences that have led this person to like want to use um, psychedelics, you know, treatments. I think it is going to be really important to make sure that you know that set and setting are, are really preserved, um, and then community involvement, in messaging, and outreach. Um, just a lot of folks have a lot more trust in the community than they do have in, in academic spaces um, and people that they know as opposed to people that um, that they don't know. Um, and so just having those folks involved is really important. And then clear and open messaging around the utilization of psychedelics, uh, both, you know, around the history of them, um, making clear that, you know, this is something that has been used for centuries and centuries and centuries. Um, and, you know, right now it's going undergoing this transition into being utilized in this other space, but um, not discrediting like the previous work that's been done um, and, uh, you know, just being as open as possible here. Um, and yeah, that's all of my slides. Um, you know, thanks again to all the people who have, um, you know, been doing this work. We reviewed like a whole lot of papers and, um, you know, Monica Williams, who, um, Dr. Um, Dr. Daniels mentioned, um, yeah, really, you know, leaning on a lot of work from people like, uh, like her. So thanks.
Well, thank you for sharing, Praveen. Um, unfortunately, we're right at the, uh, you know, we have, I guess, two minutes, um, but I guess we'll just go into the next um, presentation. Um, but if you guys have any questions, Praveen, um, if you don't mind sticking around and just, you know, answering in the chat, um, your presentation was amazing, but we're going to have to move on to uh, Jeremy Wood. Um, Jeremy um, is a second year medical student at Western University, COM, uh, interested in psychology, anesthesiology, and research, exploring novel pharmacologic therapies for mental health disorder and pain management. Um, he'll be presenting on provider attitudes towards psychedelic assisted therapy. Thank you so much for the introduction. And that was an awesome talk, Praveen. Thank you for sharing that as well. I'm pulling up my, can everyone hear me and yep. see my screen all right? All right. Looks great. Cool. So um, I did a summer project last year looking at provider attitudes towards psychedelic assisted therapy. I had intended to do more of a proper meta analysis, but I, I'll get into what I ended up doing with the data a little bit later. Uh, first, I kind of want to go over why I think this topic is relevant. Uh, in 2020, Oregon voters decided to legalize psilocybin statewide for therapeutic use. And as of January 1st, 2023, the Oregon Health Authority has established their rules and guidelines for the clinical use of psilocybin. And there are clinics currently opening and it is fully legal and people are able to sign up for psilocybin services if they're referred and prescribed um, by their provider uh, psilocybin therapy. Uh, however, uh, 25 of Oregon's 36 counties, including Lynn County, where or, uh, my medical school is, decided to ban any psilocybin assisted therapy services. So that's over two thirds of Oregon's counties have decided not to allow this kind of practice to happen, which is interesting because that significantly limits access and it kind of ties into a general perception of psychedelic assisted therapy, uh, not just among healthcare providers, but among you know, the average person living in Oregon. And it speaks to a general lack of understanding of how these therapies work and a general hesitancy to adopt them and a persisting sort of biased perception against uh, psychedelics as a legitimate therapeutical practice. Um, However, certification programs are open to anyone in Oregon right now that has a high school diploma and can pass a background check. And uh, the uh, industry of psychedelic assisted therapy is definitely picking up steam and you can see a lot of places opening up, starting to offer these services. And just a little bit of background uh, before I get into my research, I'd like to talk a bit about what psilocybin is. Uh, I'm sure most people here already know quite a bit about psilocybin and other psychedelic substances, but I think it is worth talking a little bit about what we know because I think it is quite a bit more than some people are aware. Uh, psilocybin is a prodrug. It is endogenously converted to psilocin in the human body, which is a very potent 5-HT2A receptor agonist. Um, psilocybin is naturally occurring in a wide variety of mushrooms in the psilocybe genus, and these mushrooms actually grow natively in Oregon and throughout the United States, as well as almost every country on earth has some species of psilocybe growing. Um, and you can see some structural similarity to serotonin. They're both tryptamines and, uh, explains a lot of why there is such a strong binding affinity for the particular serotonin receptor as a weaker affinity for other serotonin receptors, but it's affinity for 5-HT3, for instance, could have a lot to do with the nauseating effects that a lot of patients report. And I'm not going to go super far into this slide, but the main characteristics of the 5-HT2A receptor are that it is expressed very heavily in the neocortex, which is the newest part of the brain, evolutionarily speaking, which gives a lot of humans uh, what we consider 
to make people human, the ability to reason and think and recall memories and integrate them into current experiences, uh, very heavily expressed in that part of the brain. And also the amygdala, the part of the brain that uh, causes us to experience fear. And the 5-HT2A receptor is expressed primarily on glutamatergic and GABAergic uh, neurons. So the excitatory and inhibitory neur neurons. We don't totally know why it has the effects it does on these neurons, but we know that it functions via a different signaling pathway than endogenous serotonin. I just thought all that was pretty interesting, uh, not 100% relevant, but worth highlighting that we know quite a bit about how these drugs work. We don't know exactly why they have the effects that they do, but we know quite a bit about their biochemistry. So I set off to look at what has already been published in the literature regarding providers and their attitudes towards the use of psychedelics in practice. Before the 1970s, when psychedelics were formally outlawed, we had a lot of research ongoing in the US regarding psychedelics in therapy, especially psilocybin, but also LSD, MDMA, which is considered by some a psychedelic and others not as much. But uh, for the purposes of this study, I included it in uh, my literature search. I was originally going to just look at psilocybin, but I found that there weren't enough papers that were that narrow focused. Um, however, looking at English language peer reviewed studies studying US mental health care providers, I identified 11 reports, um, a handful of them were not reporting standardizable data. So I had to exclude them. A um, few others were excluded for various reasons, and five were included in the final analysis. And these are the studies I looked at. Um, like I said, I didn't end up doing a proper meta analysis, which is where you would weight all the study level data by uh, the quality of the evidence and the sample size, and then perform some really robust statistics to integrate their findings. The problem is that these studies were all looking at Likert scores. And for those who don't know, Likert scores are the kind of survey data that you will get uh, strongly agree, somewhat agree, strongly disagree, those kind of responses. And you weight them from one to five, where five would correspond to strongly agree. Uh, these studies were all uh, looking at data from Likert scored surveys distributed to mental health care providers. And it turns out that it's not very easy to do statistics on that sort of thing if the questions are not all identical, which was the case. So what I ended up doing was pooling the data. Uh, I just made a much larger sample size from all of these. And then I uh, stratified them based on what the research question was. And I'll get to that on the next slide here. Um, as you can see, most of these studies were in the early 2020s. Uh, I think a lot of these studies started to pick up steam and be uh, relevant when it became apparent that Oregon and other states were considering legalizing psilocybin for therapeutic use. So um, Barnett et al have done a couple studies. And then I also looked at a 2021 study from Davis et al that was looking at psychologists. Hearn et al looked at counselors in particular, and then Page also looked at psychiatrists um, like Barnett did. So I was curious if there is a difference between designations. Do psychiatrists or psychologists or therapists have different views on psychedelics, considering that psychiatrists as uh, MDs or DOs presumably have gotten more uh, education on these, uh, these drugs and should be aware of more of the information that I showed on the previous slides regarding the mechanism of psychedelics. One would assume that they would be more comfortable prescribing or using these kind of medications because of their larger knowledge base. It turns out that was not true. Uh, psychiatrists report marginally less uh, agreeability to the idea of prescribing psychedelics. Um, 
the question that I've mostly looked at, a few studies used the exact same wording, but other studies had slightly different wording that I considered analogous, uh, which is psychedelics show promise in treating mental health disorders. 21.3% uh, of psychiatrists strongly agree with that statement or normal agree with that statement. 25.7% of psychologists and counselors strongly or agree with that statement. Um, that wasn't a statistically significant finding, uh, p-value of 0.18, so not great. <laughs> and uh, looking at the change over time, I was also curious if uh, you'll see that these dates aren't exactly lining up with the publication of the data. I was looking instead at when the data was collected. Uh, earliest was in 2016 and the latest that data were collected was January 21st for these studies and there was no significant change over time either although as you can see there's a very large cluster of these data towards the final um, months of 2020 and very early 2021 so uh, not a very large distribution over time but we can see that attitudes haven't really shifted since 2016 um, there wasn't any statistically significant change in respondents' likelihood of having positive attitudes towards psychedelic-assisted therapy. Um, all of this points to providers still have a lot of concerns about psychedelic-assisted therapy, and they don't report a lot of confidence in its use yet. Um, many of these providers cite an insufficient evidence of safety profiles or efficacy. Um, Despite the fact that a lot of studies have been published recently, um, that either means that they aren't confident in the data reported by those studies, or they aren't being exposed to those studies, uh, one or the other. It's not clear which. Um, as far as a lack of existing clinical guidelines uh, in Oregon, as of 2023, that's not true for every state anymore. but. At the time of these studies, there really weren't any clinical guidelines published. There were some suggestions and uh, from clinics like in Johns Hopkins that are conducting ongoing trials with psychedelics for therapy. Uh, there were some guidelines published there, but there haven't been a concrete set of guidelines for uh, providers until just this year in Oregon. Um, there's also concern over legality. Uh, psychedelics are still Schedule One according to the DEA nationwide. So, uh, even though states like Oregon have legalized psychedelics for uh, psilocybin-assisted therapy, uh, there's still some concern from providers about the uh, risks associated with prescribing these drugs or referring people for treatment with them. And then a few providers also cite. Uh, potential for an inequitable access. And that's something that we just covered in the last talk, which I think is incredibly relevant. And looking at a state like Oregon, where it's a very white state overall, uh, it'll be interesting to see if we can glean any findings from the way these drugs are prescribed and the type of people that are uh, being given access to this treatment. Um, looking at the number of uh, counties in Oregon that have decided not to allow psychedelic assisted therapy, I think it's clear that the more rural areas are a lot more hesitant to adopt this treatment. And that will limit access for a lot of Oregon's more diverse communities because the farming uh, immigrant communities in rural Oregon are probably some of the less white areas of this state and uh, currently it's not legal for any of them to access psilocybin therapy. Um, looking at some of the limitations of this study, um, there was a very small sample size. Um, data was non-parametric which limited the analyses I was able to perform and the scope of the included studies uh, extended to psychedelics beyond psilocybin. So some more information about providers' willingness to prescribe and refer people for psilocybin therapies specifically uh, are pretty desperately needed right now. And a majority of these studies were only completed in the last three years. Uh, the research is both too recent and too old to draw some really firm conclusions 
uh, too recent because it's difficult to assess the changes over time and too old because it doesn't account for the recent developments in legality and clinical practice that we've seen occur in Oregon. Um, overall research into this subject is pretty limited. Uh, some more studies would help us make more meaningful comparisons uh, between parameters like the ages of the providers that we're looking at. Um, psychiatry is a rapidly shifting field demographically. A lot of new people are entering into the field. Um, something like, I think it was 70% of uh, psychiatrists right now are within five years of retirement age. So. Uh, it's going to be a rapidly shifting field. There's going to be a lot of new blood and a lot of people with different ideas about what is uh, useful therapy. And a lot of more people that have a greater understanding of psychedelics and how they work and what their potentials are. And finally, there are some inconsistencies in the study design. As I touched on earlier, it's difficult to perform uh, meta analyses on studies that don't have identical study design and studies that don't have identical outcome uh, reporting. So if future uh, studies into provider attitudes towards psychedelics are able to use identical wording for their questions, then it's easier to draw conclusions in a review or a meta-analysis. So my suggestion for anyone seeking to uh, explore this area in the future It'd be a great idea to look at some previous studies and see uh, how you can mirror their questions. And I want to say thanks for everybody for tuning into this talk. I know it was a little bit more dry than some of the other ones, but I think it's a important subject that as this therapy moves forward and becomes more accepted and becomes legalized, it's really important that people uh, make sure that everyone in the field is aware of these developments and uh, is getting educated. And I think that most healthcare uh, education systems are not teaching people about psychedelic assisted therapy right now. So it'd be a good thing to integrate into curriculums. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, we all appreciated your uh, presentation. Um, unfortunately, we're right at the time of 115, so we're just going to move on straight to uh, John Cruz. Um, and if there are any questions, just throw them in the chat, and hopefully you can stick around, Jeremy, if uh, we have any other questions. Thank you so much again. Uh, John Cruz, he is a second year here at Rowan SOM, um, who is interested in emergency medicine and sports medicine. He previously attended the University of Georgia, Go Dogs, where he studied biology and public health. He'll be presenting on post-traumatic stress disorder and psychedelics. The floor is yours, John. I'm going to share my slides. Can everyone hear me? Perfect. Okay. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you said, I'm John Cruz. I'm a second year here at Rowan Virtua, and I'll be talking about post-traumatic stress disorder and psychedelics. Um, we got a lot to get to today, so uh, I might be talking quick, but it'll be all right. I tried to highlight everything that I think is important um, and pay attention to the symptomatology as treatments uh, as they relate to PTSD, as well as the, the data. I'll try to focus on that. Here's some learning objectives. By the end of this presentation, I hope everyone can identify the DSM-5 criteria for the diagnosis of PTSD, understand PTSD's epidemiology, symptoms, and course, understand effect sizes of current approved treatments, discover potential uses of psychedelics as treatment, compare these effect sizes, and see the need for further research in this field and in the management of PTSD. So my connection, um, this is all my family, uh, my aunts and uncles, my dad in the bottom center, and my grandfather and grandmother in the bottom right. And so, uh, as you can see, military services is, is very important to me, to our family. And um, unfortunately, some of my family members do suffer from PTSD. So I believe, you know, one thing I can do as a medical student is, uh, is help by learning about this disorder and uh, treatments available. And um, I was underwhelmed when we learned about PTSD treatments as uh, they relate to the complexity of the disease um, first year. Okay, so uh, a little bit about the epidemiology of this one. Uh, Eight percent of Americans are going to suffer from PTSD in their in their lifetime. Uh, it's about 12 million adults. And then 17 percent of veterans 
it was found that Afghan war veterans were two to four times more likely to suffer from PTSD, as well as 32% of emergency first responders. Uh, breaking down by gender and race here, uh, women were significantly more likely to suffer from PTSD uh, due to their significant exposure to uh, sexual assault. And then racially, African Americans were the most likely to suffer from PTSD, um, most likely due to racial discrimination and other types of discrimination. And uh, Asian Americans were the lowest among this category. So what is PTSD? Um, the first criteria is there has to be exposure to trauma. And then the last DSM-5 change, there was actually moved from an anxiety disorder to a trauma and stress-related disorder. Um, and if you Google search the word trauma, it comes up as a deeply distressing or disturbing experience. However, the DSM-5 definition of trauma is actually much more specific. specific. Uh, it includes an exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence. And this could be either direct, witnessed, learned, or through extreme exposure, um, as you see with emergency first responders. Some other criteria here. B, there has to be one or more intrusion or re-experience symptoms. Um, this is unique to PTSD. Um, it includes flashbacks as well as nightmares. C, avoidant symptoms, such as uh, avoiding thoughts, feelings, conversations, or places that can trigger this trauma. And then D, negative cognitions moods or mood symptoms. This is more of the depressive symptoms that come with PTSD, such as a negative emotional state or amnesia. And then E, hyperarousal symptoms, such as sleep difficulties, outbursts of anger, or hypervigilance, which are also more unique to PTSD. And further criteria, uh, the duration. I'm sorry here, having some trouble there. Let's see. Duration of disturbance has to be greater than, hold on, I'm having some technical difficulties here. Let me know if you need any helps later. The, uh, the slides are like on my screen and it's blocking the words. Okay, well, I can share it on my end if you'd prefer that. Okay, that'll work. Sorry about that. So I'm going to have you unshare Slater, and then I will um, do it on my end. Thank you. Sorry about that, everyone. All is good. No apology is necessary. And also, there's a lot of love in the chat for service. Skip right through. And beautiful slides, by the way. Thanks, Chris. Uh, next. Okay. So, uh, I'm sorry, go back. And then back one more time. Okay. Um, so further criteria, uh, the duration has to be greater than one month. Otherwise it's just an adjustment disorder. Um, and then there has to be impairment in social and occupational settings. And this cannot be attributed to substance abuse. As far as assessments goes, um, all the studies that I reviewed used either the CAPS-5 or the PCL-5 to assess this criteria. Next slide. You can, okay, here we go. So, uh, as we said, the main thing has to be exposure to trauma. And what's interesting is that 80% of the population is exposed to trauma, and the symptoms of PTSD are actually very common um, immediately following trauma. However, only 8% of the population ends up developing this. Uh, disorder, and that be is because of a disrupted fear extinction learning pathway. And it's thought that the, the trauma causes stress, which uh, leads to cortical and hippocampal atrophy, which is where some of the depression and anxiety symptoms come in. And you also have increased amygdala reactivity, um, which is more unique to PTSD, and which accounts for some of the hyperarousal and, um, and re-experience symptoms. Uh, risk factors include prior mental illness or comorbid disorder, as well as low SES, parental neglect, and family history. Next slide. So the current treatments uh, that we learn in med school, um, first line would be psychotherapy, um, and specifically exposure-based psychotherapy, uh, where you're being desensitized to this trauma or re-experiencing these symptoms. Um, and this was found to have a positive uh, effect, and we're looking at this D equals 0.27 here. That's the Cohen D effect size. Anything greater than zero um, does mean there's an effect either positive or negative. And then um, the p-values is also what we're looking at. p of 0.005 is very effective. Um, 
However, this does have a high dropout rate of 24% and um, is some can have uh, limited access among the population. And uh, there are some other EMDR and CBT uh, mixed are just some other ones that were found to have lesser effect uh, when compared to exposure-based treatments. And then pharmacology is uh, SSRIs are the first line that we learn. So um, they increase serotonin and the synaptic gap. And after about four weeks, they end up desensitizing the 5-HT system that has been uh, previously talked about. And um, unfortunately, these have poor side effects, such as impotence, decreased libido, and weight gain, and can lead to poor compliance. It was found that paroxetine, fluoxetine, and an SNRI, fin venlafaxine, actually have the greatest effect of uh, various different um, antidepressants. Okay. And so, moving on into the to the uh, more experimental treatments that we're looking at is cannabis. And um, I'm going to try not to get bogged down in in cannabis because it works both centrally and peripherally at uh, a various different sites in the body. However, um, relating to PTSD, it can work at the amygdala to consolidate fearful memories and um, have anxiolytic uh, effects, as well as the prefrontal cortex to increase serotonin, um, working as an antidepressant. It can also uh, have hippocampal increasing neurogenesis and mood memory and um, there's also been uh, decreases or shown that there's decreases in anandamide working at the hpa axis as well as altering brain derived neurotropic factor and altering memory processing so it works in a lot of different ways however um, uh, cannabis versus placebo on ptsd symptoms which was a randomized phase two double blind crossover study showed that uh, thc and cbd uh, combined did decrease avoidance and negative cognitions and mood. Um, however, all treatment groups improved, so there was found no significant difference uh, between treatment and placebo. So these drug, uh, cannabis does work to uh, decreasing anxiety and depression. However, there are uh, no significant changes found in insomnia or psychosocial functioning in this particular study. Um, so there is, once again, no significant difference between treatment and placebo as related to PTSD. Next. This is a graphic uh, that I really like. It talks about, it, it kind of combines all the uh, drugs we're going to talk about, ketamine, MDMA, and psilocybin, um, and it shows the receptors that they work at, and uh, I think is a good summary tool to use. Next. Okay, so ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic, um, and it works in the glutaminergic system as an NMDA receptor antagonist, um, and it decreases, or it's been theorized to decrease anxiety, depression, and intrusive memories. However, uh, a study or randomized control trial testing it for PTSD showed that um, it did not have a significant effect of treatment. Um, and if we're looking at these statistics here, uh, the p-value of 0.17 was, was insignificant in relating to PTSD. However, uh, versus uh, or secondary analysis of rapid antidepressant effects showed that there was uh, very significant effects in, of 0.02 and 0.04. Okay, next slide. Okay, and this is just some of the, the data here on the right. It shows that there was, there's no significant decrease in PTSD symptoms. Um, however, on the left, um, if we look at C, there were decreases in uh, depression. Okay, next. Um, next is psilocybin. As uh, we've talked about through several lectures today, um, in 2018, it was approved as a breakthrough therapy for major depressive disorder and treatment-resistant depression. Um, as Jeremy was talking about, it works at the 5-HT system, um, similarly to the SSRIs. However, it does other um, things as well, such as or, or agonizing the EGR1 and EGR2, um, which help with synaptogenicity, neuroplasticity, um, and neurogenesis. It also decreases amygdala reactivity, um, which is, once again, specific to PTSD. Uh, in my review, I didn't find any clinical trials that were completed in psilocybin as a treatment for PTSD. I think there's a, a few in the uh, that are being conducted right now. However, there's a ton of trials uh, looking at the link between MDD, anxiety, OCD, and substance abuse disorder. Um, and actually, this study that I have on the right here, psilocybin on, on major depressive disorder, is from uh, Dr. Davis, who presented earlier. And um, if we look down at the the effect size of 2.5 and 2.6 after five weeks and then after eight weeks, that's very significant uh, values um, and very significant effect sizes. So I think this does have a place in PTSD since 50% of PTSD patients um, also have major depressive disorder. And 
that uh, and plus the amygdala reactivity functions of psilocybin, I think could show very uh, potential results. Next slide. And this is just some of the, the data. That's how the study was ran in the top left. And then on the right, um, just looking at the graph visually, you can see significant decreases at both week five and week eight. Next slide. All right, and um, in my remaining time, this is kind of the, the, the crux of uh, treatment for PTSD. In 2017, MDMA was approved as a breakthrough therapy for PTSD, and it works by releasing uh, monoamine neurotransmitters. Uh, serotonin and dopamine help reduce depressive symptoms of PTSD. Oxytocin can improve empathy, trust, and decrease anxiety, um, which is very important in the therapeutic setting. Norepinephrine ephrine, and cortisol enhance emotional learning and fear extinction learning. And it also works at the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and amygdala pathway, decreasing reactivity, which helps decrease avoidance and increase ability to re-experience trauma um, in the therapeutic setting. Next. And so uh, these are two uh, very important studies. MAP1 is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled phase three study um, in which 90 severe PTSD patients, uh, half received MDMA and half received placebo. And this occurred three eight-hour sessions, four weeks apart. Um, there's a little bit about the, the dosing they use. Primary endpoint at 18 weeks, 67% of MDMA group no longer met diagnostic criteria using the CAPS-5 um, compared to 32% of the placebo group. Um, that's an effect size of 0.91. And uh, if you recall, the effect sizes of, of psychotherapy at about 0.27 and SSRIs at 0.23. Uh, this is very significant and the p-value is also very significant. Um, and then MAP2 was uh, done to confirm the results of MAP1, done by the same, same people, um, same similar setup. And it was conducted or finished in November of last year and the press release on January, the results are not out yet, but the press release January said it confirms MAP1 and there are no adverse events. Um, and also kind of on the backs of what we've been talking about this morning, over half of the participants identified as people of color. Um, which is important due to the, the discrepancy of, of uh, participants in most studies. Um, and MDMA is safe, or in conclusion, uh, it, it, it concluded that MDMA is safe and efficacious uh, in treatment of PTSD. Next. And then here are the results. Uh, the top right, you can see significant decrease in the CAPS-5 at the endpoint. Um, and then on the bottom left, in the red, is uh, shows the... The dark red at the bottom of the bar is remission, which they uh, they outlined there as a CAPS-5 score less than 11. And that's really what we're looking for in PTSD is uh, the long-term remission of this disorder. And so I think those are great results. Next. So a couple more slides, sorry, if I'm going over. Um, uh, then lastly, uh, complementary and alternative approaches to PTSD include outdoor recreational therapy, uh, which was found to have a significant effect to placebo, as well as um, yoga having a, a significant effect as well. So these are just some other options that are maybe more accessible um, than the therapies we we're talking about, but I think can also be great in the in the treatment. And next. Okay, next. And then so uh, finally, I think for future research, we're gonna need um, continued trials and policy regarding MDMA as approved treatment, as we've discussed earlier, um, that's in the works. And we have to work out the accessibility of that. Um, I'd like to see a, a randomized control trial of, of psilocybin as a treatment specifically for PTSD. Um, and then continued advocacy in this field, as we've been talking about all morning, and studies examining the appropriate setting and dosing regulations. And um, all in all, this should lead to a more comprehensive treatment for PTSD and better health outcomes in general. Thank you. Sorry, sorry I went over, guys. You're not over at all, Slater. Uh, thank you for sharing all that personal information with us, and thank you for your presentation today. Um, it was very well put together, and we appreciate it. Um, unfortunately, you know, we're right at the um, next presentation time, so if you have any uh, questions for uh, John, you can just throw them in the chat, and um, we'll just stick around and answer them if you don't mind. Um, so now we have a small poster presentation. Um, first is presented by Naomi Watkins Granville, a second-year medical student here at Rowan SOM. She has a strong interest in women's health, and she is currently the president of the Rowan Virtua SOM chapter of American Medical Women's Association, historian of the Student National Medical Association, 
co-marketing and social media chair for the Black Collective and PBL rep for Student Osteopathic Surgical Association. She is also the co-founder of a social service organization called Brown Girl Society. She is grateful for this opportunity to develop meaningful research with talented students. Um, also on this poster will be Alyssa Cooney, um, Alessia Cooney, who is a third year medical student from New York. Alessia is a, had a leadership role with Rowan SOM COVID vaccine clinic, OMM clinic and community health clinic. She has a strong interest in women's health. And then also another presenter um, will be Jalen Thompson, but I'll save her um, introduction for the um, next poster. The floor is yours, Naomi. So um, let's just see, I'm going to share my poster up here. Just give me one second. Oh. Sorry, I didn't realize that it would take so long to come up. <laughs> You're all good. Take your time. Oh, if you wouldn't mind, that actually would be would be better if you guys have it. No on problem here. at all. Um, also, are we able to add um, Alessia and Jalen? Um, yeah, we can. I'll have uh, one of the members do that for you right now. Thank you. Give me one moment while I pull this up. No problem. Okay. Oh. Um, so Dr. Naomi, while we're just kind of calibrating this, do you want to give us a little uh, part of the introduction or yeah. inspiration for the project? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I can get started. Um, so thank you guys for having us here. Um, myself and Alessia and Jalen were really passionate about women's health um, and we hope to have a future in it. Uh, so we wanted to just provide a perspective on the use of psychedelic medicine in women's health. It's not very much talked about at all. Um, and so we hope that you guys can get a good perspective. Um, so we just wanted to start off with some facts. Um, according to the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, every 14 seconds, somewhere in the world, a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer. So in the United States, it's the second leading cause of death, second to lung cancer. So um, just a little bit of a personal experience. Um, my breast, my grandmother passed away of breast cancer. And I just kind of wonder about like what her overall experience was like, like what were her treatment options? What symptoms did she experience? And what could have potentially relieved the disease burden? So like many other cancers, um, breast cancer comes with a wide variety of symptoms, right? Um, but many of which are mental health related. So women that are diagnosed with breast cancer can suffer from addiction, anxiety, insomnia, PTSD, and depression. So all of these are treatable conditions, right? We're in medical school. We all have some sort of background, right? So they're treatable with SSRIs, therapy, and things like that. But if you could imagine how you know burdensome these conditions could be in conjunction, in conjunction with a breast cancer diagnosis or breast cancer treatment. Um, so the treatment that we wanted to focus on specifically um, was mastectomies. So mastectomies, um, they're a life altering procedure and they affect the woman as soon as she wakes up from surgery um, with symptoms like depression specifically. So um, while there are available options and treatments, um, we wanted to explore options that were able to help uh, quickly and effectively. So we have explored the use of ketamine um, in post mastectomy patients. As you guys can see um, in the poster here, I believe WebEx has a zoom feature. So if you want to zoom in as we're talking, you can definitely do that. Um, and so we wanted to explore the rapid therapeutics effects of ketamine um, and post mastectomy depression. So uh, as you guys know, ketamine, ketamine preferentially binds NMDA receptors. Um, and the use of ketamine to treat depression, it, it, um, there's no definitive um, mechanism, 
but it's theorized that it binds to um, NMDA receptors on GABAergic interneurons, leading to the disinhibition of excitatory glutamate transmission. So this could lead to the rapid therapeutic effects that we uh, would hope. So ketamine can also cause psychedelic experiences, and we wanted to see if any of these psychedelic experiences were had by the patients in the forthcoming studies. And so Alessia is going to talk about what we found. Okay, I think she might be having some technical difficulties, so I'll keep going. Um, but we conducted a literature review um, of articles from 2012 to 2023 um, this year using uh, PubMed and Google Scholar. So we wanted to include things that um, were related to ketamine and breast cancer, of course, depression and mastectomies. So we were able to find 220 articles, um, but there were four randomized control studies that were actually able to assess the use of ketamine and depression post mastectomy. So one study that we found had a sample size of about 303 patients. They administered ketamine intravenously pre and post op, and um, they used the uh, Hamilton rating scale for depression, and it did show significantly lower depression scores in days one and three post op compared to the control. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And the second study that we found it had about 136 patients. Um, ketamine was administered intravenously post op. Um, and the depression scores were actually calculated before um, and discharged one day um, after surgery. And so we saw that there were actually significant reduction in depression and anxiety scores. In the third study that we found, about 66 patients, ketamine was administered seven days post-op for about one hour, and there was a significant decrease in depression three and six months post-mastectomy. Um, compared to the control. And so in the fourth study, we found it was about 97 patients and ketamine was administered continuously throughout surgery. So instead of pre and post-op, it was administered, administered intraoperatively. Um, in the depression and anxiety scores, there was no significant difference um, in, in depression anxiety scores compared to the control. And so um, contrary to what we would have hoped to see, um, none of our studies actually were able to note psychedelic experiences when giving ketamine uh, post mastectomy. So it would be beneficial for future research to explore this, given the um, given the known effects um, that ketamine can cause. So I will go into the conclusion now. What we found was that in multiple studies, when ketamine was administered postoperatively, there was a significant reduction in depression at various time intervals compared to the control group studied. While these results are promising, there isn't a recommended effective dosage for this use given the limited research. There is opportunity in this field for larger analyses that can hone in more on, on the exact effective measurements for depression relief using ketamine post mastectomy. When given postoperatively, when given intraoperatively, there was no difference when the scores were calculated two days and three months post-op. We hypothesized that a constant sub-anesthetic dose given intraoperatively was not significant enough to make a difference in depression scores. Also, the baseline depression scores were lower from the beginning of the study, which could have caused lower scores in the end. And then finally, a larger analysis using more robust baseline depression data could be helpful in determining if ketamine is helpful only when depression scores are at a certain level. Overall, though, there was a lot of opportunities in this field of research. Thank you. And um, we hope that this can provide you guys with just a unique and different perspective of the use of psychedelics in medicine um, and, you know, it's uncharted waters, women's health and psychedelics. So hopefully this can be helpful. Also, um, Jalen's topic is about women's health as well. So hopefully you guys can get a nice picture of how um, these drugs can be used. Perfect, thank you. Um, so now we have another um, poster um, by these wonderful ladies and I didn't introduce Jalen before, so I'll do it now. Um, Jalen Thompson is a second year uh, medical student at Rowan University School of Osteopathic Medicine and former professional soccer player. 
Jillian is extremely motivated to help the erratic and to help eradicate health inequalities as a future physician. She has recently completed research at Duke University School of Medicine on rising maternal mortality rates in the United States and their predominant and overarching effects on black women. Additionally, Jalen works with the Robert Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson as the New Jersey Birth Justice Advocate. Through this program, she receives training and opportunities to end health equalities surrounding maternal mortality in the United States. Jalen is most interested in research that improves birthing outcomes for pregnant women and mothers. Um, she will be presenting on the use of perinatal ketamine for reduction of postpartum depression after C-section. And um, I also believe that Naomi and um, Naomi and Alicia will also be with this. All the floor is yours, Jalen. Thank you, Chris. So as Chris and Naomi have elaborated on, I'm definitely very interested in women's health. As Naomi had mentioned before, I'm involved in multiple organizations at Rowan that are focused on women's health. So like Naomi had kind of alluded on, this is definitely a field of research that we kind of hopped on. And there is a lot of actual current research on the use of ketamine for postpartum depression. So um, thank you for joining us for this topic. And I will begin with the introduction. So as was stated, I'm very interested in factors that affect birth outcomes for mothers. The reason I initially was interested in this topic is due to the fact that postpartum depression is the most common complication of delivery with a prevalence of 10 to 15% in the United States. It's extremely important to analyze different methods of reducing this as a complication. For our introduction, just to give you some background on ketamine, I know the last two presentations have gone over it. Um, ketamine is a non-competitive antagonist of the NMDA receptors that can be used as an anesthetic and may have potential reduction effects on postpartum depression. Additionally, ketamine is water and lipid soluble and can be administered intravenously, intramuscularly, intranasally, and orally, and it's been used in operating rooms for over 50 years. Our studies, however, predominantly focused on ketamine use in the intravenous route. Additionally, due to ketamine's psychoactive properties, it is known to have abuse potential as well as having effects on memory and cognitive functioning, but adverse effects of ketamine are dependent on the dose and are self-resolving. Now to move into a little bit of background on postpartum depression. Postpartum depression is a major depressive episode with peripartum onset of mood symptoms occurring during pregnancy or within four weeks following delivery. This topic is specifically important as severe depression requiring hospitalization is more likely to occur after childbirth than any other time for mothers. Additionally, postpartum depression is severe and debilitating and has adverse effects on both mothers and children. One reason that it's really important in the United States is that one in eight women will continue to be depressed at two years, leading to an immense financial burden to society estimated to amount to $2.8 billion annually. I'll now hand it over to Naomi to go over the methods of our study. So just to talk about the methods, um, we did a literature review just to explore ketamine um, and the use in postpartum depression with, re with related to C-sections, as Jalen said. So um, 14 studies were included that assessed the efficacy of ketamine as a perioperative analgesic used to prevent postpartum depression. So Ketamine was viewed um, in, in consumption perinatally as an adjuvant to anesthesia during a C-section. So um, the individual studies that we saw, we saw eight randomized control trials, five literature, literature reviews, and one meta-analysis. Um, in the randomized control studies, they use the Edinburgh Postpartum Depression Scale, and um, this is a 10-option questionnaire used to assess depression outcomes. Also, um, in the eight randomized control trials, there were 3,557 3, birthing people enrolled. Um, 1,825 dropped out due to exclusion criteria like uh, underlying life-threatening comorbidities, prenatal depression, domestic violence, um, allergies to ketamine, of course, refusal to, of consent, and switching to a vaginal delivery. Also, lack of follow-up. So um, after accounting for the, this exclusion criteria um, in the randomized control, control trials, there ended up being 1,732 patients above the age of 18 that were analyzed. And finally, um, all eight of the randomized control trials used ketamine intravenously, 
and seven of the studies did not exceed 0.5 milligram per kilogram. And so um, one of the studies did actually use a subcutaneous injection of ketamine in addition to the intravenous uh, administration. So now moving on to what we found in the results of our studies. Eight of our studies actually found that intravenous ketamine during cesarean delivery effectively reduced postpartum depression three days to one month. To give you an example of this, one study found that the Edinburgh postpartum depression scores in the control group and study group on post-operative days, day 3, 14, and 28, were 7.65 to 6 on day 3, which was statistically significant, 7.62 to 6.38 on day 14, which was also statistically significant, and 7.35 to 6.90 um, on day 28, which was statistically significant as well. We did, however, have one study that found no significant differences in postpartum depression between the ketamine group and control group at three days and six weeks after delivery. Additionally, it was seen that psychological degeneration and emotional vulnerability with, cesareas, with cesarean section cause a higher incidence of postpartum depression in non-vaginal delivery, which emphasizes the importance of this study. And moving on to the adverse effects of ketamine, um, one literature review saw um, a total of eight studies reporting increased incidence in vomiting in ketamine groups, as well as dizziness in six studies. One study also reported psychoactive effects with IV fusion of ketamine at 0.35 milligrams per kilogram, again, under that 0.5 milligrams per kilogram that Naomi had mentioned. With all of this said, due to the known adverse effects of ketamine, low-dose ketamine may be more suitable for pregnant women having a C-section. And then one thing we wanted to know as well, ketamine's antidepressant effects do not vary with dose when given above that 0.5 milligrams per kilogram body weight. And all of our studies stayed within this range. Moving on, um, using an original pregnancy stress scale, one study found that ketamine may have an, uh, have an effect on socioeconomic stress levels, working better for moderate stress levels rather than mild and severe stress levels, which can be a future topic of research. And then finally, moving on to our two figures, um, on the bottom left corner of the screen in figure one, it depicts a randomized control trial consisting of 375 birthing people undergoing C-section. There was a statistically significant decline in postpartum depression at day three and day 14 in the study groups. Um, and the study group consisted of IV infusion of ketamine at 0.5 milligrams per kilogram versus the control, which you can see in the gray um, the gray section of it, which um, which has the gray bar. So you can see the two statistically significant differences at day three and day 14. Moving on to the bottom right corner of the screen, figure two is depicting the relationships between placebo, subcutaneous um, ketamine, which was at 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, which is the green line that you see there, um, an intravenous infusion of ketamine, which was 40 minutes IV infusion of 40 milliliters of ketamine, which can be seen in the blue line. It was seen that subcutaneous injection of ketamine showed the most significant reduction in the Edinburgh postpartum depression scale, which can be depicted in the top portion of the graph right here. So just to um, move on to our conclusions, um, they're really promising actually. So ketamine as an adjuvant um, does actually reduce the incidence of postpartum depression after a C-section. And we saw that in seven of the studies. So ketamine um, as an antidepressant and as an analgesic has a short infusion time and rapid clearance. So um, the adverse effects with a, with a statistically significant outcome, uh, sorry, statistically significant occurrence, we see headaches, uh, hallucinations, and dizziness. In addition to our findings, um, we think that more research is needed um, on the different protocols and the integration of techniques of ketamine use to improve its eff efficacy. And so ketamine was seen overall um, to have analgesic effects as it could reduce consumption of morphine and promote an overall greater quality of recovery in addition to the antidepressant effects. Um, and this also can be a future topic of research. Um, we know that there's an opioid epidemic, and so understanding that the use of ketamine can reduce um, the consumption of opiates, that is another opportunity of research for this. And finally, um, we would definitely love to see additional research being conducted on the frequency and the severity of the side effects of ketamine at varying dosages, um, as well as the effects on the socioeconomic stress levels 
which we briefly did touch on in our presentation. So that's all we have here in our presentation. Um, thank you so much again, like Naomi had said in her presentation as well, for allowing us to share with you guys just a little insight on how um, psychedelics can be used in the field of women's health. And thank you, um, Jalen and Naomi, for both of those posters, along with all of our other student presentations um, who were who were shared with us during this time section. Um, this now concludes day one of our student presentations, and we will be taking a small break and start back up at 2.15 with Dr. Ballantyne. Um, and then another presentation at 3.30. Um, if you have any questions for um, Jalen um, or Naomi, um, just throw it in the chat and I'll just have them stick around for a couple minutes. Um, thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. I hope you had a nice break. Uh, we have two more presenters today. And before I introduce our next speaker, I will invite everyone to complete the attendance form before logging off. There are some questions in there about uh, which speakers you attended um, and, and some room for constructive criticism. So please do click on the link in the chat box uh, before you are done for the day. And uh, so now it is my, my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Galen Ballantyne. Uh, Galen Ballantyne is a resident physician in psychiatry at SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University in Brooklyn, uh, currently pursuing research into hallucinogenic drugs with an interest in the phenomenology of acute drug experiences. Uh, Dr. Galen's work attempts to bridge patients' unique narrative experiences to biological measures with the ultimate hope of using biofeedback to assist clinicians with the modulation and enhancement of psychedelic therapy. This research combines several scientific strategies, including the application of artificial intelligence to detect patterns in natural language descriptions of psychedelic journeys. Um, and not to steal his thunder at all, but I think this work is so important and fascinating because so much of our current evidence is based on very simple, you know, circle and number surveys. And this adds an entirely new dimension to how we can analyze people's experiences. Uh, so we are extremely happy here to welcome this wonderful clinician and innovative researcher to the Rowan Virtuous Psychedelic Medicine Conference, Dr. Ballantyne. Uh, welcome, welcome. And you know, we'll just make sure your microphones work in. Uh, say hi, and we'll. And if you'd like to share your slides from your end, uh, we'll get this party started. Great. Thank you so much. Um, that's that was a beautiful summary of what uh, I'm trying to uh, get into here. So I appreciate that, and um, I'm really delighted to be here with everybody and to meet you here and share what I've been working on. So I'm trying to share. Uh, already did something's not working. Let me give it another go here. Open system preferences. Okay. So your sound is perfect. And, um, if you get frustrated on your end with sharing, just let me know and I can share the slides here in advance at your command. Click to lock. Okay. I think. I, I, I hope this works. Grant access and system permissions. I've just never heard of that. Okay. Um, so, okay. I have to quit and then come back on. Can you? Okay. Uh, would you rather, I think I'll just share from my end, if that's okay. Can you do it on the Google slide? With um, the, so I can click through the animations or. Um, let me think for a second. Do you want to just uh, leave and come right back if you think that's okay? I think this will be better. Okay, sounds good. We'll 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 hold court here for a moment. Um, so if anybody has questions for the committee, they want to throw in the chat. Uh, we're, we're, we'll we'll be happy to entertain you for a few moments while we get this uh, technicality sorted out. <laughs> I, I, I can get that. Oh, Gallon's back on, so. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, no problem.
Okay, we're making progress. I see yeah, your you screen. See. Do you have the natural language slide? Perfect. Awesome. Full screen looks good. Beautiful. Okay. All right. The floor is yours. Have fun. Thank you. And um, so here I'm going to pull up, just get everyone's face on the screen. And um, so my it, research kind of direction begins with this uh, observation that there's something really important about the acute psychedelic state. Um, you know, we have all of these different molecules that are being investigated to treat a variety of different mental health conditions. Um, and they're showing that, you know, these durable and robust effects after only a handful of acute uh, experiences. And early on in this second wave of research, they noticed that the subjective qualities of that acute experience do appear to correlate with or perhaps even modulate the clinical effect of the therapy. And so with dozens of different hallucinogenic drugs or psychedelic drugs, how do we um, go about matching drugs to disorders or symptoms? And ultimately, how knowing that the acute experience is so critical, how can we optimize the delivery of these medications and optimize the nature of the therapeutic container through time in a way that is optimal and, and driven by the data that we have. And so with that in mind, we embarked on this um, attempt to harness the use of natural language rather than, as Jesse said, rather than questionnaire based subjective measures to build rich representations of the subjective experience. And with these kind of more uh, uh, using the natural language rather than questionnaires, and we can also, one, since uh, natural language is uh, amenable to uh, basically statistical analyses that are, we can um, ultimately tether the uh, patterns we find in the word use of subjects to through the drugs and their receptor profiles to uh, the physiology of the brain, which also, you know, unlocks the possibility to um, really optimize their use in a clinical setting in the long run. And so with that kind of focus in mind, we, we published uh, one paper last year, and then we have another paper on the back burner. And I'm gonna go through both of the contents of those papers. And so, Probably this has come up already, but early on they found, you know, this so-called mystical experience correlates with uh, decreases in symptoms of depression and anxiety in patients. The sense of unity, dissolution of ego, collapse of space, time, overwhelming love. And uh, Griffiths then published more recently another study in which he found that in uh, Kind of a dose dependent manner, the uh, increase of other um, aspects of well being were uh, correlated with the presence of the mystical experience as well. So, this is sort of um, one subjective quality that we know appears to, to be really significant in modulating the therapeutic effect. So, um, that in terms of how the drugs function in the brain, we know some, we do know some things, and it appears that um, through the, with two A agonists anyways, uh, we, we can isolate in those pyramidal neurons, their modulation, um, increasing the excitability, ultimately leads to a richer repertoire of connectivity motifs as measured by the MRI, functional MRI, and, um, while the details of all of that are um, kind of uh, still being fleshed out, it is clear that there seems to be a sort of rebalancing between the top-down uh, executive function that filters out and makes sense of sti sensory stimuli and a sort of unleashing of uh, latent sensory possibilities. And so that's a theme that we are kind of having in the back of our mind as we 
I bridge phenomenology to uh, uh, neurobiology using the method I'm about to describe. Um, and so this is sort of a reference to the previous research into acute states, which shows, you know, they, they essentially uh, using survey data identify five fundamental dimensions, and then you can do a factor analysis and kind of tease apart more nuanced um, aspects of the experience. And, 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 and essentially, this image is just meant to show that while each drug has its own particular flavor uh, of subjective effects, and they, over, they do overlap with each other in significant ways, but they also have their, you know, so for example, here in blue, you can see LSD, a lot of elemental imagery, kind of fractal geometry, um, less uh, of the um, dissociative effects that you might see with ketamine, less of the blissful state with MDMA. And um, so this is just, this is sort of what the questionnaire um, approach can show us about the, the, the kind of subjective fingerprint of each drug. Um, now, our, I'm just going to keep the clock on, our paper, our first paper, uh, we, instead of, you know, most studies are limited to a drug or maybe two drugs in dozens of subjects, and they complete questionnaires in a, in a rigorous clinical env uh, experimental environment. But in our uh, study, we get, since it, we were able to just essentially scrape pre-existing troves of data, we were able to look at 27 different hallucinogenic molecules and examine over 6,000 uh, human uh, freeform reports of describing their experience. And uh, we then we can look at the drugs uh, interacting at 40 different receptor subtypes and isolated to 1200 brain regions, a, a certain, you know, classic brain atlas uh, parcellation. And so these are sort of where we're coming from. The data sets we used, first of all, we went to Arrowid. Uh, many of us may have encountered this at various points in our life, but it's a really special resource where people describe in great detail their uh, drug experiences. And uh, it's, a, it's online and free for anyone to use. Uh, another, the, the second is the PDSP at UNC has an amazing collection of uh, receptor uh, data, uh, receptor affinity and some functional data for lots of drugs. And so we were able to pull uh, the data we needed for those 27 drugs from there. And then finally, Alan's Atlas is, uh, they, they essentially uh, dissected a series of human brains and then, uh, or, you know, slice them and, and probe them for the presence of uh, uh, RNA for different receptors. Therefore, they were able to kind of reconstruct the uh, 3D distribution of all these different receptor subtypes in, an, in a normal human brain. And so these are the three data sets we were, we were drawing from. And now I'm going to kind of go through each one a little deeper. Uh, once, once again, these test, the testimonials have such rich description of the subjective state. Instead of, at, you know, a, a researcher-driven question with this sort of rating scale that really limits, oh, is it like, my, did I, the certainty of an ultimate encounter, of an encounter with ultimate reality is like, oh, that's a three or a four, like, and then, you know, how, how, uh, what are we losing in that? I mean, I, I think there are certain advantages to questionnaires, but I think there's also a lot that is lost in in that approach. And so instead, we're really excited to have the possibility now of using these user-generated testimonials, um, which are really unconstrained and uh, subjective with, with just so much information uh, contained within. By the way, if anyone has questions along the way, please do interrupt. I would, uh, but otherwise, I do have a lot to cover. So at the same time, I'll, I'll keep going. But uh, happy to be, uh, you know, engaged along the way. Um, 
so here we go. This is uh, just to show you know, Arrowhead. You may you may know this. These are the Arrowhead people. God bless them. And um, this is just you know a peek inside these uh, rich uh, language descriptions, colors I can't name, grasp the size of the universe in a new way, uh, tearing apart the fabric of reality. Um, you know, rainbow snakes winding majestically in an intricate ballet. Um, that's, you know, there's thousands of these reports. And so uh, that's on the subjective side. Now, coming over to the biological side, we uh, explored a wide variety of drugs, including phenethylamines, tryptamines, ketamine, salvia. Um, we also looked at ibogaine and um, it was it, we were essentially trying to uh, for each of these drugs. There's a receptor affinity value uh, average PKI at each receptor. So that's uh, that data was 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 fed in. Um, the, in the back of our mind, we're like, what receptors are actually causing these experiences to happen? You know, a lot of attention is paid to the 5-HT2A receptor with good reason, because if you block it, most of the effect is ob obliterated. So, um, well, what then explains the difference between different uh, psychedelic drugs if they're all acting through the same receptor? And there's really two main explanations. Um, on the one hand, it's possible that uh, there is some functional selectivity, as in downstream intracellular pathways could be selected for by different ligands on the, on the extracellular side. Uh, so it could kind of tickle the receptor in, in a unique way. But another possibility, and they're not mutually exclusive, is that um, the array of other uh, receptor affinities that these drugs are interacting with are um, sort of together uh, adding up to a total effect that is <clears throat> not just due to the 5 he 2 a So it's the, the whole fingerprint of, of receptor actions could be endowing that drug with its uh, particular flavor. That's uh, another possibility. And Leon Lenin credence to that is we know that some of these hallucinogenic drugs don't really interact with the 5 he 2 receptor at all. You know, sal salvias, kappa opioid, ketamines, more, more MD N MD <laughs> NMDA, and I, uh, and so on. And so, uh, with that in mind, you know, so this is a way of kind of visualizing what we're talking about is we have all these different main, we known hallucinogenic receptors, let's say, and we have different drug classes that kind of interact with those. Um, and then you have Ibogaine, which comes in and interacts with, uh, a whole variety of them. It's just kind of this promiscuous hallucinogenic drug. Um, and, and then, you know, that's not even to mention all of these other receptors that aren't themselves considered hallucinogenic, but may play some role in uh, contributing to the psychoactive effect. And so Sasha Shulgin famously um, described the, that there must be some kind of underlying harmonics to the drug effect that can some under you know being you might be able to do some kind of Fourier transform to break apart what these uh, more basic units of uh, drug action are and that's kind of what we're trying to do. Uh, the third one is the um, three D cortical atlas uh, from Alan's atlas. I already talked about that. So our our computational pipeline. On the, on the one side, you have these experience reports, you do some pre-processing, and then that's fed into the CCA. Uh, and on the other side, we have the receptors, and that's also fed into the CCA, which is essentially um, a way of identifying patterns of correlation across two linked data sets. So you have these two data matrices, and then you do a factor analysis on their correlation. Um, and then finally, once we have pulled out these underlying factors of correlation, we can map those uh, underlying uh, factors to uh, specific brain regions using the receptor affinities. Um, okay, 
I'm not going to get into too much of the technical st parts of it because it's all in the paper, but um, I, I think that the takeaway is, is just trying to think of um, how, let's say, um, the big five personality traits. You have um, these surveys they did, and then they took all the data and they subjected it to a factor analysis to find what are there any, um, what are the kind of most, what are the items that explain the most variance in the whole data set? And each of those vectors has two poles and it's sort of, you know, introversion, extroversion, or, uh, you know, openness or the opposite of that. And so I think uh, it's, it's, that is exactly the way to think about the factors th that are spat out by our algorithm, except ours are composed not just of words, but all of words and receptors. So each factor has two poles, and each pole has both receptor affinities and a weighted list of words. Um, and then, so you take those, so here's a weighted list of words for one factor, kind of two ends of that one, you know, vector, and it's accompanied by a uh, weighted list, sorry, a weighted list of receptors. And uh, so those receptor weightings can be used to map where those uh, subjective qualities were, the, where the, the receptor affinities that are associated with those qualities are expressed in the 3D cortex. And what we're left with is eight, we call it the elite eight. Uh, we didn't say that in the paper, but I don't know what to call them, but they're like eight, you know, uh, kind of uh, statistically significant receptor experience factors. Um, and I'll just show a couple because we could really get bogged down. But the first is um, this, uh, I'll just go to it. Yeah. So the first, and most explanatory underlying uh, structure is this, uh, di um, I guess you'd call it like a tension or a dichotomy or a relationship between these perceptual phenomena on the one hand and these more um, transcendent, expansive, mystical phenomena on the other side. So in red, you'll see visuals, nausea, sleep, uh, sleep affects our stomach, uh, music, you know, auditory, headache, pre. So it's all interoceptive and extraceptive phenomena that kind of get captured by the, this uh, algorithm. And they just spit out, that's one pole. And on, on the other side of this dominant factor are reality, seconds, universe, space, eyes, consciousness, breakthrough, existence, entity, uh, fear, alien, beings, whispers, spirit. So <clears throat> I hope that kind of comes through and it requires a little bit of almost like a literary analytic ear to make sense of these, uh, you know, these terms that are just spat out, you know, it's reading all thousands of testimonials and identifying these salient words that are um, that are linked to a, a weighted array of receptor affinities. And so each drug has a relationship to both poles. Some drugs are anti-correlated with a pole versus the other. And um, so DMT, salvia, 5-MeO, ketamine, ibogaine, those came those in our analysis popped out to be the more associated with what I want to call the mystical type experience, which is obviously clinically kind of at least potentially relevant. And, um, in, you know, an interesting array of, of receptors, 5-HT7, which has been kind of thought people have been uh, thinking about for a while, kappa opioid, 5-A wasn't expecting, D1. But what's really exciting is that the 5-HT2A receptor which we know is associated with uh, visual hallucinations, basically, is uh, associated with the perceptual side. And then furthermore, if you look a little deeper, you'll see uh, once, we, we, once we take this weighted receptor blend and we project it onto the cortex, 
both sides simultaneously. The, the red is associated with these yellow. You can see the scale of intensity. So these 5-HT2A receptor in the visual cortex associated with visual phenomena, and that was just popped right out of the analysis. We um, were very pleased to see that because it aligns with our expectations. Um, on the other side of the coin here, we have uh, you know, the mystical type phenomena, a whole other set of receptors, and fascinatingly, it was associated with uh, the anterior cingulate cortex, which is the kind of central node of the salience network, which itself is sort of is, is associated with mystical experience in certain studies. And also, uh, yeah, it, it sort of modulates between the more internally oriented default mode networks uh, mentation and then the more externally oriented uh, um, you know, executive function. So it's sort of mo it's sort of this uh, gateway or you know fulcrum between the inner and the out and the outer, and that is sort of what collapses in, under psychedelics. And so to see that uh, region highlighted was also very interesting. Um, now this is there are whole, there are eight of these, so I'm not going to go through all of them. Oh, I forgot I did I had to, all these circled. But another, the second one was uh, kind of fun to look at too. So, uh, let's see how much time I've used. About twenty-five minutes. Okay, we're good. So the uh, auditor. So this this experience factor, um, receptor experience factor is kind of what we're calling them. Was uh, on the one side was really this distillation of auditory phenomena: auditory sound, pitch, voices. Hearing tinnitus, <laughs> ears here. Uh, so it's really consistently auditory stuff, and um, the uh, it was associated with DIPT, which is this unique auditory hallucinogen, and uh, ammonia popped up, which is used in the process of kind of bathroom bathtub, I guess DIPT making, or maybe even in the lab. I don't know, but the point is, it was also uh, associated with receptor expression of um, uh, of, of uh, serotonergic ex receptors in the auditory cortex. So we had auditory phenomena, a known auditory hallucinogen popping out in the auditory cortex. And um, on the other side were more emotional phenomena. And uh, so we could go on and on. And there were several uh, confirmatory findings and you know, tantalizing possible leads on how other receptor systems might work, built in, you know, coming out of these eight factors. I'll just show you one more in the interest of time. I thought this one was gorgeous because it shows this um, relationship between these euphoric uh, terms on the one side, and then all of these, you know, heart terror, death, fear, panic. On the other, and um, five meo DMT was on the <laughs> terror side, uh, while um, some uh, uh, phenethylamines and ketamine was on the euphoric side. And I think the interesting thing to remember is like every single drug has a ranking in all eight factors, so it, we can't get too reductive about thinking about one factor as sort of at a time um, as explaining. Uh, because in other factors, certain aspects that you might, you know, kind of are, are captured. Uh, so, anyhow, that, I guess, let me just pause and say, does anyone have any questions about this part? Because I'm going to go on to the next paper. Um, so, I, I have a question, uh, Dr. Ballantyne. How confident are you and your team that these eight factors are... Um, you know, true. Um, and do you think that, you know, follow up studies are going to find 12 factors or fewer factors? Or do you think that these general categories uh, have have, you know, some solid integrity to them? I, I love the support you find on the neural correlates, but I'm curious what your prediction is for future research. Yeah, absolutely. Such a such a great question. I, I think um, I do believe that especially the first few factors will be reproduced in future studies because um, as we were uh, 
analyzing the data, they no matter what parameters we changed, the, the same ones kept popping up. And so I think that at least in this data set, those truly are kind of deep structures that are, are real. Um, I would say though that uh, this is a very biased data set. It's we call like ascertainment bias people. It's a very self-selected group that posts on Arrowhead. So I think you got to take all that with a grain of salt. Um, but I think that putting all that aside, when you do have such a scale of data, the signal, it's, it's a question of the, the noise and the signal. And I think that we, the fact that we have such uh, confirmatory findings with the neurocorrelates suggests to me that there is something about these uh, factors that is, is solid. Um, and then we just have one more question in the chat uh, before you move on to the next part of your presentation uh, from uh, Mahindra Bandari. Was there any usage of AI, I'm assuming that's artificial intelligence, to categorize the reported experiences into the factors like sentiment analysis? Um, that's coming up next. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. All right. That's a good student who asked the question That's to drive it. the presentation forward. Perfect. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> fantastic. So um, I'll get right to that. Um, uh, okay. So, yeah. After doing that project, there were a few kind of things that were bothering me. Like, you know, there's, I, I really think that uh, the, the way these acute experiences unfold is super dynamic through time. And when we do, whether it's survey data or these narrative, uh, natural language analyses, we are looking at an average of this, uh, roller coaster ride. And I think there's something to be said for the possibility that it's the trajectory of the experience itself that could uh, proved to have uh, therapeutic value, um, that there may be kind of temporal motifs that themselves are therapeutic or not, depending on the situation. And with that in mind, um, we, uh, and then also we wanted to just expand the repertoire of drugs, because on Arabic we got antipsychotics, uh, benzodiazepines, opioids, methamphetamine, cocaine, like all these recreational and pharmaceutical drugs that are in reality being used alongside in combination with these drugs and probably will be in the future. So why not create an overarching language of uh, psychopharmacologic uh, effects? And so that's what we proceeded to do. So yeah, the idea is, you know, not only are there these extremes of, of, of terror and euphoria and mis mystical union, but there's this sequence, you know, there's a, you can, you kind of go down into the underworld, like I'm, you know, uh, Joseph Campbell style, and then uh, are obliterated and reborn. Uh, that's kind of an, uh, so one pattern that happens. And, uh, you know, that resonates also with Stan Groff's uh, deep par uh, birth perinatal matrices that people I, there's people mention his name a lot, but I'm not sure how often people discuss this, um, the way that in which he viewed these states as linked in a sequence, a sort of a developmental sequence that is, uh, might be valuable when navigating those uh, psychedelic states to, to kind of consider that, that, that sequence and those trajectories. Um, another thing is we know that P, there's, there's experimental evidence showing that it's not the absolute, um, for example, in the ice bucket test, they put people's eye, hands in the ice and they, it was uncomfortable and they, they ended it either abruptly or they slowly warmed the hand. And although, uh, and they've done this with pain, with other phenomena, and they find that it's not the absolute kind of quantity over time of pain. It's rather the way it, the peak and the end that are remembered as salient. And um, uh, people basically prefer a more gradual warming up. And so 
you kind of have to break it down into the, 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 the experiential self and the part of you that remembers and reconstructs a narrative of what happened. And um, so with all that in mind, we decided to use uh, a natural language model called BERT. And uh, it, it comes kind of pre-trained on this huge set. So it's like fluent in language, but then you kind of got to fine tune it on. Um, uh, uh, well, what we did was essentially we um, we used uh, these uh, sets of data that have human tagged emotions. Now there's 20 eight different emotion, emotional dimensions that were, uh, it was trained on. And then, uh, and, and we used it for all 52 of those drugs. Now we have over 10, 11,000 reports. And that was the sort of the, so, so once again, we, so for all 52 drugs, we did the same CCA to trace it to uh, receptor expression in the brain. But this time we also just took the uh, semantics themselves and um, tracked uh, the presence or at, well, I'll show you now. Um, so we did, we redid the CCA for all 52 drugs, right? Now, uh, it really broke down to the most explanatory factor you can see was on the one hand, a lot of somatic phenomena uh, associated with cocaine and, and other, uh, and, and opioids. And then the psychedelics were associated with visual and beauty phenomena. And so this was sort of the, the primary fissure in this collection of drugs. But now we also added these um, BERT model analyses. So we have um, basically uh, in Arrowhead, there are tags for each post. So we used that metadata, these tags to, uh, we could track sort of the presence or absence of uh, those characteristics through time. Uh, so we kind of chop each report up into segments and then independently test each segment for the presence or absence of the tag associated phenomena, but then also those 28 different emotions I told you about. And then I really want to just focus on the, 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 the right most panel, sorry, um, birdament we call it. This is the uh, detection of, see, see all 28 of those emotions. And then we, we used uh, movie reviews to order them in uh, sort of what we call a hedonic tone spectrum. So movies that were positively reviewed, uh, you know, if the, the more they contain admiration, we kind of, we, we put that, the, the, we sorted it that way through the algorithm. So uh, movie reviews with annoyance were on the bottom and admiration at the top. And so that's sort of, this will be the way we visually structure the data. Uh, but once again, we not only can test the presence or absence in a relative way, but we can test it through time as a trajectory. So you can see um, the trajectory of sadness goes down with some of these antidepressants. Um, the trajectory of love is by far highest with MDMA, and it has a peak in the middle and then a peak at the end. So that's nice uh, for the peak end rule. Um, and I'm I'm gonna. Oh yeah, I just want, here you go, love. Uh, it's just beautiful. And so these are all the drugs we looked at and these are their love rankings. And even as you might expect, so like uh, haloperidol at the bottom, no, no offense to Haldol, but uh, that's what it is. And um, MDMA, uh, just to break it down a little more, MDMA shows, if you look at the, its hedonic tone spectrum, it's really top loaded. In other words, it has high values for the positive felt sentiments, where it has negative values for the negatively felt sentiments. Um, joy, it was on the, it was very high with joy, very low with disgust a across the, you know, time uh, of the experience. Um, now, what's cool too is you can sort of Look, you can analyze by drug class or individual drug. And so look at the left panel here, breaking down the psychedelics into phenethylamines and tryptamines and LSD, you'll see that uh, there are interesting and somewhat intuitive differences. For example, phenethylamines, mescaline, 2CB, high on amusement, uh, sorry, yes, high on amusement, and uh, highest on admiration 
and it has excitement and gratitude is also higher than the others. Whereas LSD um, is the highest on amusement and also very high in curiosity. Whilst tryptamines like DMT, psilocybin kind of went out in terms of surprise. And so, you know, you can sort of think about and, and start to really create these subtle textured differences between the drugs, uh, even, among, even among similar drugs. Where and then on the uh, and then you can compare them. Like see here on the bottom right panel, relief. The opioids are really high on relief, highest for sure. While but and and but they're really low on curiosity. And surprise. Um, and then you have something like salvia, which is really high on curiosity, and even uh, realization and certainly surprise, but it's also very high in confusion along with PCP. And so you have uh, this whole new language to evaluate the subjective effects of these drugs through time and also statically over here on the left, you can see that's just like an overall kind of value. Uh, so if you break it down in terms of classes, this, this is a critical slide. I really want you guys to look at this. Um, so we organized it, uh, by drug class and we ordered it from kind of drugs that emphasize the ne sort of negative hedonic tone to more neutral or balanced ones, all, all the way to the ones that emphasize the highest, uh, end of the hedonic tone spectrum. And so, and obviously in tactogens, I'm talking MDA, MDMA, kind of were the kings of the, of the, uh, um, you know, positive end. And, oh, what did I do? Okay, ah, then, uh, yeah, antidepressants, very uh, much associated with negative feelings. Obviously, this is confounded by the fact that people who are depressed are taking them. But, you know, that's, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of these kinds of, these are totally uncontrolled data. But it's a huge amount, so you're seeing some, I believe, you know, really interesting signal coming through. And then you have, uh, you know, hallucinogens. Well, what we're calling we, the nomenclature is a mess. But the point is that uh, psychedelics and hallucinogens are more on the positive end of the hedonic tone spectrum. But they also are um, contain, you know, some have the possibility for difficult uh, experiences. Uh, whereas stimulants, you know, a lot of anger here. Look, see, stimulants, anger. <laughs> uh, and you don't have anger with the uh, intactogens or psychedelics nearly as much and so on and, on and so forth. And, you, you know, this, there is just so much information in this chart that uh, I, won't, I can't even really crack into it adequately, but I just wanted to focus on that. Now, this, this uh, slide is looking at the tags. So we're looking at the, you know, the Reddit uh, curators kind of go through each post and tag it with different things. And you can track that. You can like learn, it can learn how to detect that and then it can track it through time through each report. And so um, in tactogens, once again, admiration. Oh, no, no, now we're comparing. Sorry, that's from the, the sentiment analysis. And on the right panel is the uh, tags. So if you look at the tags, the antidepressants, you know, they, they look really good. They start super high on the depression and they just uh, go down significantly. Um, and you can, uh, so these are all just different parts, ways of breaking them up into different drugs. Um, and uh, addiction, habituation, stimulants go up over time, makes sense. Uh, <clears throat> mystical experiences are dominated by uh, the psychedelics um, and so on and so forth. Um, all right, now, one other thing I wanna say is just that we, so we took these three pathways of analyzing the data in this one paper, we, we had the sentiment analysis, we had the tag analysis, and then we had the CCA that we, you know, we're re-performing on a, on a larger data set. One of the things that blew my mind was that there was a striking convergence 
between the different approaches, although they had, you know, were operating completely independently. Okay, what do I mean by that? Um, okay, so on the left side, we go back to the CCA. The CCA showed this, 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 really, if you look at the words, depression, doctor, pain, school, addicted, uh, sleep, months, days, prescription, week, it's this mundane suffering. Is how, that's how I'm thinking about it. Um, just this quotidian, you know, just slow slog through time and unpleasantness. And I feel like it's really capturing that. And then all these recreational drugs, cocaine, amphetamine, oxy, M, you know, are, are, and MDMA pops up there too. Eek. Uh, but it's um, associated. So this is capturing sort of one L end of the human experience of the human, you know, psych psycho farm experience anyways. And, um, and then the other side is really transcendent stuff like reality, psychedelic, universe, colors, eyes, beautiful, intense. Um, and so it, I think of it as like lucid, beautiful phenomena compared to the mundane suffering. And um, so that was the primary divide in the most explanatory factor of the CCA in our second paper. Now, with that in mind, if you look at the, this other panel, this represents a sort of average comparison. Oh, God, it's so small. Oh, no, no, no. Look at curiosity first, okay? Curiosity here. Um, the psychedelics and the intactogens and the dissociatives, ketamine mostly, these, and also PCP, uh, these uh, were, if you look at this, it's this is called like dynamic time warping. You're looking at the um, w w which of these were most correlated in terms of magnitude and their trajectory, and it's sort of an index between those correlations. And you see that the psychedelics have higher values for curiosity. Those that's why it's red. So all these psychedelics, hallucinogens, and tactogens have high values for curiosity compared to the. Um, the stimulants, antipsychotics, antidepressants, and and opioids, right? Makes sense. Um, and the inverse is true. The the second the 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 those latter drugs have lower values for curiosity compared to these. So that's how you kind of read these dynamic time warping um, uh, diagrams. And what's striking to me is if you look at there's this pattern that emerges. So this red cluster on the right means it's higher for psychedelics and intactogens and ketamine, right? So curiosity is higher on, on those. Admiration is higher. Amusement, surprise, realization, all higher. And it's the same grouping of drugs as you have on the left. So essentially, once again, all of these kind of the more inspired, imaginative, transcendent elements of the human experience are captured by sentiment analysis and associated with the psychedelics in the using BERT, but also resonate with the CCA findings. And while on the on the other hand, uh, for these other you know uh, recreational drugs and and uh, psychiatric meds, you know, we have. Uh, so when you see blue on the top right, you mean it's associated with those drugs. So disappointment, disgust, anger, sadness, nervousness, embarrassment, annoyance, grief, and remorse. Um, but also caring. I, so something to think about. Um, I I think that's sort of the 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 last kind of data that I wanted to show, and then I'm going to show. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little, just sort of how I'm thinking about what all this means, and um, just to recap. We can identify latent patterns of subjective experience using these natural language uh, tools. We can map these patterns to specific brain regions using CCA. That may that's probably uh, that hopefully will will enable us to um, really 
gain some insight into the meaning of all of these functional connectivity studies. You know, we're bringing the subjective, the phenomenology, and we're bringing it right down into specific brain structures. And I think that it's not directly, uh, um, but it could it could be used to to kind of guide future studies or um, really think about what those brain regions are doing and what it means to modulate them. Receptor experience factors may help explain alterations. Oh, that's what I was just saying. Um, yeah, uh, and then with the the uh, large language models, um, we can really tease apart this high dimensional emotional space and then project it through time to identify hopefully um, patterns of experience that are temporally uh, dynamic and associated with positive outcomes. But this would require perspective data collection. We are not there yet. We're, this is all, you know, we're just looking back at old data. But if we were able to collect a bunch of new data, who knows? It's not, probably the mystical experience has subtypes. There's probably other healing experiences that could be identified. I don't think MDMA, you know, I did the training, the MAPS MDMA training, and all kinds of stuff happens in there that is not at all, not explain, you know, just mystical experience. So just thinking about that. Um, yeah, no, I just said that already. <laughs> okay. And so this is sort of my thought about the future. If speaking of collecting perspective data, if we got an EEG, which is low and in, non-invasive, it could be designed so it's not such a bother, definitely not like an FMR. I mean, fMRI. Imagine being in an fMRI when you're on uh, LSD, God forbid. Um, but it, it does, it is useful, and I uh, commend the people who do it. But it's for, for collecting large scale data in a clinical situation, I think EEG is more appropriate um, and uh, better for the patient. Um, and the words, uh, so basically, we could, you know, have. Uh, natural language description of the experience that is parallel to a parallel data stream of natural language that goes along with the EEG. You have biometric data, heart rate variability, skin conductivity, uh, EKG, whatever you want, going on simultaneously. And across all, and then you have uh, music that is being played during the session. So what you can do is you can reconstruct using time points from the music that, have, that are played back to the subject, you can uh, reconstruct the um, subjective experience linearly through time, and then that would enable you potentially to identify using uh, you know, machine learning, you could identify EEG patterns that are predictive of certain subjective qualia that would then allow you potentially to use the music as a dynamic input into a neurofeedback system that, and, and you know, kind of steer the experience in a direction that will be optimally therapeutic based on prior collected data. Um, now, I, I think it's worth saying that there are some ethical issues that arise in this kind of scenario. And I, I don't even know, I, I'm really curious what you all think, because I'm just trying to wrap my mind around it. But I think there's one, you know, the one thing that come, one comes to mind is people are often need to go explore difficult material in the course of psychedelic therapy. And might we be find ourselves in a position where we're playing dissonant minor chord music to intensify temporarily a difficult experience and once you're in a situation like that, you sort of wonder whether you'll look back to that decades from now and think, oh God, what were we doing? Or is that totally reasonable? Like doing surgery, you gotta cut them open with the scalpel. I don't know. I think that it's an open question how to think about that. I think one, another big problem with our approach, uh, scaling it up would just be the danger of a biased data set that would be um, not only kind of make the uh, therapy uh, and software module less effective for certain people, uh, you know, for certain uh, groups uh, that aren't in the initial data set, but also there's this, this kind of 
creepy to uh, concern, you know, could we be kind of getting in a circular um, space of that, that would uh, cause us to perpetuate kind of our current ways of thinking instead of uh, allowing us to um, unlock the potential of the human spirit in the future? Um, so those are kind of some of my thoughts uh, and thank my collaborators, uh, SUNY Downstate, uh, Jesse Benzel, and, uh, and my family and, every, and uh, the universe. So here we are. Any uh, okay. questions? Wow, bravo. Um... I think our entire team here is just completely blown away. This like, I think we're all gonna have to watch that again to even begin to wrap our heads around it. Uh, you have such a unique perspective, and this research is so innovative um, and adds so much like texture and depth to how we can start thinking about these substances. Uh, I can't think of how many times I get asked, "Oh, is this patient a candidate for psilocybin or MDMA or ketamine?" And like. I don't think anyone really knows the answers to those questions. And this research is going to help answer some of those questions. Um, it's really beautiful. So let me think, do we have any questions here from the chat? Um, or anyone from the team questions, comments? Um, I think I do have one here. One thing while Jesse's pulling that up, um, I just really appreciated uh this like interesting way to look at this these experiences um i think that so often uh we discount the subjective because it can't be objective like oh it happened to you therefore like sure it happened to you whatever that's your experience but like didn't really happen like i this research is showing that like these things are actually lighting up in the brain where they're supposed to you know i think that gives some really interesting like credence to what people have been saying i mean for thousands of years have been happening to them but i think it's also cool because i mean think of the things you could do not even just psychedelically but just with therapy and you know what our ssris are like you can really this is really i'm yeah jesse said we're all like blown away i'm like need to sit down and look at this again <laughs> but really cool research and definitely like super new and not just like the same thing over and over again which i think is really thank cool. you thanks for saying that and i um yeah I, I i do think it's 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 really exciting uh, i'm glad i'm su glad it resonates with you guys and it makes sense you know um someone else put their hand up didn't i or maybe not he was a clap um, oh, so we, we do have one question that came from uh, one of our committee members, Jason. Um, do you have any kind of explanation or, or ideas around why seemingly similar molecules, such as uh, I think in one of the slides, uh, NMDMT and 5-MeO-DMT appear to be like kind of having like very different uh, patterns? Did, did you notice things like that, or, or do you have thoughts on why conceptually similar substances are having subjectively different effects? Right, right. So, so they, the, the molecule themselves are very, you know, mor morphologically, like, similar, and then they have these wildly different effects. I think it's really interesting, and that's, that was really the, the first question, like, what accounts for the difference between these different drugs? And I, I do go back to all, all I can say for sure is that it's most likely a combination of uh, bias signaling at these canonical psychedelic receptors, you know, bias signaling, meaning, you know, the same ligand can act at one receptor, but activate a different downstream pathway. And there's been a lot of research into this over decades that shows um, you know that that it's not like you have um it's not like the 5-HT2A receptor is on or off no it's it's uh th there are qual you know the way the drug binds to the receptor right it it gets in there and it 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 locks with it and in doing so it deforms the the shape of the of the receptor in such a way to kick off different intracellular ligands that activate separate cascades and 
So that's one component for sure. Uh, however, I do believe that there's a contribution of uh, the even non psychedelic receptors. If those are also being engaged simultaneously, then the whole brain, the, the, the global effect would be uh, conditioned by that to some extent. So this is something that would, can be studied, but I, I don't have the capacity to. And the truth is to get to the bias signaling business, you would need to do some very fancy uh, functional assays on dozens of drugs, testing dozens different downstream pathways and testing their, their, you know, how much they activate those. And that, that, that's going to take decades. So th that'll be a long time from now we get there. But I think that those are, the, I don't know if that helps because I don't know the answer, but those are my thoughts about it. Yeah, that that's beautiful. And uh, now the uh, chat is kind of like coming out of shock and awe and starting to pop off. Um, so, um, and before, before I indulge the audience, I'll indulge myself. And in response to the artificial intelligence question, I think a big part of the question to the, using artificial intelligence and therapeutic processes, do you trust the artificial intelligence? Do you trust the artificial intelligence to have a benevolent spirit towards, towards the human species? Um, and you almost get into like a Terminator, you know, situation with that, where I don't want the artificial intelligence to have a pharmacologic armament to control my psychedelic experience. And it decides I deserve unfathomable hell, you know, that would not be good. <laughs> so I can grow or something. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think, I think that's a very important question. Um, and now let me, uh, go to the, uh questions from our audience. So the first one is uh, Mahindra Bhandari. Uh, was there any inquiry into differences in categorizing experiences based on cultural or ethnic backgrounds? If so, how would that impact the results or the methodology? Of course, you know, different communities might use the same words in, to describe very different feelings. Um, so, so what are your kind of your thoughts on how we can tackle that aspect of this? It's, uh... That's a very interesting question, and I think um, the current the the data set on Arrowwood doesn't contain uh, information about the uh, ethnic or nationality uh, you know identities of the subjects. So uh, all I could say, I guess, is that I, I mean I think it's important to consider that moving forward, especially if we're going to be collecting perspective data of the of this nature um i think there's just culture is so complex and words uh are also used differently in different places as jesse said so i think one way of you know all i could say is when it comes to machine learning the more data the better so if we had uh, more information about who people are what not only biometrically but uh culturally uh that could be harnessed towards the effort to kind of uh customize therapy for for each individual patient you know i i i, I think that would be valuable I, I don't you know uh know exactly how it would look but but i i appreciate yeah that's a good that's a good thought Wonderful. Uh, just keeping the ball rolling while we have a, a couple more minutes here. Um, we have a question from Bill Hoffman. Have any of the correlations you have discovered between each drug and the mental states that this research suggests uh, that they induce pointed towards their diff excuse me, um, I'm just going to fix a typo here. Um, does this point towards we should use this drug for this indication, this therapeutic process, for example, targeting self knowledge for personal growth versus healing damage into personal relationships in group therapy? Um, are we able to draw any of those conclusions yet? Mm. Uh, so, so basically, so, sorry to, to summarize, it's like, what about, uh, what can we say about the potential for using these uh, therapies in groups? Based on the data, is that what uh, or or rather, um, if we know that MDMA has a particular affinity for producing a feeling A, 
um, oh. how easily will we translate towards clinically? This person has a huge feeling a deficit. So let's give them this one. Mm. Um, and is it going to be that simple? Well, I, I don't think it'll be quite that simple, but I do think that's kind of the, the idea is. Ultimately, like, I, I think that. You know, uh, people, different people are, are need different things to grow and develop at any point, wherever we are in our, you know, in our maturation. And I think that use it. I do think that using natural language could really help us identify nuanced, you know, little differences between what one person and another person might need to grow at that time. I just don't, I think that it's not, it's often the case that it's not what you think, you, you know, you think, oh, they just need to do this. But in fact, in order to get to that point, they need to actually go through a whole different experience. And that's where I think the trajectory becomes important mm. and uh, the time dimension, um, because it, it it's it's a uh, it's complicated journey oftentimes of growing and healing. It's not, you know, like yeah, it's, it's a so bit more of a it's a it kind of it's a circuitous path towards exactly. feeling a. It's not just oh, drug A makes feeling A. Let's give you drug A. It's how are we going to get there, and what's the music going to sound like too on the way. Yeah. <laughs> And what's, what's, what is it that's holding you back from feeling this way? Like, I'm sad. I want to feel happy. I need to get angry sometimes, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's you know, like, for example, maybe talking about a friend, but not just kidding. <laughs> you know? Um, okay, wonderful. So um, we actually, uh, I, I think that was all of our questions for now. Um, any final questions or comments from the team? This was wonderful. All right, everyone's happy and satisfied. Dr. Valentine, it was such a, such a wonderful pleasure to have you here today. And um, I wish you the best of luck in your future research and clinical endeavors. Thank you for inviting me and for your attention and participation. Truly appreciate it. Thank you. Farewell, thank you. Okay, um, so now we're going to have a very short break, just a quick 10 minutes um, before uh, at 3.30, we're going to have the wonderful Stefania Humphrey joining us for our final presentation of the day. The title of her speech is Osteopathy, Spirituality, and the Use of Psychedelics. I will see you all at 3.30. All right, everybody, welcome back. I'm excited to uh, introduce our final speaker of the day, Stefania Humphrey. So St Stefania Humphrey um, is a manual osteopath practicing classical and cranial osteopathic manual therapy and somatic psychotherapeutic modalities in the Bay Area, California. Her work is to relieve strain patterns from physical or emotional trauma and to repattern trauma in the body. Her hands-on approach is gentle yet effective. She completed her graduate graduate degree at BCom in London, UK in 2010 and has completed many postgrad trainings internationally since. To complete her holistic approach to treating the body, she places emphasis on post-treatment care, which includes mindfulness practice, healthy diet and exercise um, plan based on the individual's needs and goals. Stefania invests in continuing her education, working with her peers in various fields, such as DOs Maud Nerman, uh, Paul Lee, Ken Lossing, Mel Friedman, en energy worker, Dr. John um, Amaral, homeopath, John Melon, Melon, Melon Nook, and local Bay Area doctors and the therapists in private concierge medicine and at Stanford and UCSF. Stefania strongly believes, believes in and encourages her patients to work with a healthcare team, a core group of highly skilled and trained specialists who work together to help achieve optimal health. I'm personally excited to hear from this speaker because her work sounds a lot like um, a clinic that I worked at previously, so I'm very excited to hear her experiences. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me, first of all. And I just want to say I'm super impressed with all the guest speakers today and the content. Um, it's been really, really cool to be part of the whole day. 
Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I want to make a very clear distinction that I am a European trained osteopath. I'm not an American physician and I don't practice as one here. Um, I feel extremely fortunate to work with DOs here in the US. Um, it's, it's a real privilege to be able to work alongside of them with them. Um, so a little bit about my training. Um, in Europe, we're very traditional to what, you know, original osteopathic techniques are. And we base our careers and our profession around perfecting, perfecting that. So everything we do is palpation based. We use our hands to listen to the body and the more experienced we are, the more sensitive we become to being able to feel what's happening in the body. Um, I really love my job. I mean, I really love the, you know, being able, being able to be with patients or clients in such a proximity and just to be able to listen to their body and connect the dots for them with the symptoms that they have and the feelings that they have and the emotions that they have. It's really unique. Um, so, um, you know, my, I'm, I'm gonna take everyone into a little bit of a tangent from what we've been listening to so far. I'm gonna kind of move away from research and everything like that and, um, ask you as the listener to sort of shelve it and then just stay with, stay with what I'm sharing with you. Um, I want to share more about my practice, about my experience with, with my patients and, um, and kind of link it to the different topics, right? So um, spirituality and the use of psychedelics um, and you know how that really can become an amazing healing experience for someone. So most people come to my practice with some kind of pain, something that prompts them to want to seek um, you know, help. And often um, we have such exceptional medical care here and such brilliant doctors, but a lot of them are specialists in something. And the unique thing about osteopaths and the way that we're trained is that we get to look at the whole body as a unit. And if somebody comes in with a knee pain, we might be looking at the head and neck or might be looking at the feet, right? So, so I think often patients have gone to different specialists and are still kind of suffering with something. So they land on my doorstep and then I get to have this experience with them where we look at everything in conjunction. So um, let's say somebody does come in with knee pain. One of the first things we ask as osteopaths is why? Why is there knee pain in the first place? What happened? Why did that thing happen? Um, you know, maybe it is something as simple as a sports injury or something like that, but very often patients have symptoms that are unrelated to um, an event, right? Or sometimes pain can be in the back, but it could be originating from something else. Um, so this is the sort of exploration work that I do with each patient or client that comes in. Um, we are such a beautiful, complex being. And um, we have these amazing adaptive strategies and ways in which our body tries to create balance structurally, but also, you know, systemically. So there are so many things that we are completely unaware of that happen in the background for our body to sort of keep surviving as best as it can. Um, you know, a sort of typical case example that comes to mind that sort of expands on the the like vastness of what osteopaths can do is if somebody has say asthma or um a breathing restriction or a rib dysfunction or something like that um we we can treat that structurally like even a chiropractor might do that but there's so much more to that injury or that condition that we can look at so we can look at the autonomic nervous system we can look at what experience that person had throughout their life, um, you know, their their reactivity or sensitivity to their environment and so forth. And there's all these different ways that we can we can work with that person. Um, in, and then adjunctively, I would say, you know, if that person needs medical care, or medical treatment, that's super important as well. Um, coming back to the why question that osteopaths like to ask, um, you know, sometimes this this is where I personally feel it blends with spirituality and a lot of the textbooks in osteopathic 
work will often talk about cranial osteopathy and kind of the vitality in somebody's flow or their tissues. And it kind of starts to drift off into the realm of, you know, spirituality, soul, that kind of stuff. And a lot of people, I think, are like, whoa, 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 it's too very fairy. I don't understand this. Um, but I think fundamentally, all of us have this level of understanding. Yeah, like there's a difference between someone who's got vitality and someone who doesn't and someone who's got, you know, real energy versus somebody who's depleted. So we can understand it. Um, but this kind of takes me into, you know, why why do some things happen to some people? Um, and a lot of people, I think, will look for something to blame, right? So let's say um, somebody comes in with an elbow pain and they have been boxing for six months and they're like, well, it was boxing that was causing my elbow pain. Very likely that sounds plausible. You know, you can treat it structurally and off they go. But we're missing a massive chunk because, you know, it's more interesting to look at why is that person developing that issue in the first place. Um, there are, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go into some other like more extreme cases, but there are some super super interesting patterns in the human body that are there for a long time before they become expressed and a lot of them are linked to some kind of a traumatic experience now the mind is this brilliant brilliant survival machine and it will block out memories at its finest in order to protect us from feeling pain because none of us want to walk around feeling like we've been injured emotionally or physically at some point in our life so in order, in order to continue our, our day to day, the mind's like, oh, we're just going to delete that memory. But the body has a store of it, whether we're aware of it or not. And this is why often people will come to see an osteopath or a body worker or a somatic practitioner and they'll put their hands on them and they'll have a memory that they've forgotten about. They'll start crying about something or they don't even know why they start shaking. This happens a lot in my sessions with people. And, um, you know, so so. What's interesting about this is that we have often traumatic experiences. The mind forgets them, the body doesn't. It has imprints of those things and often will dictate our behaviors. And for example, the, if I go back to the boxing injury, boxing is a great way to release anger, but it can also bring up the anger in the body. And if there has been an incident in that person's past, that will lead them to those behaviors. You can trace it all the way back to the original trauma. That was what created that pattern in the first place. It's a little complex what I'm saying, but it's it's really, it, it's true. I see it in every single person that walks into my office. Um, so, um, yeah. Coming back to the um, the boxing injury, um, I'm thinking about a specific person for this for this one, and um, this is going to now start to go towards the the use of psychedelics, right? And I don't necessarily mean any kind of medicine work. There are some things we can do that give people an out of mind experience that doesn't involve using anything like that. Um, but um, and some of the sort of non uh, medicinal work that people do are things like breath work or spinning or rocking and things like that. So rocking, for example, is where you would either move the body back and forth gently, but quite firmly and same with the head. You can you can do that too. Um, spinning is literally just spinning until you sort of feel a bit dizzy. And then there's different types, many different types of breath work. Um, some are sort of more hyperventilative and that will, you know, as you keep going, people will start to feel like they go a bit numb or they, they lose, um, you know, they get tingly and things like that. And um, in this particular case, um, with this boxing injury, um, we did a variety of those things in session and he regressed actually into an infant and had his thumb in his mouth and was pressing quite firmly and it completely recreated his symptoms of his um, elbow pain. And so all of a sudden he said, oh my God, Steph, I can't believe that I was blaming this on boxing the whole time, but actually I've just been angry that I was left alone so much when I was a child and I was kind of holding, embracing myself, trying to self-soothe. And that was the original kind of anger that I've been holding on to, which then was expressed later in life. It's fascinating, right? <laughs> fascinating. 
So, um, so again, kind of, you know, I, I'm hoping to be, or at least share things that are somewhat inspirational so that we can all see how beautiful we are, how complex we are and how much healing capacity there is with, um, you know, being listening, um, you know, and having curiosity around what the person is bringing to you. Um, so, you know, the other thing I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about is, um, I mean, I, I consider it spiritual spirituality, because again, for me, that, that conjures up, um, you know, the whys, why do certain people have certain things? And so, um, another case I'm thinking of is a, a female, um, and she had, um, you know, pretty horrendous sexual abuse as a young teenager, um, and did a lot of work and a lot of therapy to kind of help her through that. Cause that was something that was really limiting her life. And this is another example of, you know, how an experience when we're younger will, will create a strategy. And the strategy, the strategy will lead to a behavior. And in her case, the, the strategy is people aren't safe. My body isn't safe because it, um, you know, I was disconnected from it and I had to, in order to survive that kind of sexual trauma. So, um, the behaviors then that sprung from that are, um, I don't want to take care of my body at all. Now you can imagine somebody who has that as a behavior will eventually have health issues, right? That's like a no brainer as I'm explaining it this way. So, um, you know, interestingly with this particular case, um, she developed Crohn's, uh, later in life and had no, no incidences of that in her family history or in terms of her, you know, um, her, her particular life or medical history. So we could look at it completely like, well, I guess that's just what happens to some people you know, we'll treat it medically and give it no more thought than that. But um, I'm more curious than that. So I thought, wow, here is an opportunity for a woman who's been disconnected from her body for so many years to finally, she's forced to listen um, to herself. And she's forced now to be like, wow, every time I eat this, I'm gonna, you know, have pain or have bowel issues or, you know, worse than that potentially. And, and of course, if you neglect something like uh, like Crohn's, you're you're going to get really pretty sick down the line. So, so in a way, this this condition turned into a gift and a blessing for her. Um, and luckily, she's she's the type of person who sees it that way too, um, with some resistance. But um, <laughs> but she's well on the mend, which is nice to see. So again, you know, why do certain things happen to certain people? It's it's sometimes a bit of an enigma and a mystery but there's certainly lessons for everybody there. And the more I, you know, I'm really amazed because when I speak to my patients, I sort of stopped trying to figure them out and instead ask them questions. And every single person knows exactly why they have something. Um, a girl came to me and she injured her ankle and I was like, why do you think it happened? She's like, I was, I wasn't paying attention. I've been in my head for the last six months. I'm working too hard and it's forcing me to slow down. Yeah. Okay. So most people can answer their own, their own issues and why they're happening in the first place. Um, so what else do I want to share? Um, I'm, I'm going to go in a little bit to, um, you know, why is are certain things like ketamine, for example, so incredibly profound? We, I'm, I'm gonna take a moment to appreciate our mind because our mind is really extremely powerful. And like I mentioned before, it will block out memories and, um, and we have layers upon layers upon layers of protective mechanisms that will prevent us from doing something that we consider dangerous, right? And so again, coming back to your day-to-day -day experience, growing up as a child, we will go through life having experiences that will determine what's safe and what's not safe. And that will then determine our behaviors later in life. Um, the mind will have so many reasons 
to prevent us from going into those really vulnerable places that no one wants to feel like helplessness or feeling alone or feeling, um, you know, hopeless. I mean, those, or honestly, feeling like you're a baby again. The one thing we all have in common is that we were all babies. We were helpless. We needed to be fed, carried, lifted, but not a single adult that I know wants to ever feel like that again. Um, so, so feeling vulnerable is the thing that our mind protects the most. Um, and we'll, we'll make people run for the hills from even going there. Now, um, when, when, you know, cause I'm, again, I feel really lucky that I work with psychiatrists who use ketamine therapy for all kinds of conditions, but primarily anxiety and depression. Um, when we use any kind of medicine work like that or psychedelic substances, um, you know, the mind, the mind will block and can potentially block. And I think it's silly for people to take anything like that without really respecting and honoring the protective parts in them, right? That's, I think, really important. And I'm going to stress over and over and over again that um, people need really good therapists or a good body worker or a somatic practitioner in conjunction with any kind of psychedelic treatment. Um, it's much more powerful. It's much more beneficial. I think I've, I've noticed that people get much better results because of that kind of support and containment that they have. Um, so, so, and, and herein is some of the gold, right? So we can do a lot of real good work with people not using anything psychedelic, but those traumas or sources of our behaviors and if we want to change someone, we really want to change their behaviors. Most, I mean, all doctors I know who work with diabetic patients, for example, will like, you know, I can't do the work for you. I can't make you to stop. I can't make you stop eating sugar or drinking sugar or whatever. So it's like, here's what you need to do now. Go do it. But but you can't make somebody learn a new language overnight. Like you can read all the books you want and you can learn about self care. But if there's something in you that is addicted to sugar, there's just no way you can break that pattern. And depending on how deep that goes is really where I find something like ketamine or other psychedelic substances extremely powerful. Because now people with permission from their mind can go deep into the source of why they're addicted in the first place and change that. Now, the way that I practice in, with my clients is I use a modality called IFS. And IFS is beautiful. I don't know if anybody here has ever used that or worked with that. No? Okay. So IFS is called Internal Family Systems, and it is a um, kind of very simple way to build relationship with relationships with parts of you inside of you. So if you consider yourself the adult you are today, but you're a combination of experiences that you've had over the span of your life so far, we might get stuck in younger versions of ourselves. So let's say at age 12, you had a biking injury and you never rode a bike again. That's still present in you today and you might still never wanna ride a bike again, but that doesn't mean that what happened in the past needs to limit your future, right? So, so IFS is this beautiful way of showing you your younger self that had that particular incident in this, scenario, it's the biking accident, and you get to compartmentalize it to the past and you get to build a relationship with yourself today. So you're building trust with yourself. So IFS is this incredible tool for people to build um, trust, honestly. And then with that, adding um, something like ketamine, for example, means you're at a much stronger place to go deeper to the sources of those traumas and then compartmentalize those to the past. So this is how I have seen mega shifts in people and people with chronic um, inflammatory conditions, um, chronic addictions, um, people who have tried anything and everything and still are like, I'm stuck or I'm 
you know, I'm never going to get rid of my pain or whatever. Um, and using this combination of work, so body work for sure, um, IFS or something that helps people understand their mind and work with their mind, not against their mind. I think luckily we've changed because it, we sort of used to not really respect the mind in, in treatment as much as we do now. Now we're like, okay, if there's resistance, let's work with the resistance rather than push it to the side. Um, so combining those aspects with and then adding um, any any kind of psychedelic substance can be extremely life changing in a very positive way. Um, and it's case by case, you know, I don't think it's necessary for everyone. Um, the the case I want to kind of mention that's been on my mind since I was preparing for this talk is um, a lady that I know who had, you know, very few um, memories of childhood. And I, I have actually a surprising number of, of patients who have sort of blackouts from their early childhood and have ironically got multiple, um, you know, physical issues and, and pain. And in this particular case, there's chronic inflammation, multiple joints, um, sort of rheumatoid arthritis was floating around in her in her case history, um, maybe thyroid issues. I mean, nobody could really point to anything. She was one of those like you're sort of here, you're sort of there. Um, social anxiety, um, a lot of, um, you know, brilliant, brilliant person, but but really struggling with any kind of social interaction. And again, with with this lady, I was like, wow, I think I think she'd had like maybe, I don't know, seven MRIs that year. Like, I mean, hundreds of medical tests by the time she came to see me. And my curiosity immediately went to, wow, like what happened in her childhood that would cause her to, you know, not remember anything. And we. Um, I worked with her very osteopathically, so really, you know, working with her whole structure, getting her nervous system to calm down and balance. Um, you know, after about three months of that kind of work, seeing her every two weeks, um, there was there was more emotional work that we started to do. So again, kind of more somatic um, therapy. And a lot of tears started coming, slowly memory started coming back. And then we introduced a little bit of breath work. And with the breath work, then there were flashes of some sexual abuse that had happened that started to come back. And now things got really interesting. At this point, I referred her to a trauma specialist who is a psychologist. Um, I, I kind of draw the line in terms of where I'm capable of helping somebody through. And this is why working with a village is so hugely important. Um, so her and I together were working with this with this lady and, um, you know, amazingly, we're able to get her to piece together all of the memories that had happened to her. And at the same time, all of her physical pain just started to melt away and she just started to change completely. Um, the, the, the trauma in her case was so bad that introducing um, ketamine created enough distance for her to be able to work with the younger part that was sexually abused, build a relationship without being overwhelmed by the emotions. And so this is another thing that I find really interesting when we're working with people is, you know, being sensitive to those points where we go into overwhelm and shut down. And that's enough for someone to run out the door and never come back and, or do any kind of therapy or treatment ever again. So, you know, with a willing with a willing patient, um, introducing something like that can really help space out their own perception of what happened and walk through that trauma and do the trauma work necessary to heal from that, resolve it, and then, um, you know, basically have a completely different life. And her outcome has been incredible. I mean, like I said, she's healthy, she's active, she's a completely different person at home. Her relationships have improved. Um, she's not taking any medication to kind of help her with social anxiety. So, you know, it took a long time, about a year and a half, but, um, you know, just, just the beauty of seeing all of that come together is great. And then again, the sort of spiritual component, why did she have to go through that in the first place? You know, those kind of questions of like, why do people do things to other people that are unspeakable? Um, that's a question I don't know if any of us can truly answer. 
but um you know if if some of us have to go through things to learn lessons to change and transform for the better then maybe maybe that's part of it i don't know maybe um so but yeah i think i think you know that that I have this enormous drive and, and you know, I'm, I'm very aware. I've done a lot of work on myself, a lot of trauma work, and I've traveled to Mexico and I've done all kinds of experiences with different medicine and psychedelic work over there. So um, I'm, I'm highly aware that I also have some trauma in my history and it's given me this like in a massive amount of, of energy to like end suffering in people because people who suffer a lot really do cause others to suffer. Um, or do really messed up things to each other. So that's my my mission in life is to sort of tackle tackle that. And the happier people are, the more compassionate they can be, the more patience they have. You know, the less they're going to do something that's that's going to cause pain to someone else. Um, but anyhow, um, that's kind of you know the majority of everything I feel like I wanted to share, and I want to sort of. There are questions out there if anybody has any questions for me directly um you know I, i'd love to get to know the everyone in the audience and and so forth i'm seeing some questions come through yeah thank you so much for that talk it was very interesting concept um and helpful for us to hear like how osteopathy and manual work can be related to these more spiritual ideas and everything like that. We go into a little bit of cranial, but mm -hmm. um, it's definitely not the focus here for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we do have a few questions in the chat. I can go ahead and read them for you mm -hmm. if you'd like. Our first question is from one of our committee members, Jesse Benzel. Could you elaborate a little on working with resistance? Yes, Jesse, I can. So, um... Let's give an example of um, you go see a therapist for something like, I don't know, totally made up here, but like your brother has substance abuse issues or something like that. And you're like, I finally had it. I can't stand it anymore. He's in codependent relationships all the time. And like, I don't want anything to do with him. So you would go to a therapist and the therapist might start poking at you and asking you some questions. And sometimes those questions make you feel uncomfortable and you're like, nope, I'm not gonna talk about that. Like, let's say they talk about the questions like, well, let's talk about your father. And you're like, nope, absolutely not gonna talk my father. I could talk about my mother, but not him. That's a form of resistance, right? So in, um, so, so there's multiple ways of approaching that. Either you can push through it, which I absolutely do not recommend, or you can, as a practitioner, you can say, I'm noticing some resistance to you wanting to talk about your father. Can we explore the resistance? Not the father, just the resistance. So the resistance is actually a protector of your mind that is trying to protect you from going somewhere painful. Again, going back to none of us want to feel vulnerable or shit ever, excuse me, ever again in our life. So, so um, that's a very strong protector. Now, most of the time, if you have the ability, some people are blended, right? So that you become the resistance. So in this case, you would become the, no, I don't want to talk about my father. But what IFS teaches is that you can distance yourself from the part of you that's resisting wanting to talk about your father and get to know what its role is playing for you. Likely its role is, I don't want to go somewhere painful right now and then you build respect with that part of you that's trying to protect you from going there. The reason why I mention it today and I'm hot on this topic is because I have, I have seen people who have a backlash reaction to using psychedelics. I don't see it with other kind of psychedelic, like, like the breath work and things like that. Most people have a sort of soft, maybe softer experience, even though those experiences can be very cathartic. Um, but I have seen it where people will push themselves into some kind of a, an ayahuasca journey or something like that, and they'll come out completely unraveled and their mind will, will beat themselves up or like blame themselves for like, why did you do that? Da, 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 da. And then the person kind of swings, right? And so we can avoid that backlash by working with these protectors until, until that person is like, I've got permission from all my parts to do something like that. And let's go really deep into whatever trauma I'm holding that's holding me back from having the life that I want to live. Does that answer the question?
Oh, Jesse, I'm sorry. I don't hear you for some reason. Sorry, I have a double double uh, muting function here just in case. Um, so I, I guess w would you agree that it's almost like building enough respect with the resistance itself so that that protective factor can almost be um, redirected to a more appropriate problem or a more contemporary problem than a historical trauma. Um, so we're still going to use that protective part of ourselves, but we're going to use that protective part of ourselves to fix the problem that's going on right now, as opposed to worrying about the problem that happened 10 years ago. Um, right, exactly. There's benefit to that because um, the, again, the benefit is that you don't want to go into something that's pretty tragic without respecting the, the portion of time and therapy, mm. right? And, and it's, it's possibly a new concept because not, there's not a lot of people that I know who kind of work in this fashion as I do, but, um, you know, actually, I am thinking of another case right now. Somebody who did a hip, who did hypnosis, and she went into um, something pretty tragic. It was like a, something like she she was almost raped and then had to flee, and then she she got from the hypnosis and was like, "Whoa, what the heck just happened?" Bolted out of that room and like never looked back at that kind of treatment. And so, you know, we we have this mechanism of protective parts that will keep us from going into those experiences prematurely um, because they can be traumatic in themselves to go into a traumatic experience. But I also want to stress the importance of going there at some point with permission because that can often be the source of our healing. If we do go back in time and go, wow, you know, I was left in my crib for hours and hours and nobody tended to me or back in the day when parents were, you know, um, training kids to just let, let them cry it out or whatever. I mean, you know, luckily we've, we've come a long way since then. Um, but, um, you know, those are unfortunate pre-verbal trauma, traumatic experiences that as an adult, even going, even realizing, oh my gosh, like my parents completely neglected me, can change your relationship with your parents already, and that can be devastating. So, so really working with with those parts that are like, nope, not going to go there today. Build trust, and then eventually get there. Because this again might sound a little strange, but like I said, I see it every day in my practice. Is those traumatic experiences are often lodged in the body. And so like a, a, a sort of other example I can think of is um, the there, there are, you know, in homeopathy and in other kind of Eastern philosophies or medicines, often they'll say that grief is in the lungs or in the chest. And with um, the manual osteopathic practice and all the other modalities I've learned along the way, I kind of always have that in the back of my mind. I certainly don't come at people and tell them, oh, you have grief because you have a lung infection. But I, I, often, I often think, interesting, right? Why do they have a chronic lung infection? Why do they have asthma? Why do they have breathing issues? I'm like, oh, maybe there's some grief there. And maybe not, but maybe there is. So um, what's interesting is I've, I've seen it where people are smoking. And interestingly, the behavior is attracting the attention into the part of the body where they're holding their pain. We did work with this person a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, and he, he did do some medicine work um, and was able to go to a painful, painful place where he was severely neglected as an infant. And there was tremendous grief that he was holding on to. And interestingly, I don't think there's any way he would have ever gone there without some kind of psychedelic medicine work and, and uh, the people he worked with, but was able to go through the experience of really resolving the grief and smoking was a non-issue. You know, it's, it's fascinating how, how that can be the case. So. Thank you. Uh, Sophia, do you want to uh, bring up another question from the chat? Yeah, thank you for your clarification. 
And I just want to say it kind of resembles other concepts from, you know, Ayurveda and yoga, the idea of non-judgment. And in personal experience, that idea is also being used for chronic pain. So I don't know. Yeah, kind of just um, not the idea of like, oh, why do I have a stomach ache? Why am I feeling this way? Just non-judgment and accepting that part. So it's very interesting um, you mentioned that. So our next question is from Mahindra Bandari. Um, and it asks, what are common themes of complaints you have seen in patients who come to you as a last resort or are frustrated with more traditional or common treatment modalities? That's a great question. Um, more often than not, it's something um, chronic, obviously. Um, you know, if 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 somebody has a heartburn and they take medication and it's gone, people often don't think anymore about their heartburn. So it's usually something that lingers that they get very frustrated with that not a single person they've ever seen can help them with. Um, and that could be like a physical pain. Um, you know, it could be headaches are quite common. Um, joint pain is common, but chronic back pain is common. Um, and I I want to I'm I want to be kind of careful with what I say here because um, I've had incidences of people with chronic lower back pain who had seen a variety of doctors from um, chiropractors to um, other specialists and be you know I I don't want to give the illusion here that I jump to conclusions of like spiritual context for or spiritual reasons for for conditions or um emotional um you know uh, blockages that people might be having even though those are very important in when you're looking at the full healing spectrum but this particular lady did actually have cancer and back pain was the only sign of that now i'm not saying that everybody has chronic back pain who doesn't who gets help and they don't get their solution have cancer right but in this particular case she did and so immediately we were able to get her to the right care and she's been fine ever since thank god um but let's talk about um you know this kind of headache realm for a moment because that's a real common one and i feel fortunate again in the way that i've been trained that I look at different aspects of, of the head and neck. So we can look at the C-spine, we can look at degenerative disease in the, in the spine or the discs. We can look at, um, you know, old whiplash injuries. We can look at bruxism or, or jaw clenching or other kind of structural things that can impact headaches that not everybody would necessarily look at because you'd have to go to a DMJ specialist to, you know, look at the jaw. And if you have a headache, people might not put the two and two together um or or some people will see a neurologist and the neurologist won't necessarily look at the jaw so that's this is the kind of challenge i think that patients are faced with these days is like i have a pain but who do i see and they go well if it's neck pain i have to go see this person or that person um so the nice thing is to be able to listen again to the whole body and kind of feel the different structures and then if there's nothing structurally wrong that's when my alarm bells go off and i'm like well it could be emotional or um, it's a kind of imbalance of the nervous system. So most of us live in a, in a threat space where we're constantly bombarded with stuff. Our system's like on the edge of overload and our sympathetic system is on guard all the time. And that leads to muscle pain, tension. Um, our heart rate will fluctuate or often stay on the higher end. People get heart disease eventually, right? So there's a lot of... Um, issues that come from being more in the sympathetic state and not as much in the parasympathetic state. Um, so I'm kind of digressing slightly from your question here, but the, the, the themes of kind of chronic pain that I end up seeing either, either they're, they're seeing specialists that are missing the source of the issue or, or it's, as simple, I say as simple as a nervous system imbalance and they're just, their, their lifestyle is just pulling them out of their health constantly. Um, Mahindra, I think, I hope that answers your question. Um, the other thing I'll just add is I do, I do see 
hormone issues a lot in my practice. I do see thanks. <laughs> um, I, 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 that's another difficult realm. I think that we struggle with in terms of treatment, especially in women. We have a lot of hormonal fluctuations. We live longer. We have more stress. Our enzymes break down much quicker. Um, and that can be a real source of frustration for a lot of, of patients. Um, and then again, you, you know, we see an endocrinologist that like, well, you're not that bad because your labs don't really show that there's anything wrong with you, but then they're still suffering or they'll see, you know, maybe a naturopathic doctor who will prescribe them a lot of supplements and then they don't really know if it's helping or not. Sometimes I see that sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So, so that's often very frustrating for people. And I, and I, I work with that in a sort of slightly different way. Um, at least my, my goal with with my patients when they come in with something like that is to to strip down the or strip away the obvious reasons for their hormonal problems. Again, I work on the nervous system and then I dig a little deeper and figure out if there is any kind of, you know, emotional issues at hand that could be contributing to that in the first place. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we have another question from Laura Rincon. Um, how do you see possible integration of psychedelic use with cranial, cranial osteopathy or somatic therapies? Yeah, you know, I'm kind of excited about that in some ways. Um, I, um, I, I've heard of some people who, who do very light doses of psychedelic substances and treatment. And I think people have quite good results. Um, my, my personal view is I think a low dose can be quite powerful with body work. And, and, you know, I'm not talking about like 5-MeO DMT or, or something that really takes your mind out completely for a while. I think that's a kind of different experience altogether, but I think kind of light use of psychedelics can be really, really powerful. Again, you know, it just kind of opens up your mind a little bit to other perspectives. If you're feeling self-conscious or you have resistance around being emotional, because some people have an imprint, like I can't get angry, I can't cry in front of others, I can't, whatever it is that we have in our head from our parents, usually, um, you know, that kind of medicine can kind of loosen up the framework a little and just like let people do what they have to do and trust the body, you know, even without any kind of psychedelic um, medicine, I, I can get people to do that in my, in my practice day to day where I'm like, okay, I'm going to tell you not to worry about what you look like, what you're going to do. If you need to vomit, vomit, like, I don't care. Just relax, close your eyes, tell your mind not to question yourself or anything and trust your body. Your body has its own unique ability to know how to heal. But when we're too much in our heads, we're overriding those those um, those feelings and or or those um, need for expression, should I say. And an example of that is you see it more in animals and you see it in people who've had um, like an accident or something and their body starts to shake. Right. It's like your, your body's way of knowing how to release the stress of that situation. Um, but those things happen to us all the time. And even on a subtle level. So, so we're acquiring the, the sort of, um, or should I say there's an inability for us in our head to let our body do what it needs to do. I mean, we, we honestly look a bit crazy if we're walking down the street, shouting and crying and like waving our hands and stuff, but that's what our body sometimes needs to do. And so this is kind of the mindfulness part of my practice too, where I really encourage people to meditate and do movement meditations because um, like there's a meditation for anger where you can kind of put on a blindfold and you punch a pillow and then and again like this release of energy and the release of emotion can come out that can be so um, freeing and so relieving. Um, so so yeah so I'm kind of again you know adding in different different ways in which we can. Um, be in our body more and less in our mind. And, and yes, I think psychedelic use with cranial osteopathic work can be very powerful in the future. Thank you. It kind of leads into our next question from another um, committee member, Chris, who 
questions. Um, he asked, for people who have buried negative memories for so long that the patient themselves have forgotten them, what techniques do you use holistically to access them and assist them in unlocking? Um, is your treatment more spiritual based, manual, pharmacologic, um, or if all of them, how do you integrate? Yeah, it's, an, it's a really good question too. Um, so let's take, um, let, let's kind of use your question as an example. So someone comes in with very negative memories and they've completely forgotten them. Um, I also, as a practi practitioner, wouldn't know that, right? So I'm not going to make assumptions that everyone walks into my office is horribly abused. That's not necessary. That's not true. Um, and maybe unlocking them isn't the purpose. Like I said, working with resistance is more important than getting to the source of trauma. And you, I could work with somebody for 20 years and never get to the source of their trauma. And that's also okay. That's not the purpose of our session. Um, but let's say, let's say there is something that's causing them ill health, that's causing them a disease or that's leading them to behaviors based on strategies, right? As I explained before, that's leading them to create illness. Then it, then it is, then, then it becomes more pertinent. So what would we do? First, go from what you see on the outside and go inwards. So you're looking at their behaviors and you explore what they're doing and why they're doing it. And then, and then I would probably use something like this IFS style of treatment where we explore the different parts in them that are doing that. Now, interestingly, um, the, I'm, I'm going to sort of like talk about an addiction for, for a moment or people who, who drink excessive alcohol. Often those people who have those more extreme, like drive fast cars, drink a lot and so forth are have extremely, it's like an extremely high resistance to um, something very vulnerable that happened to them. And so we want to, again, walk very carefully with that because um, that, that we call them firefighter energy is going to become more and more extreme if you're going to get closer and closer to the source of their source of their trauma. Um, but um, first of all, helping someone recognize what parts in them are doing what behaviorally and then try to and try to kind of again build that distance of what happened in the past isn't real today so you know I'm like a veteran who I've, I've worked with many before you know PTSD is a consequence of something that maybe happened in the past and they're reacting to it as if it's still happening today. So their nervous system hasn't totally re rewired it to the past. And this is how EMDR can be helpful. And I don't do EMDR, but I will refer to specialists who do, right? Again, different modalities to help people kind of compartmentalize things to the past. That's when suddenly you see a shift in people and they, and they can now like hear fireworks on July 4th because they're no longer stuck in that triggered place and they their system now can relax a little bit and then you start to see their health improve because they're not constantly in this reactive state right um and in addition to that yes I always use body work and osteopathic techniques to kind of help them balance what's really beautiful for me is I can actually feel it in the body when I'm working with someone so you know I can feel um, even if someone's like jabbering on and they're talking and they're in their mind, I'm hearing something or listening to something completely different that's happening in their body. Like I could, they could talk about something and I feel their system reacting like, okay, that's important. That's a flag. Let's go there. But not in a pushy way, in a way with curiosity. I'm noticing something's happening in your body when you're talking about this particular thing. Can we explore that a little bit more? And then if I get a yes, then we go there. Christopher, is there anything else that? Yeah. yeah, thank you. We have a few more questions coming up. So Valerie was asking, um, since you mentioned that trauma and blockages can be stored in the body, um, she was wondering if they can also be stored or seen in dreams. Yeah, this is, a, this is an awesome question. I love these questions. Um, thank you, Valerie. The, yes, so, um, I have 
very many times told patients who come in for treatment and often it's a more cranial, very light treatment and people are like, I don't know what you're doing. Their mind is like, I have no idea what you just did, Steph. You probably did nothing. Um, but I, I'll say, especially if I can feel there's some trauma in the body that we didn't talk about therapeutically in our session, I'll say, you're going to have really vivid dreams. It's normal. It's your, it's your, you release things that happen in the body. Again, we store a lot of memories in the somatic tissue that the mind is forgetting and it will be, it will try to resolve that in your dreams. So I wouldn't necessarily say that our tra our traumas or our blockages are stored in dreams. They're stored in our body, but as the body releases, then it start your brain is trying to process the things that that have happened to you or happened to your body. And it doesn't come out quite so clearly, right? Like often um, um, I'm trying to think of, of an example here, but let's say um, oh, this is a good example. Um, babies that are born with the umbilical wrapped around their neck will often come into the world with anxiety, like nothing is safe because life to them is associated with potential death. So really interesting people to work with. Um, not so much fun for the patient because they're suffering, but fun, but fun or enjoyable for someone like me to work with, because there's a lot of things we can do to help them feel better. Um, so in this case, there is probably very likely no memory at all of that. If we wanted to go to that pre-verbal trauma, my guess is some kind of psychedelic medicine would have to be involved with permission from the mind to go there. But, um, you know, if we treat the body and we relax the tissue, and even if the patient's like, I don't know what's happening, they might have dreams of, um, like not being able to breathe or for like a week or two, they might, they might have this recurring nightmare and they'll email me or text me and be like, Steph, oh my gosh, I don't know what's happening. I'm like, it's okay. It's okay. It's, it's your body is releasing old patterns from the past and your brain is conjuring up images to try to help you resolve what happened to you. And, and ultimately I, I often tell my patients, you don't have to understand anything, <laughs> just trust the process. And if you get better and you feel better, then the work is speaks for itself. Yeah, thank you. All right, we have one last question before we wrap up from another committee member, Aisha. Um, she asked, how would you differentiate that firefighter energy that you mentioned before from someone who may physiologically require more and more intense stimulation or have a non neurotypical baseline uh, nervous system, like ADHD patients, for instance? Yeah, this is a really good question, Aisha. Thank you. Um, um, how do I begin to answer this? <laughs> um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw a wild card out at you here because um, I, I worked with someone who is brilliant. He's a psychiatrist in the UK and um, he was um, not neurotypical growing up. I think it was ADHD autism spectrum and with a ton of IFS work and he's an IFS trained psychiatrist um, he realized that it was a part of him that had those symptoms. And the more he was able to build a relationship with the part of him that couldn't um, sit still and was, you know, some at times associating or doing things, the less he was struggling with those symptoms, which is mind blowing to me that that could even be possible. Um, and so I, what I'm, how I'm going to try to answer your question is there's a sort of general firefighter energy compared to a manager energy. So firefighter energy is like dissociating, um, drinking too much, like doing more extreme things, self-destructive behavior, so forth, compared to a manager, which is more organized, literally a manager, like somebody who's going to say, nope, we're not going to do this today. And we're going to avoid that pain today. And I'm going to do this today. It's more calm compared to the firefighter. So there's a general of two in anyone that we can have. 
I think they're expressed a little differently in different people. Um, but um, that I think that's kind of what I'm trying to explain is is if we're all on a if we're all on a spectrum, the the types of protective mechanisms that we have are the same, but they express in different ways and however we are. And again, treatment wise, it would be fascinating to work with the nervous system, fascinating to go back in time with them and fascinating to build a relationship with themselves. And, you know, I've also treated a lot of people with ADHD that have preverbal trauma. And it's amazing how many people are like, wow, I didn't know that happened to me. And then as they resolve that more and more, their symptoms aren't as intense. I'm not saying that they go away. I mean, there's a huge purpose to, to ADHD. A lot of people do multiple things extremely quickly. You know, there, there's definitely benefits. Um, and, and, I, and I also hope that people realize that a lot of the strategies they have are beneficial. They keep you alive for a reason, but they don't always serve us in the long term because life gets harder and harder the longer we live. And if we don't take care of the parts that had the traumas in the first place, then we're just going to get to this burden state and we're going to get sick or, you know, become depressed or really have high anxiety issues and so forth. And so that's why this work is really important in my opinion. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for your time. I feel like your whole talk was so good for all of us to hear kind of right at the interface of psychedelic and spiritual medicine and osteopathy. So it was really interesting to hear some perspectives of how you can incorporate both into a single practice. And it's also nice to hear referring out to others and kind of building a community team approach because we talk about that a lot here as well, building a team approach of practitioners. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>